This is Audible. Truth or Beard, Winston Brothers Book One, written by Penny Reed, narrated by Joy Nash and Chris Brinkley. Chapter One. Not all those who wander are lost. J. R. R. Tolkien, The Fellowship of the Ring. Jessica. I pulled into the Green Valley Community Center parking lot and scared the crap out of five senior citizens. Even though it was Halloween, inducing heart attacks in the geriatric population was not on my agenda. Unfortunately for everyone within earshot, my truck made a ghastly, high-pitched whining sound. This happened whenever it idled. The group of five jumped, obviously startled, and glared at me. Soon their glares morphed into wrinkled squints of befuddlement, their eyes moving over my appearance from my perch. It took them a few minutes, but they recognized me. Everyone in Green Valley, Tennessee, knew who I was. Nevertheless, I imagined they were not expecting to see Jessica James, the 22-year-old daughter of Sheriff Jeffrey James and sister of Sheriff's Deputy Jackson James, dressed in a long white beard, sitting behind the wheel of an ancient Ford Super Duty F-350 XL. In my defense, it wasn't my monster truck. It was my mother's. I was currently between automobiles, and she'd just upgraded to a newer, bigger, more intimidating model. Something she could plaster with bumper stickers that said, Have you kissed your sheriff today? And, Don't drink and derive. Alcohol and calculus don't mix. And, Eat steak. The West wasn't one with salad. As the local sheriff's wife, mother to a police officer, my brother, and a math teacher, me, and the daughter of a cattle rancher, I think she felt it her duty to use the wide canvas of her truck as a mobile pro-police, pro-mathematics, and pro-beef billboard. I waited patiently for them to look their fill, giving them a small smile they wouldn't see behind my beard. Being stared at didn't bother me much. After a few more minutes of confused gawking, the gang of seniors shuffled off like a herd of turtles toward the entrance to the community center, casting cautiously confused glances over their shoulders. As quickly as I could, I maneuvered the beast into a space at the edge of the lot. Since inheriting the truck, I usually parked on the edge of parking lots, so as not to be that person who drives an oversized vehicle and takes up two spaces. I adjusted my beard, tossing the three-foot white length over my shoulder, and grabbed my gray cape and wizard hat. Then I tried not to fall out of the truck or flash anyone on my hike down from the driver's seat. Luckily, my costume also called for a long staff. I leveraged the polished wood to aid my descent. The rest of my costume was negligible. A one-piece miniskirt sheath dress with a low-cut front, which made stretching and moving simple. I was halfway across the lot, lost in delighted mental preparation for my father and brother's scowls of disapproval, when I heard my name. Jessica, wait up! I turned and waved when I found my co-worker and friend Claire jogging toward me. I thought that was you. I saw the staff and cape. She slowed as she neared, her eyes moving over the rest of my costume. You've made some uh, modifications? Yes, I nodded proudly, grinning at her warily amused expression. Claire hadn't changed since work. She was still wearing an adorable Raggedy Ann costume. Lucky for her, she already had bright red hair and freckles. All she had to do was put her long locks in pigtails, then add the overalls and the white cap. Do you like what I've done? I twisted to one side, then the other to show off my new garment and my high-heeled strappy sandals. Are you still Gandalf? Or what are you supposed to be? Yeah, I'm still Gandalf. But now I'm sexy Gandalf. I wagged my eyebrows. Claire covered her mouth with a white-gloved hand, then snorted. Oh my God, you are a nut. A sinister giggle escaped my lips. I'm not much of a giggler unless I've done something sinister. 
Well, I couldn't wear it to work, but I love the irony of it, you know? All those stupid Halloween costumes that women are expected to wear, like sexy nurse and sexy witch and sexy bee. I've actually seen a sexy bee costume. Am I missing something? Is there a subset of men who get off thinking about pollinators? I agree. You couldn't wear the sexy Gandalf costume to work. In addition to being against the dress code, you're already starring in the sex fantasies of all your male students as their hot calculus teacher. If you'd worn sexy Gandalf at school instead of regular Gandalf, I think they'd go home feeling confused about their sexuality. I laughed and shook my head, thinking how odd the last three months had been. Like me, Claire was a Green Valley native. Also, like me, she'd moved back to town after college. However, where I was here only temporarily, for just the few years until I paid off my student debt, Claire was here to stay. She'd become the drama and band teacher during my senior year of high school. Now we were co-workers. With her gorgeous red hair, light blue eyes, and a strikingly beautiful face, during my senior year as well as now, she was labeled the hot drama teacher. I shivered as a gust of late autumn wind met my excess of bare skin. Come on. Claire looped her arm through mine. Let's get inside before you freeze your beard off. I followed her into the old school building. As we neared, I heard the telltale sounds of folk music drifting out of the open double doors. It was Friday night, and that meant nearly every able-bodied person in the 30-mile radius was gathering for the jam session at the Green Valley Community Center. As it was Halloween, the place had been decorated with paper skeletons, carved pumpkins, and orange and black streamers. The old school had been converted only seven years earlier, and the jam sessions started shortly thereafter. Everyone in Green Valley would start their evening here. Even if it hadn't been Halloween, married folks with kids would leave first, followed by the elderly. Then the older teenagers would go off, likely to Cooper's Field for a drunken bonfire. The adult, unmarried, and childless would leave next. I was clumsily and hesitantly trying to find my way in this new single adult subgroup. Before I left for college, I was part of the Cooper's Field teenager drunken bonfire subset, even though I usually didn't stay long and never got drunk. But I always managed to find a boy to kiss before I left. In my present predicament, where each individual from the unattached adult cluster, to which I now belonged, ended the evening would depend heavily on that person's personal goals. If the goal was to have good, clean fun, then you typically went to Jeannie's Country Western Bar for dancing and darts. If the goal was to get laid, then you typically went to the Wooden Plank, a biker bar just on the edge of town. If the goal was to get laid and cause trouble, then maybe get laid again, you went to the Dragon Biker Bar, several miles outside of town and home to the Iron Wraiths Biker Club. Or, if you were like me, no longer an angst-filled, rebellious adolescent looking for boys to kiss, and the goal was to relax and grade a week's worth of calculus assignments, you went home, put on flannel PJs, and turned on the travel channel for background noise and inspiration. I spotted my father before he spotted me as a crowd had gathered. He was speaking animatedly to someone I couldn't see. My daddy was standing at the table just inside the entrance where a big glass bowl had been placed to collect donations. He was, as always, wearing his uniform. Claire stood on her tiptoes, then tried leaning to the side to gauge the cause of the crowd. Looks like they're doing trick-or-treating. I see a bunch of kids in costume, and there's a bucket of candy on the table. I nodded, glancing down one of the short hallways, then the other. Music came from only one of the rooms, but there was a mass of kids going in and out of the five classrooms, each with either a decorated pillowcase or an orange plastic jack-o'-lantern bucket to hold their treats. I leaned close to Claire to suggest we skip the line and make our donations later when my eyes snagged on a red-headed, bearded man coming out of one of the classrooms, holding the hand of a blonde little girl, not more than seven, dressed like Tinkerbell. I felt a shock. A jolt from my throat traveled down my collarbone to my fingertips, then weaved through my chest and belly. 
I lost my breath on a startled gasp. The shock was followed by a suffusion of spreading warmth and levels of intense self-consciousness, the magnitude of which I hadn't experienced in years. My eyes greedily traveled over every inch of him, dressed in blue dicky coveralls that had been pulled off his sculpted torso, the long sleeves now tied around his waist to keep the pants portion from falling down. They were dotted with grease stains and dirt at the knee and thigh. He also wore a bright white t-shirt and black work boots. His thick red hair was longish and askew, like he'd just run his fingers through it, or someone else had just run their fingers through it. Bo Winston. I knew it was Bo and not his twin Duane for three reasons. He was smiling at the little girl. Bo always smiled. Duane never smiled. Also, he appeared to be helping the little girl in some way. Bo was friendly and outgoing. Duane was moody, quiet, and sullen. And lastly, my body knew the difference. I'd always been reduced to a blubbering mess of teenage hormones at the sight of Bo. In contrast, Duane, although identical in looks, raised my blood pressure and made me a blubbering mess of self-conscious irritation. My adolescent crush, nay, my adolescent obsession, was walking toward us, his attention focused solely on the child next to him. He looked like a ginger-bearded James Dean, only taller and broader. I think I forgot how to breathe. He was so dreamy. He was so dreamy, and I'd forgotten how much I disliked the word dreamy. Jess? I felt Claire nudge me with a sharp elbow. Jessica, what's wrong? How some preteens lose their minds for boy bands, rock stars, and hot celebrities? I always lost my marbles for Bo. It all started when he climbed a tree to save my cat. I was eight. He was ten. He'd kissed me on the cheek. He'd wiped my tears. He'd held my hand. He'd hugged me close. He was my hero. He saved my cat. I wondered for a flash whether there was something truly wrong with me, whether there were other 20-something women out there who still experienced paralysis at the sight of their first crush. Shouldn't I have outgrown this by now? My voice was a weak whisper, and my mouth was dry when I finally answered Claire's question, tipping my head just slightly toward the pair. That's Bo Winston. There was a little pause, and I knew Claire was looking past me to where I'd indicated. No, she squeezed my arm with hers. No, that's Dwayne Winston. I shook my head, forced myself to look away, and met Claire's eyes. No, that's Bo. Claire's mouth hooked to the side as she studied my features. I'm sure my face had gone mostly pink, a byproduct of being blessed with freckles and an insane, persistent crush on the nicest, sweetest, funniest guy in the world. I wasn't embarrassed, but I was impressively flushed. Growing up, whenever I'd been in the same room with Bo, he'd had that effect on me. Full-on butterflies in the stomach and music only I could hear. I'm telling you, that's Dwayne. Bo's hair is shorter. Nope. I shook my head again, more resolutely this time as I tried to regulate my breathing and body temperature. I go a different kind of haywire around Dwayne. That must be Bo. In fact, Dwayne and I didn't much get along. During the same episode that initiated and solidified my lifelong adoration of Bo, my aversion for Duane had also been established. While Bo was climbing the tree to save my cat, Duane was throwing rocks at the branch. While Bo had been kissing my cheek, Duane had been rolling his eyes. I could tell Claire was trying not to laugh as she added, "'Cripes, you weren't kidding when you told me you had a crush on that boy.' Is this the first time you've seen either of them since high school? No. I saw Bo once at the Piggly Wiggly during my sophomore year of college when I was home for winter break. He was buying bacon and green beans, and I stood behind him in line. 
She stopped trying to hide her smile and grinned. This is fascinating to watch. What is? You struck stupid. I mean, you're Jessica James. You have this plan that ensures lifelong freedom from commitment. All you ever talk about is traveling the world. You're home just long enough to pay off loans and gain experience for your resume. Yet here you are, harboring a treasured memory of an encounter in the Green Valley Piggly Wiggly with Bo Winston. I bet you can recall that conversation word for word. I stared at her, wanting to deny it, but also not wanting to lie. She was right. I could recall the conversation word for word, action for action. He turned to me and asked if I'd mind passing him a gum package that was just out of his reach. I tried to shrug, but I'm sure it looked more like a minor seizure. Then I fumbled for the gum, accidentally knocking an array of breath mints to the floor. He would knelt and helped me pick up the failed mints. Our hands had touched. I'd almost fainted, and I'd certainly turned bright red. Then he smiled at me. I almost fainted again. Then he helped me stand, and I almost had a heart attack. He'd said, Hey, Jess, are you okay? Dipping his head close to mine, his amazing blue eyes all sparkly and lovely and concerned. I'd nodded, not able to speak because his hands were still on my forearms, and I'd gazed up at him butterflies, and music only I could hear. That time it was Eternal Flame by the Bangles, drowned out the sound of his voice and the next words from his mouth. I did see that his lips curved in a barely there smile as he'd studied me. Then my brother Jackson appeared and ruined everything by telling Bo to mind his own business. Bo shrugged, an actual shrug, not a semi-seizure, and turned back to the cashier. He paid for his bacon, green beans, and gum, and then left. The thing was, I was not a shy person. Not at all. I considered myself confident and level-headed. I had a brother. Boys were not a mystery to me. But Bo Winston had always rendered me beyond completely tongue-tied. He rendered me stupid. I was, in a word, completely ridiculous. Okay, that was two words. I was so ridiculous, I lost the ability to count. Jess, seriously, are you all right? Your face is turning bright red. Claire squeezed my arm, drawing my attention away from the sound of my blood pressure. Yeah, I knew I sounded weak. Just tell me when he's gone. You're not going to talk to him? I shook my head quickly. Her nose wrinkled. Her eyes flicked over my shoulder briefly, presumably to his approaching form. She squeezed my arm again. I've never seen you like this. This is not the Jessica James I know. I can't help it. If I talk to him, I might faint. Claire tisked. Two weeks ago, when we were in Nashville, you walked up to that sexy stranger outside the club and kissed him. You bet me ten dollars to do it. Plus, it's not like that with Bo. Plus, that guy was flirting with me. Plus, I like kissing. What do you mean? You don't want to kiss Bo? I whispered frantically. Of course I want to kiss him, but only in theory. Who is your famous crush? If a super hot Hollywood actor who also happened to be a great person wanted to take you home and the lights stayed on during the deed, what would you do? I mean, not in theory. Honestly, what would you do? Claire looked at me for a long moment, then asked, Would I get a heads up a few months ahead of time so I could eat low carb and start working out? No. Then, honestly... I'd run the other way. Exactly. I don't know how to describe it. It's like if he actually wanted to kiss me, I think I'd die of mortification. So you think of Bo like a celebrity or something? 
is complicated. I have similar, but not exactly the same, feelings for Intrepid Inger, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and Tina Fey. Intrepid Inger? Isn't she that solo travel blogger you're always talking about? Yes, she is she. Who is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz? The father of calculus. He's dead. Claire twisted her lips to the side, and she looked like she was trying not to laugh. I shrugged helplessly. I know, I'm a math nerd. Yes, you are a math nerd. But you're a math nerd who can totally pull off a sexy Gandalf costume. Oh my God, I forgot. My hand flew to my beard. Maybe he won't recognize me. Claire tisked. Let me get this straight. You'll kiss a random guy on the street with nothing but sass. But if you had to talk to one of your hero crushes, a famous woman travel blogger, the father of calculus, arguably the funniest woman alive, or Bo Winston, you develop aphasia and faint? I nodded. Honey, Bo Winston puts his pants on one leg at a time. He's completely normal. Why the hero worship? Go talk to him. Every time I saw him while we were growing up, he was always doing something brave, heroic, or remarkably kind. Did I tell you he saved my cat? And one time, I saw him rescue two little boys from a rattlesnake. And one time, he... I get it. You've spent years building him up in your head. I can't talk to him. Not yet. Maybe one day, after some extreme mental preparation, my whisper was harsh, urgent. Yes, you can. No, really, I can't. I felt my eyes widen to their maximum diameter. I've never successfully carried on a conversation with Bo Winston. It's not just the fact that I've built him up in my head. I have a terrible record of failure where he is concerned. Every time I try to speak, my brain forgets English, and I start slurring Swahili or Swedish or Swiss. He thinks I'm a total idiot. People of Switzerland don't speak Swiss. They speak German, French, Italian, and Romanche. See, I'm becoming dumber with each second. I sucked in a breath because I could hear his voice now. He was speaking to the little girl, and the sound was so fantastically charming. It caused my stomach to pitch, then lurch, like I was in a small boat in the middle of the ocean. I placed my hand over my belly and braced my feet apart. When he entered my peripheral vision, my attention was drawn to him like a magnet. He was still smiling, but it was smaller, polite, he was handing the little girl off to a lady I recognized as Mrs. McIntyre, the lead librarian at the local branch in town. Tinkerbell must be her granddaughter. She said something about a chicken or a rooster. He said something in response. They laughed. I stared, letting the velvety sound wash over me. Once again, I was caught on a big wave in the middle of the ocean. Pitch. Lurch. Then it happened. His eyes flickered to the side, likely feeling my stalker's stare, and he did a double take. His gaze ensnared mine. My throat worked without success, and I was a heat wave of cognizance. His stare narrowed as I continued to meet his gaze. God, I was such a creeper. I wanted to look away, but I physically could not. He so rarely looked at me. I felt like I was falling, my surroundings fading away, everything except him and his goodness and magnanimity and blue, blue, blue eyes. Annoyingly, the music only I could hear whenever he was near started playing between my ears. This time it was Dreamweaver by Gary Wright. Therefore, I missed the sound of his voice when he said, Hey, Jessica. Instead, I guesstimated what he'd said based on the movement of his lips and subsequently tried my best to turn down the volume in my head. I nodded at him, still unable to look away. Then, horrified, 
I watched as he excused himself from Mrs. McIntyre and Tinkerbell and walked to where I was standing with Claire. I swayed a little, took a step backward as he advanced. Claire slipped her arm through mine and fit herself against my side. She probably thought I was going to either faint or make a run for it. Unfortunately, I managed neither by the time he made it to where we were standing. Hey, Bo, Claire said, the hesitation in her voice obvious. You are Bo, right? Or are you Duane? He gave us a crooked smile that looked completely delectable and mischievous, his eyes darting between us. You can't tell the difference? Claire returned his smile with a small one of her own. Bo's charm was contagious and addictive. I'd once overheard my daddy tell my mama that the six Winston boys had inherited their father's ability to charm snakes, the IRS, and women. I was also smiling, although mine probably looked dazed and weird. I was thankful for the long gray beard around my mouth. I hoped it camouflaged my expression of dazed, worshipful adoration. I'm pretty sure you're Duane, Claire said, then indicated me with a tilt of her head. But Jess thinks you're Beau. His eyes moved back to mine, somehow more intense, interested in piercing than they'd been before, and he swept me up and down again. On the return pass, I saw what I thought might be appreciation, and that's when I remembered I was wearing my ironic sexy Gandalf costume, which basically hid nothing except my face and hair. The point of this costume was to irritate my daddy and Jackson and amuse myself with delightful irony while doing so. I may no longer be the bratty teenager who left home four years ago, but I still enjoyed little tokens of rebellion against the overprotective males in my family. It hadn't occurred to me until that very moment someone who mattered might look at me, my curves in this scrap of fabric, and see more sexy than irony. What's his costume, Jessica? Are you a wizard? His lips tugged to the side, but his tone deepened when he added, I like it. The tenor of his voice paired with the word sent a new jolt racing through my body, but it was different than anything I'd felt in his proximity before. This wasn't me going gaga for a childhood hero crush. This feeling was mature. I gripped Claire tighter in surprise. She's sexy Gandalf. She was going to be a sexy bee, but the shop sold out of pollinator costumes. Bo laughed, a sound that, for reasons unknown, I felt in my uterus and reached for the beard at my navel. The back of his fingers brushed against my stomach as he plucked the length of synthetic facial hair from my inconsequential sheath of a costume. The beard adds a certain something... He tugged just gently and winked at me. Of course, my response was to stare at him mutely, because the grin plus wink plus the light touch of his fingers meant I was terribly confused. Instead of outgrowing my crush, apparently I was now unwillingly compounding my adoration by adding new, very adult feelings. Some odd little corner of my brain briefly thought about the logistics of wearing this long white beard always, every day. Hey, if you tug her beard, she gets to tug yours, Claire teased. His smile growing, the redhead stepped forward and into my space, his eyes at half-mast as they glittered down at me. Go ahead, Jessica. Touch it. He said my name like it was a secret. Bo's words and nearness stole my breath. I could smell him, and it just made me want to... want to... I don't even know what. I'd had boyfriends before, guys I liked, but the sudden depth and breadth of my dirty, sordid thoughts took me by surprise, and I felt a hot flood of confused alarm in my chest. Bo's eyes seemed to flicker, then flare, as though he could read my thoughts. They dropped to my lips. 
Once again, a new rush of something not at all hero worshipy made my stomach twist. My female reaction to his maleness made no sense. Well, it made some sense. Both Winston twins were seriously good-looking. It hadn't escaped my notice how he'd walked just moments before, how his hips moved, the way his T-shirt pulled over his pectoral muscles and was tight where the short sleeves ended at his biceps. I am so sorry about your mama, son. A voice to my right and his left pulled our attention away from each other. We both turned our heads to find Mr. McClure, our local fire chief and Claire's father-in-law, standing there with his hand outstretched. Bo looked down at it and then, taking a step away from me, accepted the offered hand as the man continued. She was a good woman and she'll be missed. I shook myself a little, a spark of sobriety cutting its way through Dream Weaver. The Winstons had just lost their mother not more than four weeks ago. Bethany Winston hadn't been more than 47. It was very sad and had been quite sudden. I hadn't gone to the funeral as I was sick with flu, but apparently everyone else in town had showed up to pay their respects to Mrs. Winston, her six sons, and her daughter. Thank you, sir. Bo nodded once. The heat of his earlier expression was now extinguished, replaced with a tight-lipped smile and a shuddered gaze. Mr. McClure nodded at Bo, then turned to Claire and me. He greeted us warmly, stepping forward to give Claire a kiss on the cheek. During this intermission, I felt Bo's eyes follow my movements. I gave myself a mental high five for keeping my attention on Claire's father-in-law. After hellos were exchanged, Mr. McClure narrowed his eyes at Claire. Claire, did you lock your car? I thought it was cute how Mr. McClure looked after Claire like she was his daughter. It warmed my heart. Claire had married her childhood sweetheart. Her husband, Ben McClure, had been a Marine. He died overseas a few years ago. Claire nodded and her lips curved in a warm and patient smile. Yes, sir, I locked my car. To my surprise, Mr. McClure swung his blue eyes to me. Jessica, did you lock your car? I blinked at him, caught off guard, and glanced at Claire. There's been some thefts, Claire explained, and not just tourists like usual. Jennifer Sylvester's new BMW went missing last week. Her mama told me she had a banana cake in the front seat, too. Mr. McClure tisked like the real crime was the disappearing banana cake, and then he turned his attention back to Bo. Are your brothers here? Yes, sir. Everyone but, uh... His eyes flickered to mine, then back to Mr. McClure. Everyone but my twin. I see. He nodded, glancing down the hallway toward the sound of music. I need to talk to your brother Cletus about the transmission work he did. Bo stood a little taller. Is there something wrong? Bo, Dwayne, and their older brother Cletus owned the Winston Brothers Auto Shop in town, hence the blue, grease-stained coveralls he currently donned. When I was growing up, most new-to-town people had trouble keeping all the Winston boys' names straight. I used to describe the family as follows. Jethro has brown hair and true hazel eyes, though sometimes they almost look gray. He's the oldest and the most likely to give you a sweet smile while he steals your car and or wallet. Billy is the second oldest. His hair is a darker brown and his eyes are a bright, startling blue. He's the most serious and responsible and, incidentally, the worst tempered of the bunch. Next comes Cletus, number three, shortest, brown beard, olive green eyes. You can tell him apart from Jethro because he doesn't smile often and his beard is longer. Instead of stealing your car, he's more likely to take apart your toaster and tell you how it works. And he's always been a little... odd. Sweet, but odd. As an example, he'd started attending my first period advanced placement calculus class two months ago. Apparently, he'd talked to my principal and had been cleared to sit in for the rest of the year. Ashley is number four. She's the girl and looks just like a beauty contestant version of Billy. 
Then the identical twins, Bo and Duane, with their red beards and blue eyes. Good luck telling them apart if they don't talk. But if they do, Bo's the friendly one. Last but not least is Roscoe. He's a mixture of Jethro and Billy. Big smiles that had a more serious nature. He's also a huge and indiscriminate flirt. Or at least he was when I knew him. The fire chief shook his head. No, no, it's not for my truck, son. It's Red, the fire engine. He's helping me get the old girl running again for the Christmas parade. Oh, I see. Yeah, Cletus is playing his banjo. Bo tossed his thumb over his shoulder. Only one room is jamming so far tonight. I think everyone else is waiting until the trick-or-treating's over. Mr. McClure glanced in the direction Bo had indicated. Well, I'll go sit in then and wait for a break. He then turned a friendly smile to Claire and me. Girls, I'd be honored to be your escort. Claire nodded for both of us, but before she could verbally accept the offer, Bo reached out and grabbed my arm, lightning fast. Claire, you go on. Bo pulled me away from my friend in a smooth motion. I'd like to catch up with Jess. See y'all later. He didn't wait for Claire or me to react. Before I knew what was happening, he'd slipped his rough palm into mine, grasped my fingers, and turned toward the converted cafeteria, tugging me after him. I was so shocked by the sensation of his skin and the electric current running up my arm. I followed mutely, because I could only focus on where our palms touched. I loved the feel of him. In truth, I was in danger of climbing him. I just wanted to be near him, touch him, snuggle against him. He was so epically enticing. We wove through the crowd as I tried to memorize the feeling of his hand grasping mine. I had difficulty drawing breath. My stomach was an eruption of suspiciously amorous butterflies. People said hi to both him and me, but we didn't pause. I was his shadow as Bo led me to the buffet table. I dreaded reaching it because he would likely release me. To my surprise, we kept on walking. He didn't glance back at me as we skirted around a table laden with lemonade and sweet tea, heading behind a curtain that ran the length of one wall from ceiling to floor and obscured a set of stairs leading to a small stage. The stage, likewise, was hidden by the curtain. Bo didn't pause once we were up the steps or on the stage. Instead, he continued tugging until he had me to one side, backstage, completely hidden by the curtain, around a corner and behind a wall. It was dark and my eyes required several seconds to adjust. Likewise, my brain hadn't yet caught up with where we were and how we'd arrived here, not to mention who I was with. A single overhead light source cast our surroundings in a grayish murkiness. I nearly tripped over my own feet when Bo turned, placed his hands suddenly on my hips, and backed me into the wall. I felt solid concrete behind me. Bo and all his heroic gorgeousness loomed before me, scant inches away. His glittering eyes ensnared mine. Then, and only then, did he stop. I was so confused. Really, discombobulated was the word for it. This was like something out of a music video fantasy. Did I forget to mention that my daydreams actually present themselves as music videos, a la Paula Abdul's Rush Rush, complete with glowing, imperfection-blurring lens filters? I could only gaze up at him in wonder. He leaned forward, and his forehead hit the rim of my hat. Scowling, he pulled it, the wig, and the beard from my head, dropping them to the floor. I like this costume, he said in a low voice as his hands reclaimed their spot, his thumbs rubbing the area just above my hips like he was entitled to touch me and my body how he liked. The heat from his palms sent spiking shivers to my lower belly. But I do not enjoy that hat. I'd known Bo for almost fifteen years, but had never imagined a moment like this, not in my wildest dreams. 
I hadn't been lying when I'd told Claire my crush on Beau was complicated. My daydreams involved him and me saving people together, a team of rescuers, like the one time I watched as he saved two little boys from a rattlesnake. He'd always been patient, verging on saintly. Basically, they were the neutered fantasies of a young girl with extreme hero worship. But Bo didn't look patient or saintly now, and he felt very, very real. Even in the murky dimness, his eyes sparkled like sapphires, like they possessed their own internal radiance. I thought mournfully of my plain brown irises, and like the weirdo I was, I hoped our make-believe children would inherit his eyes. His hand slid up my body, then pushed my cape over my shoulders with a whisper-light touch. He removed the staff from my hand. I watched as Bo leaned it against the wall with care, his boots scuffing against the wooden floor. Jessica James, you've been giving me hot looks that are difficult to ignore. He said this in a near growl, leaning a fraction of an inch closer. I didn't respond. I didn't know what a hot look was, what it meant, or how to make it on purpose. Regardless, I surmised my inadvertent hot looks were responsible for our alone time. My heart twisted, then leapt as he wet his bottom lip just before drawing the succulent flesh into his mouth between his teeth and biting. That's right, bite that lip. I almost groaned. I was maniacally and fiercely aroused, and I was completely ill-equipped to deal with these feelings. A broken hymen while horseback riding at 13. Lots of random kisses with random guys for fun and practice. A few inconsequential and forgettable gropings in high school and college. A drunken laconic coupling in my dorm room with my physics lab TA last year. These were the pithy total of my adult sexual exploits. In all honesty, I'd enjoyed the horse ride more than the man ride. At least the horse had been a stallion. Looking back, my lab TA was more like a Shetland pony, hairy and small. Truly, I didn't know what I was doing, what we were doing. This was beyond bizarre. If the father of calculus or intrepid anger had brought me backstage at the Green Valley Community Center, I doubt I would be having such divergent thoughts. Instinct told me to tackle Bo, maul him before he discovered his error and tousled my hair like I was still a 12-year-old. At the very least, the crazy part of my brain had made up its mind to tempt his mouth down to my chest. Nothing fantastic had ever happened to my nipples before. I was pretty sure I'd die a happy woman after Bo Winston did something fantastic to my nipples. Speaking of nipples, I didn't realize I'd brought Bo's hand from my hip to my breast until hot sparks of desire radiated from where I pressed his palm against me, the only barriers between our skin, my lace bra, and the thin fabric of my dress. Bo stared at me. His mouth parted in stunned surprise. His eyebrows jumped and his eyes widened at my forward gesture. I arched forward, again without consciously meaning to, straining to close the distance between our bodies, wanting to feel his hard against my soft. And then I learned what a hot look was. Because Bo Winston was giving me a hot look, I wanted to label it as incendiary, but as it was the first hot look I'd ever been aware of receiving, I decided instead to make his hot look the baseline by which all other hot looks would be measured. I didn't get much time to mull over what units of measurements I would apply to hot looks. Would it be Celsius? Calories? Watts? Voltage or lumens? Because Bo did three things, driving all thought and ability to reason from my brain. First, his fingers at my breast worked, massaged and caressed while his thumb brushed over the nipple. His hand felt greedy, rough and fantastic. Second, 
His other hand reached around, gripped my bottom, and squeezed as he brought me against him. Third, he kissed me. Bo Winston was a hell of a good kisser. And, oh, God, parts of me tensed, clenched, braced in a completely new way, a way that made no sense at all, but sent all the amorous flutters diving straight to my pelvis and heat to my lungs. I was abruptly starring in the music video for Beyonce's Naughty Girl and desperately trying to figure out how to get Bo's clothes off. He dominated, pushing me against the wall, his hands under my dress, on the bare skin of my hips, then into my lace underwear, grabbing my bare ass. Nothing about him was soft. He was hard edges, solid granite everywhere I touched, and I touched him. I touched him in a fevered frenzy because I didn't know what the hell was going on or when it would stop. I hoped never. Peripherally, I heard my wizard's staff clatter to the ground. I'd always thought of Bo as a really, really nice guy. But he didn't kiss like a nice guy. Not saintly in the least. He kissed with dangerous and punishing hunger, his mouth greedy and demanding. He bit me, my bottom lip, then soothed and tasted the abused flesh with his tongue while grinding his hips against mine, his hard length growing against my belly. Fuck, Jess, he growled, then pulled his mouth from mine, his breathing labored. He bent to bite my jaw, lick my ear, suck the soft skin into his hot mouth while one hand pushed my little gray dress up to expose my lace-clad breasts. The fingers of his other hand danced around the hem of my panties, but moved no further. I felt his hesitation, and I clawed him. I dug my hands into his shoulders and bucked instinctively, wanting him to touch me. The non-crazy part of my brain told me I was going to be seriously mortified by my behavior at some point in the future. But crazy was now the overwhelming majority. Sanity had lost the popular vote. In response to my crazy, he tugged the cup of my bra down. Then his wet mouth was on the center of my breast. Then his tongue swirled over my nipple as a tortured-sounding moan rumbled in the back of his throat. Then I panted, because it was fantastic. I reached for his white shirt, drawing him closer, and tried to roughly pull it off. He acquiesced, helping me remove the material as my fingertips fumbled for the hem of his boxers, then delved inside. This was easily accomplished, since the coveralls were only loosely held up by the long sleeves tied around his waist. My hand closed around his hard length, and he sucked in a startled-sounding breath, releasing it raggedly as I stroked him. Oh, God. He breathed, his eyes moving back to mine. I'd expected to find them dazed with desire. Instead, he looked a little shocked, panicked even. Wait, wait a minute. He reached for my wrist, and I saw his intentions clear as day. We were moving too fast. He was going to put on the brakes. But the thing was, Crazy didn't want brakes. Crazy wanted acceleration. Crazy wanted velocity. Crazy wanted reckless, heedless, crazy, passionate sex with Bo Winston. And Crazy wanted it right now, against this wall at the Green Valley Community Center while children trick-or-treated and Mrs. Sylvester traded recipes for blueberry muffins ignorant to the fervent and erotic moment on the other side. I stroked him again, pressing my chest to his and lifting on my tiptoes to bite his neck. He shuddered, moaned, his hips instinctively jutting forward and into my palm even as his fingers tightened around my wrist and gently tried to force my withdrawal. Instead, with my dress bunched up under my armpits, I rubbed my body against his. My thumbs circled the head of his erection. With my other hand, I brought his fingers back to my panties, pressing them over the fabric and against my center, and I nipped at his parted lips. His breathing was labored, and he moaned again, cursing. 
Bo's eyes were squeezed shut, like he was trying to separate himself from what was happening, like he was trying to strengthen his resolve, like he was losing control. Abruptly and with an audible growl, he yanked my hand out of his boxers and turned, walking ten steps farther backstage and away from me. I felt the loss of his heat first, then the loss of his touch. I didn't try to pursue him because I felt dizzy, disoriented, and out of breath. Instead, I leaned against the wall at my back, closing my eyes. My body hummed and protested the loss of promised fulfillment. I don't know how long I stood there, gulping air and trying to figure out what had just happened and why it ended. Eventually, I heard him say, God damn it. Again, like a restrained roar, his voice closer than I'd expected. I opened my eyes and found him standing a few feet away, shirtless, hands on his hips. His chest visibly rose and fell as he breathed. His gaze flickered over my body and then to the floor of the stage. Numbly, I adjusted my bra to conceal my breasts and tugged my tiny dress down to my thighs, allowing myself to devour his muscled torso, the ridges of his stomach, the plain of his hard chest. I wanted to touch him again. Jessica, you have got to stop looking at me like that. He sounded irritated, desperate, catching me by surprise and pulling my eyes back to his. I was startled to find that his teeth were clenched, his eyes were flashing. However, despite that he'd just reprimanded me for how I was looking at him, Bo was giving me an extremely hot look. Regardless of his words and the fact that he'd been the one to end our frantic grope fest, he appeared torn. He appeared to be struggling. He appeared to want me very, very badly. I stared at him, mystified. The realization of his want, paired with the reality of the last several minutes, caught up with the here and now. He was watching me as I was watching him. My stare was undoubtedly one of inviting and anxious expectation, whereas his glare oscillated between blatant desire, peppered heavily with longing, and then fierce frustration. I waited silently, witnessed his resolve waver, watching his eyes lose focus as they moved beseechingly between mine. He was still breathing hard. He took a step forward as though pulled, stumbling in a daze, had no choice. Words tumbled from his lips in a rush. Jessica, I'm not who you think I am, and fuck it all, but I want you. I've always wanted you, and I can't do this without you knowing. Dwayne, you dumb here, you back here? A man called from my left, and I heard the telltale sounds of boots on steps. My eyes bulged, my jaw dropped, my breath caught in my throat, and my head whipped to the side and toward the newcomer. It wasn't that I feared getting caught in a heated moment, not at all. The cause of my intense shock was the sound of the approaching voice. It was Bo's voice. Are you back here? The steps slowed, then stopped. Bo once more called out to Duane. Should I, uh, do you need some privacy? My body jolted as understanding punched me in the stomach. The ice bucket of reality quelled any hot looks or hot feelings, and I was left cold. So very, very cold. I turned my attention back to the man of my dreams. Except he wasn't. My companion was most definitely not Bo Winston, hero, world's nicest guy. No, no, no. This man was not Bo. This man was Dwayne. And this man had just done fantastic things to my nipples. Chapter 2 The Road That Is Built in Hope 
is more pleasant to the traveler than the road built in despair, even though they both lead to the same destination. Marion Zimmer Bradley, The Fall of Atlantis Jessica As soon as our eyes tangled, Duane winced, almost like I'd sucker-punched him, and he turned away. I watched his muscled torso and chest rise and fall with an expansive breath just before he plucked his shirt from the floor and pulled it on. He cleared his throat, then called out, Yeah, a little privacy would be nice. Who's back there with you? Is it Tina? Bo's deep, velvety chuckle met my ears and my stomach twisted painfully. I felt like I was going to be sick. My eyes drifted shut. The back of my head hit the wall behind me. My chest seized. I was so stupid. I wished for a black hole to open up under my feet and swallow me, send me to the other side of the universe. Tina was, of course, Tina Patterson, Dwayne's girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend. Really, keeping up with their on-again, off-again relationship was inviting whiplash. She was also my first cousin on my daddy's side, as well as my best friend in elementary and middle school. But we'd gone in very different directions since. None of your business, dummy. Go away. Dwayne answered his twin. His voice sounded thick, gravelly, and I felt his eyes on me, though mine remained firmly closed. All right, all right, fine. Tell Tina I say hi. But we're leaving for Bandit Lake in twenty minutes. Bo's response was paired with the sound of boots descending the stairs. The first notes of a new song played between my ears. Radiohead's Creep. Ice entered my veins, even as a mortified flush spread up my neck over my cheeks to the top of my head. Gritting my teeth, I opened my eyes and glared at Dwayne Winston. If he thought I'd been giving him hot looks before, then my new look was now the polar opposite. I was aiming for the equivalent of midnight at the Arctic Pole during the winter solstice. His hands were on his hips, and I watched him slowly nibble on his bottom lip like he was tasting it, like he was tasting me. His eyes were on the floor of the stage, his breath beginning to even, though not yet completely normalized. A weird thought occurred to me, making me feel hot with guilt and shame. I cheated on Bo, betrayed him in some way. Really, this was just more of my crazy thinking, because my infatuation with Bo had always been extremely one-sided. I may have been ridiculous, but I was not deluded. Regardless, the guilt, shame, and anger I was feeling meant I'd never wanted to stab and or maim someone as much as I wanted to stab and or maim Dwayne Winston in that moment. Therefore, I was not surprised when I said the words I was thinking. You are such a bastard. His eyes lifted then, glittering spheres that held just a whisper of bitter amusement buried under another hot look. Now she speaks, he said flatly. What? What are you talking about? Now you speak, he accused, sounding so different to my ears. Instead of the friendly and adorable bow, I heard Duane, sarcastic, sullen, snappish Duane. This whole time, since I walked over to you and Claire, you hadn't said a single word. Not when I took you away from your friend, not when I pulled you through the cafeteria, not when I brought you here, not when I had my hand in your panties and your tits in my mouth. But now, miraculously, you find your voice. God, how I loathed him. You are such a bastard, I repeated louder and a little more violently this time as I pointedly tried to ignore the confusing, swirling, humming desire that still twisted in my belly. I used the lingering passion to fuel my anger. Nice to see you again, Jess. I admit you filled out very nicely. His eyes blazed a path from my strappy sandals to my breasts, but you're still just as bratty as ever. I charged forward and pushed against his chest. You lying asshat! I thought you were Bo! 
Before I could claw his eyes out, Dwayne caught my wrists and walked me backward, against the wall, holding my arms hostage over my head. His body trapped me, keeping me in place. I tried to knee him in the groin, but he deftly sidestepped and pressed his legs against mine to keep them immobile. Oh, there now, princess, we'll have none of that. This unfortunate position meant that his impressive erection was digging into my abdomen, and my breasts were flattened against his chest. Again, confusing, swirling, humming desire ignited, and I clenched my jaw to keep from rubbing my torso along his. Our eyes locked. His look was still hot, but now tempered with something else— something that felt like contempt, flavored with bitterness. I hope you wander into a hornet's nest and dive in a acetylcholine overdose, I spat. You say the prettiest things. Let me go. Not until you calm down. These words sounded exceedingly reasonable. Calm down? Calm down, I bellowed, because I'd never been so angry in my entire life. I didn't know how I was going to calm down. I might never calm down. I might spend the rest of my life as a five-foot-six blonde female version of the Incredible Hulk. So, she-Hulk, but not a lawyer. I wanted to smash everything, starting with Dwayne Winston. Yes, calm down. I am never going to calm down, I shouted in his face. Then we'll stand here forever, he shouted in my face. I glared at him. He glared back. A storm of feelings whirled around us and between us. I despised him, yet some nonsensical, obviously mentally ill part of myself felt relief at the discovery of his duplicitousness. Duane had never made me dreamy-eyed because he was definitely not heroic. Duane had made me tongue-tied, but only because he'd always made me mad. He wasn't perfect. He was real. And he was an arrogant ass. Yeah, he was sinfully good-looking, but he was also argumentative and aggravating. Nevertheless, and because Crazy Brain was obviously still in charge, I desperately wanted him to kiss me again. Kiss me and touch me and pull my hair and bite the softest parts of my body. I wanted his hungry mouth and greedy fingers. I wanted him. His eyes, made even more brilliant by his anger, narrowed as he watched me, moved between mine, then darted to my lips. I wondered if he could read my thoughts. I wondered if I was still throwing him inadvertent hot looks. I wondered at the unfairness of his eyes. He had such pretty eyes, blue and glittering, mesmerizing. It was a shame they belonged to Satan. I hate you. I whispered, feeling confused, defensive, and therefore spiteful. Dwayne's fingers loosened just a smidge where he held me, and his thumb stroked the inside of my wrist. I shivered, and I hated myself for the involuntary response. He cocked an eyebrow and whispered gently, softly, I hate you too, Jess. I hate you so very. Very much. Inexplicably, my breathing quickened. Further muddling matters, Duane's pretty eyes were fastened on my mouth, and his mouth was lowering, inch by excruciating inch, closer to mine. As though pulled, as though our lips were still magnetized, I lifted my chin. Then, like before, he pulled away. Again, I felt the loss of his heat first, but this time I felt like he'd also thrown me off a bridge. I was free-falling into nothing. As well, his eyes, instead of unfocused with desire, were mocking and hard. He shrugged, stuffing his hands into his pockets, his lips twisted to the side in a derisive sneer. Did you forget? I'm not Bo.
I drew myself up, straightened my spine, braced my feet apart, and shot him daggers as I said, Obviously, you're not Bo. He doesn't have to lie about who he is in order for me to like him. Dwayne's flinch was subtle. If I'd blinked, I would have missed it. The muscle at his temple jumped and his eyes hardened further. He looked like he was going to toss me another insult, so I bent and retrieved my beard, staff, and hat. My cape swirled around my shoulders. I was intent on getting as far away from him as possible, as soon as possible. You know what? Never mind. Just, just go away and leave me alone. I turned, tucked my hat under my arm, and managed three paces toward the curtain before Duane's hand caught me by the wrist. What are you doing? he asked. I tried to shake him off, but his grip strengthened. I'm leaving. Not that way you're not. I huffed, still not looking at him. Why not? Without answering me, Duane turned me around and slipped his hand in mine. I promptly planted my feet in place and pulled my palm out of his grip. He turned suddenly and charged me, cursing under his breath before spearing me with a menacing glower and barely restrained fury. Listen, princess, my brothers are probably waiting for me out there. If we leave the way we came in, they're all going to see us, together, and that includes Bo. Now do you understand? I frowned at him absorbing his harshly spoken statement. At length, I nodded once, reluctantly realizing I would have to accept his help in order to avoid an epic walk of shame. So, how do I get out of here? Follow me. He moved like it was going to touch my hand again, but I pulled it out of his reach and took a step back. His eyes shot scorching flames at my retreat. You don't need to hold my hand in order for me to follow you. I crossed my arms over my chest, closed my cape around me, and lifted my chin. Lead the way, Duane. He studied me, and his eyes dimmed, grew remote and guarded. Inexplicably, my stomach flipped, and I felt oddly remorseful. After a protracted moment, Duane swallowed. His voice was thick and gravelly when he finally said, Sure thing, princess. Then he turned away from me toward some unseen exit, his stride unhurried, languid and confident, and sexy as hell. I hesitated for a single second, then followed reluctantly. I couldn't help but admire his backside, the nice curve of his bottom, the width of his strong shoulders, how his waist tapered at his hips, and how he walked. I kept thinking about his heavenly kisses, his divine, rough hands on my body, and his hot mouth on my skin. I pushed those thoughts away, but they were replaced with the memory of how great he'd felt in my hands, long and smooth and hard and thick, and how close I'd come to having him inside me. I bit my lip to stifle a pitiful groan, feeling out of breath and dizzy from the mere possibility. Despite how I loathed him, I knew now that riding Duane would not be like anything I'd ever experienced. He was no Shetland pony. He was a stallion. And I despised myself a little for still wanting him. I was all mixed up. And worst of all, I would have to live my life trying to suppress the memory of Dwayne Winston doing fantastic things to my nipples. Cletus Winston took a step back from my truck and scratched his beard. He looked to me where I hovered anxiously by my open driver's side door and said, Catastrophic engine failure. I blinked at him. What? Catastrophic engine failure. You have it. Feeling abruptly winded, I croaked. That doesn't sound good. It's not good. It's bad, he said simply. I shifted from foot to foot, trying to keep my teeth from chattering. Now ten o'clock and bitterly cold outside, I was still dressed as sexy Gandalf. 
I was sure my nipples were as hard as frozen peas and gave my chest a lovely headlight effect. To Cletus's credit, he didn't appear to be interested in my boobtacular headlights. What can I do? I asked, grimacing at the small, desperate quality of my voice. The evening's events were catching up with me. After Duane had led me outside from a hidden exit behind the stage, I'd taken off without looking back and re-entered the community center from the front door. Immediately, my brother and father saw me and proceeded to throw disapproving glares at my skimpy costume. I welcomed the distraction because every part of me missed the feeling of Duane's hands and mouth. All evening I shivered, but it wasn't from cold. I tried my best to ignore it. I was unsettled. I'd effectively put off Claire's pointed questions. I'd excelled at chit-chat with my students' parents, despite my ironic costume choice, and I'd successfully avoided seeing both Duane and Bo. Granted, based on what Bo had said about leaving for Bandit Lake, they were probably long gone from the community center well before I tried to leave. Duane was probably off with my cousin Tina, giving her his hot looks and kisses. Ugh, I shook myself out of my weird musings about Duane, who I most certainly did not care about, and tried to focus on something else, anything else. I'd even sat still long enough to listen to Cletus Winston play his banjo solo in one of the music rooms during an oddly charming folk rendition of Michael Jackson's Thriller. But I was tired, and my head was muddled, and I was tired of my head being muddled, and my monster truck wouldn't start. Thankfully, just as I was about to give up hope, Cletus was walking by my truck with his banjo case tucked under his arm. He recognized me from my perch and stopped. Without asking any questions, he motioned for me to pop the release and took a flashlight out of his pants pocket. Then he delved under my hood. At present, he was shaking his head, his lips twisting to the side. Your timing belt broke. You need a new engine. I need a new engine? I asked dumbly. You need a new engine and a new timing belt. Oh, the wind left my lungs in a whoosh, and I staggered a bit to the side. I was dizzy, mostly because there were little dollar signs flying around my head. I couldn't afford a new engine. I couldn't afford a new car. I had student loans out the wazoo, and a new car would mean delaying all my plans. In an instant, Cletus was at my elbow, his hand wrapping around my waist. He must have realized I was about to fall down because he scooped me up in his arms and said, You have to grab my banjo and carry it on your lap. What? I stared up at him, at his brown beard and his perma-serious hazel eyes. My banjo case. You'll need to carry it on your lap. I can't carry both you and the case unless I put you over my shoulder. But I think that would be counterproductive seeing as your skirt is extremely short and is already hiked up around your thighs. I glanced down at myself and found his words to be an understatement. I'd taken my cape off earlier. Along with my beard, hat, and staff, it was in the cab of the truck. Therefore, I was basically mooning the darkened parking lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shook my head to clear it. Just, just put me down. I'll figure something out. Cletus deposited my feet on the ground, but didn't move away. Did your daddy already leave? I nodded. My dad and brother would be on duty tonight. I had no desire to call them for a ride. Too bad. I meant to talk to him about the mail sorter down at the station. It's due for maintenance. Do you happen to know if they're having any troubles? Non sequiturs and rapid subject changes weren't unusual for Cletus, so I shook my head, having no idea what he was talking about. I'm sorry, I have no idea. Hmm. Well, what about your mama? She's visiting my Aunt Louisa in Texas, who has cancer, so I don't know how long Mama will be out there. My teeth chattered, and I glared at the monster truck. Aunt Louisa had no children and had never been married. She lived alone in a huge house on a horse farm in Texas for the last 15 or so years. Mama and I had visited for a few weeks every summer, and I'd spent entire summers during college keeping her company and running errands. Sometimes she'd come to our house for Christmas. She was the kind of person who kept others at an arm's length. 
Even after spending months with her, I never felt like I really knew her. But my mama and aunt were very close. I heard Cletus sigh. With his arms still around my waist, he walked us both to his banjo case and picked it up. Well, looks like you're coming with me. Do you have a sweater or something? No, Cletus, I don't want to be a bother. His hand gripped me tighter. Nonsense, you're no bother, but I have to make a stop before I take you home. What about that sweater? A coat, maybe? I have a wizard cape in the truck, I offered weakly. I wouldn't have driven it tonight if I thought the problem was this serious. I didn't expect it to break down. They never do. Cletus grunted and kicked my driver's side door shut. Then he pushed me gently against it. Hold still, he said, placing his banjo back on the ground. He took off his black and red flannel jacket and handed it to me. I thought about pushing it away, but something about his deadpan expression told me not to argue. Thanks, Cletus. You're welcome, Miss James. I frowned at the formal salutation. Cletus Winston was the third oldest of the Winston kids and was a full six or seven years older than me. You can call me Jessica, you know. Nope, you're my teacher. It wouldn't be fit. He grabbed the banjo case in one arm, me with the other, and marched us to his car. Wait, I glanced over my shoulder. I didn't lock the truck. Cletus shrugged. I wouldn't fret too much about it. In order for someone to steal the beast, they'd have to install a new engine. After the 17th switchback, I lost count. Cletus was taking me up the mountain to check on a friend's house before he could take me home. We fell into a surprisingly companionable silence as he was focused on navigating his geoprism. That was also surprising. Cletus's car choice. Here was a guy who worked on cars for a living. He, Dwayne, and Bo found old classics and fixed them up to sell at a hefty premium. According to my daddy, the Winston Brothers Auto Shop was doing gangbusters business, and Cletus was driving a 1990 Geo Prism painted primer gray. I tried to use the quiet time to ponder my own car situation, figure out a solution. Instead, I spent 99% of my brain power slapping away thoughts of Dwayne Winston and his tongue. He really did have a lovely tongue. Unlike most of my previous kiss encounters, Dwayne seemed to be a man that actually knew what he was doing with his tongue. He used it in the most delightful ways. I was a little stunned and disoriented when we pulled into a gravel driveway at the very top of the mountain and Cletus put the car in neutral to park. We're here, he said, engaging the emergency brake, the sound punctuating his words. You should come with me. I don't know how long I'll be and I don't like the idea of leaving you in the car by yourself. I shrugged and looked around at the inky darkness. I had no idea where we were and couldn't find my way back if my life and the future of chocolate hung in the balance. I'm sure I'll be fine. Looks like there's not another person out here for miles. That may be, he said, his eyes flickering over to mine before he twisted in his seat to pull out a large canvas bag from behind him. But there are bears out here. This is a reliable car, but it won't keep out bears. My eyes widened at the thought, and I quickly opened my door when he opened his. I followed him to a big house with a wraparound porch. All the lights were off. Whose house is this? I asked, taking in the pretty white trim. Dr. Ruinus, the game warden from D.C. He's on a trek with my brother Jethro at present in North Carolina. Should be back close to Christmas, I suspect. And you're looking after the place? Cletus gave a non-committal shrug and veered away from the porch in the darkness. More like I'm keeping an eye on the two people who are supposed to be looking after the place. I stumbled on something I couldn't see, causing Cletus to halt and turn. He fit his hand in mine, then used the contact to pass me a flashlight. Here, I got my hands full with this stuff. He let go of my hand and picked up the canvas bag he'd momentarily placed at his feet. Maybe you could make yourself useful by shining the light ahead of us? I got the impression Cletus could see just fine without the flashlight, but was perhaps looking to give me an excuse to use it. 
I gave him a grateful smile and clicked it on, shining the light ahead and was surprised when I saw a wooden boardwalk with a rail directly in front of us. Where does this go? Down to the lake. Cletus began walking again, his boots connecting with the wood of the boardwalk, making a distinct thudding sound. His movements were swift while mine were hesitant, as I tried to see by the glow of the flashlight. Therefore, he was soon twenty or more feet ahead of me. I realized we were approaching stairs that descended into a black nothing. Which lake? I asked, hesitating again. Bandit Lake. He threw over his shoulder just before falling out of sight. I stopped, suddenly unable to move, and whispered to myself, Bandit Lake. Bo and Duane were at Bandit Lake. My heart rate skyrocketed, and despite the fact that my legs were bare and I was in strappy high heels, I felt abruptly hot and anxious. I didn't know what to do, so I stood stone still, my flashlight shining in the direction where Cletus had disappeared. I couldn't go forward, so I lingered, feeling paralyzed and fretful for an indeterminate period of time. I kept thinking, what if he's there? But I didn't know which he I meant. Did I mean Bo? Or did I mean Duane? Forward likely led to the twins. One made me tongue-tied and the other... The other... A rustling from behind caused me to jump, pulling me out of my musings and back to the present, a small squeak escaping my throat. I was still flushed, but I shivered, my heart now thundering in my chest. It might have been a bear. It might have been a possum. I tried to calm down, but then an owl hooted and my squeak turned into a yelp. Winston twins or not, anything was preferable to being stranded alone in the darkness on a moonless Halloween night in the middle of nowhere. Swallowing the lump in my throat, I ventured forward and down the steps, pausing briefly to take off my shoes when I realized they were keeping me from moving at maximum speed. I sprinted forward, a feeling of dread in my chest. Every few feet I thought I heard the sound of steps behind me. This only made me move recklessly faster. A lump formed in my throat when I realized I should have reached Cletus already, but the stairs were never ending. The light in front of me seemed to waver. My hands were shaking. I clenched my jaw, telling myself to relax. But then I heard the steps again, and this time they were unmistakable. Someone, or something, was behind me, and it was moving faster than I was. Panic and dread and every torturous emotion clawed at my lungs, which were now on fire, and I had only one thought. I needed to get away. I descended another two full flights of stairs, the sound at my back growing louder, and a scream started building in my throat. But just before I released it, a hand closed around my mouth and an arm wrapped around my middle, easily lifting me off my feet. I thrashed against the strong hold, dropping both my shoes and the flashlight in my struggle. Blind fear took the place of sense, and I bit one of the fingers over my mouth with gusty violence. Ow! Damn it, that hurt! I felt the hard chest behind me vibrate as the hand was removed from my mouth. I recognized that the voice of my captor belonged to either Duane or Bo Winston. Therefore, I froze. Who the hell are you, and what the hell are you doing here, and why the hell did you bite me? I swallowed, tearing my lip through my teeth. My back was still to his front. My feet were still not touching the ground. Tentatively, I asked, Duane? He stilled, and I felt some of the tension leave his arms. Slowly, carefully, gently he set me down and turned me to face him. I could just make out a shadow of his features in the starlight. Jessica? he asked, his hands on my shoulders. Jessica James? Yes. Yes, it's me. I swallowed my last word. My knees feeling weak as adrenaline left my body, I was so relieved. Despite our lengthy history of mutual dislike and his trickery earlier in the evening, my chest flooded with warmth at the sight of him. I could never remember being so happy to see the outline of another person in my whole life. Are you okay? He asked, his voice soft and concerned. 
Overcome, I lunged forward and threw my arms around him, burying my face in his neck. I knew I was behaving like a lunatic, but I'd spent the whole night thinking about him. I needed him to hold me, even if he didn't like me. I needed him. He shushed me, his arms coming around my body, his hand petting my hair. It's all right, Jessica, I got you now. I had no idea how much time passed as we stood holding each other. I know I snuggled shamelessly closer, eliciting a short, velvety chuckle from him. And then, just as I was beginning to relax and decide what to do next, he surprised me by saying, Jessica, I'm not Dwayne, honey, I'm Bo. As soon as the words left his mouth, but before I could react, before I distinguished whether what I felt was joy or disappointment, the screams started. Chapter 3 Let Love Find You Don't go looking for it. The best way to attract a mate is to post an ad on Craigslist titled, Have Lube Will Travel. Jared Kent's Love Quotes for the Ages, specifically ages 18 to 81. Dwayne. I knew the exact moment I fell for Jessica James. I remember it clear as day. Even though I hadn't set eyes on her for years, time and distance hadn't dulled the memory. The constancy of my regard for Jessica just made her presence now in Green Valley feel transitory, like she was slipping through my fingers. I was 16. She was 14. I'd shoved her off a dock into the river behind our house. Instead of screaming or freaking out like a stupid girl, she'd grabbed my leg on her way down and pulled me under, too, dragging me out to the middle. I was in my swim shorts, and she was in her Sunday school dress. While we were struggling under the water, she'd pulled my shorts down and off, then escaped. Seeing as how she'd been on the swim team since elementary school, she was the better swimmer, even in a Sunday school dress. Jessica had climbed onto the bank, her blonde hair had been wet, tangled around her face, down her back. Her white dress had clung to her body, making every young curve visible. And she'd taken off. She'd always been real pretty, but so had lots of other girls. Spitting mad, I ran after her, not caring one lick that I was naked. I'd caught her easily enough. I was the better runner, faster, and tackled her to the ground. I'd pinned her hands above her head and searched them. They were empty. Where are my shorts? I demanded, furious. Her body had shook beneath mine. She was laughing. She was laughing so hard she could hardly breathe. And I remember thinking, she was beautiful. Then she'd said, I threw them in a tree. I'd watched her, again losing her breath to laughter, and I couldn't stop my smile. You threw them in a tree? I asked feeling a touch of wonder at her cleverness. Yeah, she'd said, her smile wide and crooked. You think being mean is enough, being mean and being smart is better. That was the moment. That was when it happened. Though I grew up seeing her nearly every day, I hadn't noticed she was a girl, or the existence of any other girl, until I was nearly 13. By then it was too late. She disliked me, but she worshipped my brother. He didn't see her, not really, not like I did. Sure, we'd argued since childhood, but that's what kids do when they're in a pack of wild children. I'd always liked her, but I fell hard the day she threw my swim trunks into a tree. Presently, I was sitting 200 feet from Bandit Lake, staring at the bonfire Bo and I had built hours before and feeling downright sorry for myself. I stood, shaking my head, and pushed the memory aside. I glanced at my cup. It was empty. Usually, I'd take the roadrunner out to clear my head. If I wasn't going fast, then I wasn't really driving, and that car was built for speed. But I wasn't going to chance mountain roads when I was too bourbon shot shy drunk. I was refilling my cup when Cletus suddenly appeared at the edge of the bonfire and gave me a fright. He was a floating head, his body invisible. I was the first to see him, and he scared the breath out of me. I inhaled sharply and jumped about three feet. 
He also made me spill the bourbon. Damn it, Cletus! I closed my eyes, concentrated on slowing my pulse. Then one of the girls screamed, then another. Soon they were all screaming. I sighed because they were irritating. Cattle, I thought. It was an uncharitable thought. My mother would have been disappointed. I felt a little pull under my lowermost left rib. Her death was still fresh for me. I couldn't think about it without hurting someplace. I opened my eyes, grinded my teeth, and set about the task of pacifying the screamers. It's Cletus, my brother. Tina, listen to me. Tina, it's just Cletus. Tina's screams continued until I covered her mouth with my hand. Her brown eyes were wide and worried as she glanced from me to my older brother. When I was sure she wasn't going to scream again, I took my palm away. Cletus, she parroted, frowning. Her face was framed by a black and yellow wig. Her cleavage was spilling out of the sexy bee costume she wore as she gathered gulping breaths. Yeah, it's Cletus. Just Cletus. I glanced at him. He wasn't helping the situation by hovering just beyond the glow of the fire, his eyes eerily wide. I pressed my lips together to keep from laughing. He must have been wearing a black turtleneck because he really did look like a floating head. The other guys had also stood but were now shaking off the brief fright and moving forward to welcome my brother. In all, there were about 25 people gathered, almost an equal amount of guys and girls. The bonfire had been Bo's idea, and he'd promised to keep the party small. 25 felt like a crowd. The mood I was in, I would have preferred five or six or one. Tina wrapped her arms around me, giggling into my chest. She was two vodka shots past drunk and she was pissing me off. Dwayne, baby, hold me. I'm scared. I placed my arm around her shoulders, mostly to keep her from falling into the flames and ruining everyone's good time, and walked her over to a blanket. My plan to remove her from my side proved difficult, because she seemed to have grown two more arms. Each time I removed one, another three took its place. Too late. I realized this was because she was climbing me with her legs. Tina and I had been seeing each other on and off for going on five years. I called it quits once and for all four months ago. This was the first time I'd seen her since. Come on, Tina. I pushed her away, cursing my brother for inviting her in the first place. Looking back, five years with Tina was four years and eleven months too long. She'd never been my girl, but she liked to tell people she was. Sure, she was pretty enough beautiful even. She had a free-spirited wildness that had been fun for about ten minutes. She also had the body of an exotic dancer, because she was one, and never lacked enthusiasm when we fucked. But that's all it had ever been. Fucking. And five years of fucking around was more than enough. What Tina had in looks, she lacked in sense. She was shrewd, but ignorant. I couldn't talk to her about anything because she didn't know about anything other than towny gossip, biker gossip, how to work a pole, and how to spread her legs. Hell, I'd been ready to shoot that horse four years ago, but she'd become a bad habit. She was easy and soft and persistent, and that had been enough to keep me from turning her away. Until last July. Until I found out from Jackson James that his sister was moving back to town. With the firm grip, I finally succeeded in removing Tina's claws, setting her on a blanket and away from me. Stay there, I ordered, then walked around the circle of flames to greet my brother, throwing my paper cup in the fire. Tina climbing on me was incentive enough to sober up. I heard her call my name, but I ignored it. Two shot shy of drunk was where I wanted to stop, especially since I was still frustrated from earlier events. It's me. Your brother Cletus, he said unnecessarily, as he was prone to do, dropping a canvas bag to the ground at his feet. I felt my lips tugged to the side. He was wearing a black turtleneck and black pants. Hey, are you sticking around? Nah, just dropping off the supplies Bo wanted. I studied him. He looked cold. You want to warm up next to the fire before you go? 
Sure. Maybe for a bit. Where's your jacket? I gave my jacket to a lady in need. She'll be along shortly. I didn't get a chance to question him further because he lifted his chin to the crowd. Who are these people? Mostly Bo's friends. I scanned several unfamiliar faces. You know how he is. He has more friends than a tree has leaves. Some are from Maryville. A few came over from the Cades Cove side. I knew the moment his eyes found Tina because they turned mean. What's she doing here? You back with that? No, I said, feeling revulsion at the thought. No way. He nodded, frowning in an atypical display of dislike. Good, because she's a crazy bitch. I didn't even have three seconds to register or feel surprised at Cletus' words before Bo reappeared at the edge of the bonfire, drawing everyone's attention to him and the girl he had tucked under his arm. If Cletus' statement had surprised me, then the sight of Jessica James pressed against my twin nearly knocked me flat on my ass. Time slowed. I couldn't breathe. My vision turned red. My throat and chest burned. I wanted to punch something. Or someone. What the fuck? My thoughts escaped on a breath, and a deep, piercing pain twisted in my gut. Thankfully, only Cletus had heard my curse. Oh, yeah. Catastrophic engine failure. Cletus lifted his chin towards Jessica as though catastrophic engine failure was her name. I'm taking Miss James home. I turned my glare to Cletus and snapped. What do you mean you're taking her home? His stare narrowed and he openly studied me. I hated it when he did this. When Cletus put his mind to something, he could see everything. I averted my eyes but then instantly regretted it because Jessica was looking straight at me. Images of her bare tits, her hot looks, bringing my hand to her flimsy panties played through my mind's eye. I swallowed so I wouldn't groan. Thankful I'd changed into jeans because fucking hell, I was abruptly hard. Again, my gut twisted. Again, I couldn't breathe. I fought to distance myself from her gaze, but she reeled me in. Her mouth, her eyes, her body, my bait. Jessica was so much more than beautiful. I hadn't wanted things to escalate backstage at the community center. That wasn't my intent or my goal. It was a kiss I was after. A single kiss. Tricking her, taking her backstage had been a spur-of-the-moment decision. For me, spur-of-the-moment was well beyond my comfort zone. I liked to know what to expect. I liked the certainty that came with the well-laid plan. But I'd wanted her mouth on mine. The ferocity of that want had made me a little crazy at the time. I'd wanted that memory. Because with Jessica... I'd always wanted so much more than fucking around. When she thought I was Bo, her big brown eyes had been trusting, adoring. She never looked at me like that before. It was addictive. I wanted her to do it again. But my terrible prospects were dwindling. I should have waited, and I was paying the price now. I'd been practicing my speech for months, waiting for the right time. I'd blown my careful planning on one kiss but I couldn't help thinking it had been worth it. Her skin had been soft, like a petal or silk. The memory of touching, tasting, and holding Jessica and having her return the force of my attentions was still fresh, as was the suffocating misery of her rejection. I didn't blame her for hating me. Not at all. And now I reckoned it'd be the only time she'd let anything akin to affection between us. In retrospect, I also reckoned she'd never have given Dwayne Winston the time of day. And so, I wasn't sorry I'd tricked her. I balled my hands into fist and forced my mind to blank. Even so, my eyes were drawn to her lips. They'd always been a little slanted, higher on one side than the other. This imperfection only added to her appeal. It made her look like she was thinking about a private joke, like she was ready to laugh. My eyes lowered to her neck before I forced myself to stop. If I moved them any lower, I'd be thinking about her naked again. I didn't need that kind of torture, so I brought my eyes back to hers. She wasn't looking at me with trust now. I couldn't read her expression, but it appeared to be founded in unkind thoughts. I wiped my own expression clean. 
I didn't want her to see what she did to me. I was caught in her web. Worse, she didn't even know she'd caught me. And even if she had known, she couldn't care less. These thoughts tasted bitter, and I regretted throwing away my cup. Everyone, most of you already know her, but in case you don't, this is Jessica James, Bo announced with his usual charm. He glanced down at her, and she removed her eyes from mine to look at my brother. He smiled. She returned it, but hers looked shy. I had the distinct sensation I'd swallowed rocks. Jessica, this is everyone. People waved. A few stood up to greet her, including Tina. Vaguely, I remembered they were somehow related. Cousins, maybe. But I could only stare. I felt like I'd been planted. Roots had grown out of my feet. I couldn't look away. She was wearing a man's jacket. I suspected Cletus's by the look of it. But her long, toned legs were still bare to her thighs, and she had no shoes. I think we'll stay for a while, Cletus announced. Fine, I said, realizing too late it sounded like a growl. Good. Okay, then. Excellent, he said, rubbing his hands together. He had the outward appearance of calm, bored even, but I knew my brother well enough to know his tales. Rubbing his hands together meant he was near giddy. My suspicions were confirmed when he added, in fact, we should all play a game. I scowled at him, still wanting to punch something, and he was closest. Hey, Bo. Cletus ignored me, stepping forward. Dwayne wants to play truth or dare. I set my jaw grimacing. Several chimed in with their support for this terrible idea. Before long, someone had placed a cup in Jessica's hand. The crowd was huddled together and truths were being shared like STDs and unsolicited advice. I withdrew to the edge of the group, sitting with my knees up and my elbows resting on them. I couldn't help but watch Bo with Jessica. Each time she smiled at him was like rubbing salt on a wound or shoving a hot poker up my nose. She was sitting close. His arm was around her. They were laughing together. I wanted to gouge my eyes out. Just when I'd had enough and was thinking about leaving, taking that fast drive, Tina turned to me and said, Dwayne, baby, truth or dare? She cast me a seductive gaze, her brown eyes flirtatious as she sucked on her index finger. It did nothing for me. I shrugged and said, I'm not playing. Come on, it was your idea, Tina pouted, appealing to the crowd. I felt myself grimace as I ground out. Fine. Dare. Most people chose truth, but I'd always preferred dare. I'd never had the good sense to be afraid of perilous situations like most people. I'd been bungee jumping, drag racing, skydiving, none of which had ever set my blood pumping beyond a mild degree. The more dangerous my circumstances, the more focused I became. I couldn't think of doing a single thing that scared me and I'd never embarrassed easily. However, right this minute, talking about myself in front of Jessica felt downright terrifying. Tina squealed and clapped. She reminded me of a piglet. Yay! Okay, good. I was hoping you'd pick Dare. I dare you to come over here and kiss me. Someone, probably an idiot, called out, I'll take that, Dare. I tried not to gag. My attention moved to Jessica. I don't know why I did it. Some part of me, likely the asshole part that enjoys feeling like shit, wanted to see a reaction. Or non-reaction. But to my surprise, she wasn't gazing at Bo. She was looking at Tina. And she was looking at Tina like she wanted to bury her alive. The intensity of her glare, the ice behind it, caught me off guard. Suddenly... His and Tina didn't seem quite so revolting. All right, I drawled. Jessica's eyes flickered to mine. Before she was able to hide it, I saw misery and shock. And if I wasn't mistaken, I also saw jealousy. Encouraged by the possibility that Jess might care a little about who I was kissing, I stood and picked my way through the crowd, then knelt in front of Tina. I had a decision to make. 
I could give her a quick peck and move the game forward. Or I could kiss Tina like I wanted to kiss Jess. I could use her. I could exploit the situation and potentially push Jess out of her comfort zone, hopefully provoking some response, something to give me a reason to hope. Decision made. I grabbed Tina by the neck and I kissed the hell out of her. Pretending Tina Patterson was Jessica James was like pretending tofu was steak. Despite the disparity in quality, texture, and taste, I soldiered on. I tapped into a hell of a lot of pent-up sexual frustration and had to restrain her hands when I felt them reach from my dick. The crowd had made noises at first, egging me on, but then they grew quiet, and I heard a few whispers. Damn, that boy can kiss. And, I'm next. And, remind me to use my next turn on Dwayne. As soon as I finished, I lifted my eyes to Jess, and what I saw made my chest hurt. But this time, it was a good hurt. Her glare was affixed to mine. Her face was bright red. Her usual charming smirk was replaced with a deep frown. Beyond all that, she was giving me a hot look. I wiped my mouth with the back of my hand and stood, holding her gaze and leaving Tina dazed on the blanket. It's your turn, Duane. Cletus's voice broke the silence. He sounded cheerful for Cletus. Pick anyone you want. Anyone at all. I nodded, my eyes never leaving Jessica's, and gritted my teeth in preparation for what I was going to do next, my mind homing in on my target. It would require courage, the kind that risked public rejection. Jessica. Her name on my lips sounded too loud. I had an odd thought just then that I should only ever whisper her name, and that she would always be close enough to hear it. Truth or dare, I whispered. Her gaze narrowed. Even beneath the thick coat she wore, I could see her chest rise and fall with her breath. To drive my point home, I allowed my eyes to flicker meaningfully to Bo. I hoped she'd interpret the movement as an implied threat to expose her feelings for him. For the record, I would never do that. I would have to be a complete idiot to do that. If Bo had any idea, he'd be a jackass to let her go. Also, it would be a betrayal. I didn't want to betray Jessica. I wanted to cherish her. Dare, she said, like she was daring me and not the other way around. I kept my relief from showing, but did allow myself a smirk. Okay, dare it is. Again, I picked my way through the crowd and again I knelt on the blanket. This time I was kneeling next to Jess, and she was adorably ruffled, unable to hide her anger. I dare you to come with me and go skinny dipping in Bandit Lake for the next hour. Her brown eyes widened, rimmed with shock, and the crowd erupted in opinions. I heard someone say, I should have thought of that one. That's a good one. Well, I pushed burying my enthusiasm under an expression of boredom. What's it going to be? Finally, she sputtered. An hour? That lake is near freezing. We'll get hypothermia. Okay. Thirty minutes, then. Thirty minutes? Fifteen. Final offer. Or else you have to choose truth. A wrinkle formed above her nose and her eyes bounced between mine. Then, abruptly, she lifted her chin and said with venom, Fine, I accept. She stood, unzipped her jacket, tossed it to Cletus, then jogged out of the circle of the bonfire's light. I was too surprised to move at first, but then Bo punched me in the shoulder. What are you waiting for, dumbass? Go get her. I stared at my brother and he stared back, giving me an excited, encouraging smile. And I saw what I'd been blind to earlier. Bo wasn't interested in Jessica, not because she wasn't beautiful or amazing. She was. She was gorgeous. She was smart and clever. She was breathtaking. She was also too good for either of us. Bo wasn't interested in Jess because he knew how I felt. Of course he did. We were twins. He must have always known. We exchanged a brotherly grin and he punched me again. Go on. Get. I nodded once, then stood, 
towing my boots off and pulling both my sweater and shirt over my head. I left everything but my pants in a pile on the ground, grabbed a steel-folded blanket, then sprinted into the woods after Jessica James. I was always running after her, but this time I wasn't going to let her get away. Chapter 4 The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Lao Tzu Jessica I've never been a liar. I'm not that creative and I lack the energy required. I'm not even very good at lying to myself. That's probably why I currently felt like my brain was being torn in two. I didn't like that I wanted Dwayne Winston, but there it was. He'd done something to me, awoke some slumbering feminine feral creature, and now I was pathetic with thinking about him. And it wasn't just wanting his kiss, his touch, his body, and maybe even a bit of his sassy back talk. I was thinking about him and our interactions growing up and all the countless hours we'd spent in each other's company not getting along. To make matters even more muddled, whatever he'd done to me backstage at the community center had apparently miraculously broken the bow spell, at least for the night. I wasn't sure if this was a good or a bad thing. On one hand, I'd always known my feelings for Bo were based on an unhealthy and unrealistic infatuation. On the other hand, at least Bo had been nice to me. No sassy backtalk from Bo Winston. Only friendly smiles, honesty, and kindness, which was why I'd hero-worshipped him for so long. But now, almost nothing. When Bo had found me in the dark and told me who he was, the first thing I felt was disappointment he wasn't Duane. No music only I could hear, no reducing me to a blubbering, slurring Swahili speaker, just disappointment. How that was even possible after 12 years of obsessive behavior made me question my mental health. Likely I should have been questioning it long before now. I slowed my jog to a walk, guessing that the edge of the lake was nearby and cursing myself for not bringing a flashlight. The short run was good, but not enough. It had expelled merely a modicum of the restless energy coursing through my system, making me feel fried, dried, and crispy. The problem was, my brain was tearing in two because my feelings for Duane were not consensual. Did I want to feel like a jealous, raging, seething she-witch when Duane had kissed my sexy bee cousin, who also just happened to be his ex-girlfriend and a smoking hot stripper? No. No, I did not. I didn't want to feel this way. I wanted to feel nothing. But I didn't feel nothing. I felt like he reached inside my chest, closed his fist around my heart, and was slowly squeezing it. I also felt like plucking the wings off Tina's costume. He'd kissed her. He'd kissed her just like he'd kissed me. Obviously, Duane made a habit of kissing the hell out of women. All women. That's probably why he was such a good kisser. Lots and lots of practice. This was the thought circling around and around my brain. The image of them, his mouth moving against hers, was branded in my vision, making my insides cold and eclipsing my ability to reason. My first instinct had been to march over to him and pull him apart by the nose. I'd seen my mother do this once to my cousins when they were fighting. She'd put her index finger in one nostril of each of their noses and tugged them apart. They'd never fought at our house again. All she had to do was wiggle her index fingers in the air. Tina would have known what it meant. I slowed my pace further, not sure if the sensation beneath my feet was cold, damp, or just cold. Three steps later, I realized it was cold, damp. I'd reached the edge of the lake. I turned, my hands out, and walked a few steps back to the last tree I'd passed and leaned against it, waiting for Duane to show up. I heard his footfalls. Not too far off now. His approach made my insides tense in a delicious and disquieting way. I balled my hands into fists and squeezed my eyes shut, giving myself a mental talking to. 
Despite the fact that it was near 40 degrees, I was not cold. In fact, my skin and my lungs and my belly felt like they were on fire. I guess anger, intense aggravation, and frenetic lust will do that to a person. I needed time. I needed distance. We just kissed less than five hours ago. I was being stupid. Feeling territorial about Dwayne Winston made no sense. I wasn't in Green Valley for the long haul. I was here to pay off my student loans, gain teaching experience, and then move on and out and see the world. One does not make life-altering decisions based on a single solitary makeout session, especially when I'd been kissing Dwayne thinking he was Bo. Maybe, I reasoned, Dwayne wasn't a great kisser. Maybe I'd built the whole thing up because I'd been working under a mistaken identity misconception. I told myself that these bizarre cravings would disappear just as quickly as they'd encroached upon my sanity. I told myself that tomorrow evening would be back to normal. Dwayne was irritating, challenging, Bo was nice. Even if my obsessive crush for Bo never resurfaced, my strange surge of feelings for Dwayne were likely fleeting. I had a plan, and my mama hadn't raised me to be stupid. End of story. Jess? I stiffened at the whispered sound of my name and was surprised to find him so close. Standing straighter, I turned, offering him my profile. I must have been so lost in my head I didn't hear his final approach. Hey, I whispered back, then frowned, glancing at him. Wait, why are we whispering? He didn't respond. Instead, he walked slowly forward and reduced the space between us. I could tell by his outline that he was shirtless. This revelation elicited a barely conceived moan because, damn it, I wanted to touch him again. I turned completely just as he stopped two feet from my position. He blurted, Just can we... Can I... I listened as he abruptly paused, then released a loud breath. He sounded frustrated. I couldn't see his face, so I had no idea what his intentions were or what he was thinking. I waited a beat for him to complete his thought. Five seconds turned into twenty, the quiet broken only by owls hooting in the distance, the wind through the trees, and the gentle lapping of the lake against the water's edge. I sensed that he had moved, and a moment later I felt his hand brush against mine. Already taut with nerves in my continuing internal boxing match, I flinched away from his touch, mostly because it was unexpected. At my involuntary reaction, he shifted a step back and pulled his hands through his hair. I don't know why I felt embarrassed, but I did. Maybe because I wanted to grab his hands, not recoil from it. But then how pathetic was I? He just kissed another girl, one he had history with and might be dating right in front of me no more than ten minutes ago. Less than five hours ago, he'd pretended to be his brother, and I'd held his penis in my hand. I'd stroked it for Hootenanny's sake. I'd given him a penis stroke under false pretenses. I should be running in the opposite direction. Instead, I was girl-stupid for a guy who thought I was a brat. He was right, of course. I was a brat sometimes, but I didn't want him to think I was a brat. I cleared my throat, saw the steadiness of the hemlock tree at my back, and said, Let's get this over with. I reached for the hem of my dress and pulled it over my head, folding it for no reason in particular and placing it at the roots of the tree. Next, I unclasped my bra, hesitated for just a split second, then dropped it on top of the dress. At this point, I stopped because I heard the sound of Duane undoing his zipper and my belly filled with lava. Hot, 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 molten lava. My body tensed and braced. I didn't realize it at first, but I was holding my breath. I strained my ears and listened as he pushed the fabric of his pants down to his ankles, then bent to remove them completely. He was now naked. Meanwhile, my thumbs were hooked in my panties, and now I was a frozen, chaotic river of lava. I wasn't sure if I was actually capable of movement while Duane was naked. It felt 
dangerous. He cleared his throat, and I saw by his outline that his hands were on his hips. You can leave your underwear on if you want. I'll admit I was staring at the region of his pelvic area before he spoke, hoping against hope that my untapped superpower of night vision would suddenly reveal itself. Alas, it was too dark and all I saw was a shadow. I tore my eyes away from his midsection and lifted them to his face. I could just make out the stars reflecting in his glittery eyes. I shook my head, expelling my breath, his offer spurring me into movement. Nope. You said skinny dipping, I don't want you crying foul later. I wouldn't. I made no response. Jessica, I wouldn't. He pressed. I don't believe you. I countered quietly, giving him my back as I pulled my underwear down my legs, leaving them on the rest of the pile. The hair on the back of my neck prickled. Though I couldn't see well in the dark, I suspected he could see just fine. The thought drove me suddenly forward toward the lake, my arms covering my breasts. I made it to my stomach before I stopped, trying to catch the breath driven out of me by the abrupt, icy submersion. The lake was colder than a witch's tit, and I was now freezing. My body gave a convulsive shake, and my brain screamed, What are you doing? Don't you know this lake is near freezing? You've lost your mind! All that molten lava of confusion and upheaval had been replaced with survival instinct and repulsion for the frigid water. I guess it's true what's said about cold showers. The sound of a splash and a string of curses signified Duane's foray into the water. I urged my feet to move, but they wouldn't. I was so cold. My teeth chattered and my shoulders shook. Then I felt him behind me, hovering. And when I say I felt him behind me, I mean his front was so close to my back I felt the heat of his skin. The water was a smidge warmer, though we weren't touching. Is this f far enough? I asked, annoyed with myself for being too much of a chicken to venture farther. Jessica, I had to tell you something. I bunched my shoulders, holding myself tighter his hot breath spilling over my neck paired with the autocratic tone of his voice made me shiver. Go right ahead. We got fifteen minutes to kill. I felt the water around my stomach swirl just as he closed the remaining inches between us, his chest hitting my upper back, his groin, my bottom. I stiffened, then tried to move away, but one arm wrapped around my shoulders, the other around my ribcage above the water, holding me in place. Just... This lake is so fucking cold, please just let me hold you. Well, this w was your idea. I know, and I don't regret it, but shut up for a minute so I can tell you something. I huffed. Don't tell me to shut up. Sorry, I'm sorry, you're right, I shouldn't have said that. It's just I'm so cold, I think I'm losing my mind. If my teeth weren't chattering so hard, I think I would have smiled. Fine, go ahead. Just... His fingers dug into my skin and his arms tightened on my body. Tina and I aren't together anymore. I ended things with her for good months ago. I nodded stiffly, not wanting to acknowledge even to myself that these words pleased me. He continued. Now, you and I, we've known each other since we were kids. I leaned into him, admitted inwardly that I was very glad he'd decided to hold me. When he spoke next, his words were rushed, and they sounded rehearsed. You've never liked me much, and I get why. I do, but we're not kids anymore. You've been gone for four years off to college, and now you're back, doing good work at the school. You're different. You've changed, and I'm different now, too, a business owner. I think it's time we called a truce and start over. I blinked into the darkness, trying to process his words and noticing suddenly... Now that we were motionless, how the stars were reflected back at the sky by the surface of the lake. If we held perfectly still, it was like being in the center of space. Stars above, stars below. I tilted my head backward unthinkingly, and it fell against Duane's shoulder, resting there as I gazed at the heavens. It took him about a half minute, but then he dipped his head and pressed his cheek against mine. I'm glad you agree. 
he whispered into the silence, apparently taking my small action as agreement. His lips moved against me as he spoke, his beard tickling the sensitive skin of my neck. Despite myself, I laughed slightly, because even though I was freezing, I could appreciate the bizarreness of the situation. Here I was, standing in a near-freezing lake with Dwayne Winston, oddly enjoying myself. The last time we'd been alone together in a body of water, it was the river behind his house over the summer of my fourteenth year. I depanted him and thrown his swimsuit in a tree. Now we were both depanted and freezing. Nothing about it made any sense. I needed it to make sense, so I asked him to explain to me. Dwayne, you remember when we were kids and we used to argue about everything? I mean, it didn't matter what it was. If I said the sky was blue, you would say it was purple. Sometimes the sky is purple. Right now it's indigo, almost black. You can't just make a unilateral statement that the sky is blue. See, this is what I'm talking about. I don't know if we can call a truce. All we know how to do is argue. You say that like it's a bad thing. Isn't it? Jessica, he whispered, arguing with you is one of my favorite things to do. My heart set off at a gallop and my breath caught in my throat. It wasn't his words so much as how he said them, all soft and sincere. I had to blink several times to keep from melting against him. How it was possible for me to melt while I was surrounded on three sides by near-freezing water made me again question my mental fitness. I cleared my throat and endeavored to stay focused. One of your favorite things to do? You mean like playing practical jokes on me? I think you're trying to rewrite the past. Again, I felt his small smile on my skin. You like playing jokes on me too, don't deny it. Without really meaning to, I found myself grinning and reminiscing. I liked your reaction to the jokes. I like that time I switched out the cake part of your strawberry shortcake with sponge and you took a bite. Or how about the time you tricked me into thinking you were eating flies? I giggled. That's right, I'd forgotten about that. Best use of raisins ever. And you were so grossed out, I thought you were going to throw up. We were quiet for a stretch, perhaps both lost to our memories of each other. It occurred to me that maybe he wasn't trying to rewrite the past— Maybe he was encouraging me to see our shared history in a new light. I was speaking my thoughts before I realized words had left my mouth. I loved how you'd lose your temper and threaten me with retribution. Exactly, and I always kept my promises. Yes, you did. We were quiet again. The sound of gently lapping water against the embankment, our only companion. But then his hand slid lower grazing my hips and providing just the right amount of sobriety. I shook my head and leaned a fraction of an inch forward, clearing my throat before speaking my mind. If we did start over, why do you even want to be friends with me? Didn't you call me a brat earlier? He nodded and his arm shifted, which made his hold feel more like a hug. Yeah, I called you a brat because you were acting like one. I grunted my irritation. I wasn't the one who lied, and I'm allowed to be angry. I don't know. I stopped, swallowed, and debated my next words before continuing. I don't know if I'm ready to forgive you. I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm not sorry. You're not sorry? My voice sounded loud and screechy to my ears, and I gritted my teeth. Despite being surrounded by frigid temperatures, my blood pressure spiked. Nope, not sorry we kissed. I laughed again, but this time it was because I was peeved. So you're telling me you're not sorry for making me think you were Bo? He shrugged, nuzzled my neck, warming me. My brain told me to stop him, but my body vetoed to hell with pride. I'm freezing. At length, he said, I never said I was Bo and you didn't ask. I opened my mouth and a small sound of incredulity escaped. 
you're unbelievable. He ignored my statement. And I don't want to be your friend. You don't want to be my friend? Then what are we talking about? We're talking about starting over. To what purpose? He hesitated for just a second. Then he said, Because we should see each other more often. I think we're suited. I wasn't surprised. I was flabbergasted. I was sure I must have heard him wrong. Then I realized my mouth was wide open. Then I realized a full minute had passed and I'd said nothing. I blinked at the stars in the sky. I'm sorry, I think I must misunderstand your meaning. So, what do you mean? Just what I said. We're suited for each other. You think we're suited? Yes. For what? Debating the color of the sky? Practical joke wars? Sure, if that's what you want to do or talk about. I'm going to take you out. Out? Out where? To nice restaurants, to movies, camping, for ice cream. On dates. On dates. We could go to Genie's, go dancing. You dance. Yes, I dance when it's good music and I'm in the mood. You would dance with me. Hell yes. I'd dance with you right now if you'd let me and I wouldn't freeze my balls off. I laughed again, shaking my head, because this entire conversation had taken a detour to unexpected bill. I couldn't comprehend the idea that Dwayne Winston thought we were suited for each other. In what universe would he think such things? And why did these things he said not sound crazy? And why did these things he said make my heart twirl with excitement? I don't... I can't... I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to think. The evening had been too eventful, and I hadn't a spare moment to digest what had occurred. Obviously, I needed time, and I needed distance. I wasn't staying in Green Valley, not more than a few years at most. Being suited with Dwayne Winston had the potential of being a huge, confounding complication. My eyes were on the prize, namely leaving town with no debt, no regrets, or reasons to stay. I cleared my throat and whispered. I think it's been 15 minutes. When I pulled away, he let me go. Cold water hit my lower back and thighs, replacing the warmth and protection of Duane's body. Hugging myself, I turned toward the forest and forced my stiff legs to move. This did not go well. I stumbled, slipped on a rock, and crashed sideways into the water. The wind was knocked out of me as I hit the lake, forced from my lungs by the shock of cold. Immediately, my legs straightened, pushing my head up and out. Just as I was gathering a greedy gulp of air, I felt Duane's hands reach around my side and lift me off my feet and out of the water, cradling my front to him and carrying me with an arm around my torso and under my legs. When I found my voice, I said through chattering teeth, "'Put me down.' He didn't respond, just continued trudging to the embankment. Dwayne Winston put me down. I felt breathless, confused, dizzy, pressed together like we were, and without the chilly water keeping me sober, my body was warming to his. Our skin was slippery, my breasts against his chiseled chest, his strong arms around me. I was too exhausted to be aroused, but it felt improper. Improper? Really? Now you're feeling improper? I traded lunacy for sense. I'll put you down, but I don't want you running off throwing my pants in a tree. You deserved that. I knew to which adolescent encounter he referred, and I couldn't help a very little smile at the memory. Yes, I did. He nodded, then hoisted me a few inches in the air like I was a sack of potatoes, readjusting his grip when I came down. We were out of the water now, some feet into the forest, and I was just about to complain again when he set me down, gently, but wrapped a big paw around my upper arm. My clothes are back there. I tugged half-heartedly away, my body too cold and tired to put up much of a fight. Goosebumps had broken out everywhere, and I was shaking violently. Dwayne bent to retrieve something. 
In one smooth motion, he released my arm, shook out what I realized was a large blanket, and tossed it over his shoulders. He then yanked me forward and wrapped me in the soft fabric and his embrace. You need to dry off, warm up first, he said, rubbing my bare back. It was then I realized how cold he was, that he too was shaking. Without consideration or caution, I snuggled closer, instinctively wanting to give and share warmth. I hugged him, rubbed the broad muscles of his back, and buried my face in his neck. Yes, we were naked, but first and foremost, we were near-frozen, heat-seeking bodies. Practicality won out over the lunacy of prudishness. The blanket must have been huge because it covered us from his neck and the tips of my ears and pooled around our feet, giving the impression of a cocoon. I was grateful he'd planned ahead. Whereas I'd just run off into the woods, relying on my anger and inexplicable jealousy to keep me warm. The memory of and the reason for my earlier ire reared its ugly head, a flash of an image. Dwayne's expert kisses shared with his ex— he was still clutching the blanket around us, holding me close, rubbing feeling into my arms and back. His hands were big and divine, strong and skillful. His heart beat against my cheek. His smooth skin, his granite stomach and shoulders under my fingertips made me feel greedy and muddled. He was muddling me, and I began to hear my brain soundtrack. This time it was touch me by the doors. Suddenly, I was warm. We both were, and it was much faster than I'd anticipated. As true physiological numbness receded, his hands on my body ignited something else. Soon, the shared heat changed from necessary for survival to something evocative and abruptly ripe with decadent tension. His hands slowed, and I realized belatedly that my breath had quickened. I wasn't aroused— it wasn't like before. I, I was caught. This time my heart was involved, not the crazy part of my brain. I glanced up at him, found him watching me. His eyes reflected the stars, and I was close enough to see they were on my lips. Jessica, he whispered, swallowed, his hands now motionless on my waist. I shook my head slightly. Really, the small movement was me telling myself to cease feeling. Duane was all around me, and he felt intoxicatingly good. I need to end this, whatever it was. So I blurted, I'm not kissing you. His eyes lifted to mine, his expression unreadable, but I felt him tense. Why not? I huffed. Because you lied to me. You pretended to be your brother. He cut me off, yanked his head back, and you won't bow. His tone was cold, unfathomably resentful. I gripped his biceps to keep him from moving away. No, no, that's not it. It's the lie. And my sexy bee cousin. Your sexy bee cousin? Yes. Tina Patterson, my dad's sister's daughter. Remember her? You kissed her. You kissed her right after you and I... I couldn't finish because I was confusing myself. I used to kiss boys all the time and it never meant anything. Yet I couldn't finish my sentence because I was beginning to think Dwayne's earlier kiss, even shrouded in a veil of deceit, had meant something to me. He licked his lips before he asked, as though reading my mind. Did our kiss mean something to you? Not... He shook his head and glanced around the darkness... Not when you thought I was my brother, but after when you found out it was me. I answered honestly, my words pouring out of me. I don't know. I honestly don't. And I don't get why you're pushing this so hard now. I feel like I don't know you at all. One minute you're the Dwayne Winston who throws rocks at my cat, kissing another girl, making me feel like I have heartburn, arguing about the color of the sky, and the next minute you're telling me we're suited for each other. I don't trust you. Jessica, we're standing in the forest naked. You trust me a little. I pushed against his chest slightly, shaking my head, feeling sleepy and exasperated and not 
ready to let him go. It was the strangest of combinations. Of course, I trust you that way. I know you'd never murder me or take advantage. Well, not take too much advantage. I mean, you did get a penis stroke out of me earlier and did fantastic things to my nipples. A little shiver raced through me at the memory. But now that I think about it, you stopped me before I could... Jessica, please stop talking. What? Why? Because you're making everything really hard. We stood motionless for a long moment as understanding dawned. His words held a delicious double meaning, and even in the inky darkness I could tell he was struggling. I wavered back and forth between wanting him to do something and hoping he wouldn't. Our breath mingled. His fingers dug into my hips. Then his eyes closed, and he set me away. He didn't let the blanket slip. Instead, he pulled it from his shoulders, stepping out of our little oven and wrapped it firmly around my shoulders, tucking it under my chin. I was mummified in our residual warmth. Dwayne left and quickly located his pants. I watched his outline pull them on, then moved to the tree where I discarded my clothes. He brought them back and held them out. Here, he said. Once I had the folded pile, I sensed him turn away. I stared at the back of his neck for a beat, just the dim outline visible to me, then slowly began the process of getting dressed. I rewound through the evening and our time together, all of my actions. I was too honest. He made me feel naive and mindless. I wasn't used to the disorientation brought on by excellent quality physical intimacy. Plus, he and I knew each other. We had history. Maybe my immature, fantasy-based feelings for Bo had dispelled so abruptly because I'd been given a taste of reality, of an actual adult liaison. The way Duane touched me felt like a brand. I felt the beginnings of an uncomfortable blush creep its way up my neck to my cheeks. When I was finished dressing, I cleared my throat and glanced at him. I could just make out the shape of his bare back. I'm all done. He twisted. His eyes moved over my body, still wrapped in a blanket, and he nodded. Okay, let's get back. Dwayne took a few steps, carrying him maybe ten feet, but then stopped. I hadn't yet moved, as I was more or less swimming in a sea of mental melancholy. He might be right. We might be suited, but so what? Nothing could ever come of it other than a few months— at best, years of being together. In my typical fashion of getting ahead of myself, my mind leapt to a time two years from now when I would be ready to leave Green Valley. What if Duane and I were extremely well-suited? What if we became serious? What if I couldn't leave him? I glanced up just in time to sense, then see him returning to where I stood. Instinctively, I took a step back, but he held me by the arms and halted my retreat. Tina, your cousin, he said, his voice thick with both hesitation and ferocity. Yes, Tina is my cousin. She dared me to kiss her. I pressed my lips together and swallowed, feeling again like I had heartburn. You did kiss her, and she's your ex-girlfriend. She was never my girl. I didn't want to argue semantics. Right. You've been with Tina since before I left for college, but she was never your girl. What about her? He hesitated for a beat, then said, You remember who I was with before you left for college? I responded through gritted teeth. Dwayne, what about Tina? He seemed to shake himself before starting again. Tina... He nodded, then took another step, bringing him firmly inside my personal space. When I kissed her earlier, it didn't mean anything. Well, it looked like something to me. It wasn't. Not with her. But with you, at the community center. I meant what I said. I've always wanted you. And I am sorry you didn't know it was me, because... His voice lost its fierce edge, but roughened. 
His next words emerged, sounding like an aching confession. I'd really like for there to be a next time. Chapter 5 Every dreamer knows that it is entirely possible to be homesick for a place you've never been, perhaps more homesick than for familiar ground. Judith Thurman Jessica I was distracted. Not even Rick James's Europe could hold my attention. It was all Duane's fault. His words and lips and hands and eyes and his penis's fault. He had a nice one. At least it had felt nice in comparison to the only other penis of my acquaintance. Thick and long and smooth and rock hard. I didn't get a peek at it backstage or when he dared me to go skinny dipping. However, I could recall with surprising clarity what it looked like when we were younger, when he'd been naked chasing me through the woods, or the time before that when a bunch of us went skinny dipping in the waterfalls near Burgess. He was circumcised. I'd noted it as a teenager because I'd just finished eighth grade health class, also known as sex education. I never expected to be fixating on Duane's circumcised penis, yet there I was, sitting at my desk at work, grading pop quizzes, trying to recall the glorious weight of him in my hand. How irritating, because now I was having a lusty hot flash. I groaned, letting my red pen drop as my face fell into my hands. How had I even arrived here in this purgatory? Yes, I was drooling over the memory of his sexual magnetism from afar, but it was more than that, so much more. And this more was beyond distressing. Duane's admission that our time backstage at the community center had been something he'd wanted for a long time and he wanted a repeat felt overwhelming. I'd known him forever. I knew all about him. Or I thought I did. His confession felt like finding out my cat, Sir Edmund Hillary, named after the first man to climb Mount Everest, could talk and wanted to give me a tongue bath. At best, Sir Hillary was indifferent to my existence. At worst, he may have been plotting my demise. He was an audacious calico psychopath, always pushing his litter box from its place beside the toilet in the bathroom, directly in front of the shower. But only when I was in the shower. Anyway, I decided I was cursed by the spirit of J.R.R. Tolkien for my ironic sexy Gandalf blasphemy. That's why I couldn't stop thinking about Dwayne Winston's body parts and his perplexing suggestion we were suited. Five days had passed since Halloween and my busy, bizarre night. Of course, I'd avoided him ever since. What would I say? What could I say? Hi, Duane. I don't know whether I like you or not, and you confuse the hell out of me, but I'd like to buy you a piece of pie so we can argue about the color of the sky. Let's schedule that. Or how about, Hello, Duane. I obviously lack self-respect and common sense because even though you kiss my cousin, your sexy stripper ex-girlfriend, right in front of me, I don't find that weird or creepy or disrespectful. Let's go out for ice cream so I can watch you lick yours. Making matters more muddled, Tina had cornered me Sunday afternoon at Daisy's Nut House. My daddy and I had gone out for breakfast after Sunday service. She'd been super friendly. She wanted to get together, hang out, do cousin stuff. We hadn't really spoken to each other since we were 13. I hadn't been cool enough to be her friend when we were in high school. When I went to college and she started working as an exotic dancer, we'd rarely interacted, and then only during family get-togethers. But now she wanted to reestablish a relationship, and I was having oddly whimsical and amorous thoughts about her ex-boyfriend. So, are you ready to tell me what happened when you disappeared with one of the Winston twins? I didn't look up at Claire's question, even though she startled me a little. I could tell by the direction of her voice that she was standing in the doorway of my classroom. How long have you been standing there? Long enough to watch you stare into space for several minutes before plunking your head into your hands and making those lovely moaning sounds. I can't decide what the sounds mean, but they sure are interesting. I shook my head and peered at her through my fingers. A circumcised penis. I was gratified when she choked on air. A what? A circumcised penis. 
That's what happened. And some hot looks, hotter kisses, truth or dare, then maybe we're suited. I don't know, skinny dipping and rubbing for warmth and stop, stop right there. She held her hands up. We can't have this conversation at work. Why not? Is it against policy? Not precisely, but drinking while at work is a big no-no. I'm not drinking, but I'd like to be a little tipsy if we're going to talk about the Winston brothers and whether or not they're circumcised. I let my hands drop and gave her a little smile. You went to school with Billy and Cletus, sandwiched between the two, right? Billy a grade above, Cletus a grade behind? She nodded and said quietly, Yes, but I know Jethro best. He and Ben were best friends. I could feel my smile turn sad before I could stop it and regretted the unintentional pity that must have shone in my eyes. Claire looked away and cleared her throat, looking equal parts resigned and impatient. Ben used to joke he didn't have the patience to learn the Winston boys' names, so he called all of Jethro's brothers Jethro Jr. Claire addressed this to her feet and paired it with a small laugh. I smirked at Ben's pragmatism as I studied my friend, how her face had fallen even though she tried to smile. Claire had no family to speak of. Actually, by that I mean her daddy was the club president of the local motorcycle gang, the Iron Wraiths. As well, her mama was his old lady. But together or separate, those two were the definition of dysfunctional. As far as I knew, Claire had no contact with her parents or siblings. I assumed she was still living in Green Valley because she wanted to stay near her husband's family. She accompanied them to church every Sunday, and her house was within a block of theirs. She'd been a local beauty growing up. She even had those awesome high cheekbones that magazines talk about, with the little hollow above the jaw. But she had sad eyes. Add to her stunning good looks the most laid-back, kind, generous, and all-around talented person I'd ever met. For example, she had the most beautiful singing voice and should have been in Nashville singing or in New York or Milan living the life of a muse or a model or a concert pianist. Meanwhile, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I'd been in the Thespians my sophomore through senior year of high school and was therefore labeled as one of those drama kids. For my school, that basically meant weird and funny. Plus, I was universally acknowledged as the county math whiz, having led our school's team to math bowl victory three times. I didn't marry my childhood sweetheart because I didn't have one, though I kissed lots of boys because I liked kissing boys. Kissing boys also had the delightful byproduct of aggravating my father and overprotective brother. Essentially, I'd left home for college an antsy, angsty, but well-mannered good girl. So, a typical teenager. But upon my return to Green Valley High School, just a short four years later, same school with the same social order and subsets, I'd now become a new stereotype. I was the hot math teacher. I'd never thought of myself as the hot anything, don't get me wrong, I had a perfectly fine self-image, but I guess in comparison to Mr. Tranton, the previous and now recently retired math teacher, the fact that I had boobs and was under 85 meant I might as well have been Charlize Theron. Well, come on, Claire finally said. Come home with me and you can tell me all about it. I just need wine first. I can't. I glanced at the wall clock at the front of the room. I had to wait for my brother to pick me up. My beast of a truck is still parked at the community center with catastrophic engine failure. He's driving me home. Claire's eyes darted back to mine, and she studied my face with a question in her expression. Uh, no, it's not. What? The beast? Your truck? It's not at the community center. It was towed. Panic seized my chest and my hands balled into fists. No, it couldn't. Could it? I talked to Mr. McClure about keeping the truck at the center until I could afford the towing and repair costs. He'd assured me it was no trouble. Calm down, she lifted her hands and walked farther into the classroom. I can't afford impound costs. Why would they tow it? Your father-in-law said it was fine. It's not at the impound, Jess. 
I saw it this morning in the parking lot of the Winston Brothers Auto Shop. It's not at the impound. Calm yourself. I flinched at this news, blinked furiously. What? Why would they do that? Claire chuckled, and I didn't miss the amusement or the wicked glint in her eye when she responded, Probably has something to do with that circumcised penis. I was going to get tipsy. I needed at least two glasses of wine. But first, I was going to find out what in the name of tarnation was going on. I called my brother and left a message telling him I would be out with Claire. I did not tell him Claire was driving me over to the Winston Brothers Auto Shop. Jackson and the Winston boys did not get along, mostly because everyone knew Jethro Winston, the oldest, used to steal cars, and neither my daddy nor my brother had ever been able to make the charges stick. It also had something to do with their sister, Ashley Winston, and Jackson acting like a fool about her in high school. I remembered Ashley growing up, mostly because she was so darn pretty and sweet, just the nicest girl in the history of forever. I think most people expected her to be catty because she was so pretty, but she was the opposite. I pulled at my bottom lip with my thumb and index finger, my narrowed eyes seeing nothing of the colorful foliage umbrellas framing the mountain road. Fall color was out in full force and would be for the next few weeks, assuming we didn't get any unseasonal snow. I'd be lying if I said the Smoky Mountain landscape wasn't a big draw and factor in my decision to return home after college. The other two main contributing factors were my family and the student loan deferment plan for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics teachers who taught in underserved areas. Living at home helped me save money and pay off my student loans. And I was the only high school calculus teacher outside Knoxville for 50 minutes in every direction. My predecessor, Mr. Trenton, had taught math as high as Algebra II. This was the first year high-achieving math students in our area and the surrounding valleys weren't bussed off to Knoxville for trigonometry and calculus. But ever since I was a little girl, I dreamt of seeing the world, experiencing it, and not just as a tourist. I wanted to be a world traveler. I'd craved freedom and adventure. Being home now felt like preparing for launch— I'd been savoring the time with my family, storing memories, because if all my painstaking planning came to fruition, I wouldn't be seeing them much in the coming years. We're here. Claire's pronouncement pulled me from my thoughts. I stared out the windshield as she placed her car into park and turned off the ignition, glaring at the open garage of the auto shop. I saw a pair of boots sticking out from underneath the car, and my heart kept asking my head, What if that's Duane? My head kept putting my heart off, saying, We'll cross that circumcised penis when we get to it. Are you going to get out of the car? I shook my head. I hadn't decided yet. Claire sighed. The sooner you get this sorted, the sooner we can go back to my place and drink wine. Well, that settles it, I said distractedly, still not moving. She paused, likely waiting for me to do something. I could feel her eyes on me. Jess, what are you stalling for? What are you afraid of? Just as the words left her mouth, two red-headed and bearded male specimens of mighty fineness sauntered out of the garage. The boots under the car were a decoy, likely Cletus. My breath caught and I held it, my eyes widening behind my sunglasses. The twins were both dressed in sky-blue overalls and black work boots, with a white undershirt peeking out of the collar. Claire had been wrong last Friday. Their hair was approximately the same length, and so were their beards. Even the grease stains on their hands and clothes seemed identical. I forgave myself a little for my mix-up on Halloween. They looked exactly the same, and I hadn't seen either of them for going on three years— Regardless, now I knew immediately which of the two was Duane. If I'd given myself a moment at the community center, I would have been able to figure it out. Duane carried himself differently than Bo. He always had. How he stood, where he looked, and the line of his mouth was in stark contrast to his sociable brother. Bo swaggered even as he stood still, glanced around at his surroundings, his brow untroubled, and his smile was easy. 
Dwayne held himself straight and aloof, his eyes never leaving his brother's, as though Dwayne only ever focused on one thing at a time. His slight squint made him appear deep in thought as Bo chatted cheerfully. Dwayne's smile was almost reluctant. I'd noticed the reluctant smile on Friday, too. His smiles were reserved, secretive, like he rationed them. I glanced between the two brothers, and I didn't have to wait long to figure out whether the mystical bow voodoo spell had truly been broken. It had. I looked at Bo now and felt a placid, warm fondness. He really was such a nice guy. Another sign of Bo's diminished power. I looked at Duane and felt powerfully and irrationally irritated, flustered, and insecure. These weren't unusual reactions to his proximity. However, each swelled inside me with a sudden surprising fierceness and were paired with something new, abrupt and intense longing. Duane hadn't made any attempt at contact over the last five days. Of course, neither had I. After his admission at the lake, we'd walked back to the bonfire in strained silence, my hand in his. Releasing me as we approached, he disappeared after depositing me with Cletus, telling his brother to take me home. He'd walked out of the ring of light provided by the fire, and that was the last time I'd seen him. If you didn't count all of the odd dreams I'd been having about him since. Which one, Jess? I started... Claire's question interrupting my aggrieved reflections and responded without pulling my gaze from the twins. I'm going to sound like a loony bird when I admit this, but Dwayne. Well, I'll be. I knew she was fighting a smile. I know, right? I'm a crazy person. Obviously, I can't trust myself, what with my flighty impulses. Next week, I'll probably be batshit crazy for Cletus. Well, Cletus is adorable. You could do a lot worse. Yes, I could. Maybe I'll just decide to be infatuated with Cletus. I tried to make light of my feelings, but I knew it wasn't that easy. My emotions for Duane were wrapped in years of knowing him. Animosity, begrudging respect, and five days of agitated pining— our history was complicated enough, multifarious enough for me to be wary that the feelings could be genuine and lasting. Claire chuckled, placed her hand over one of mine and squeezed. Must be rough. Liking the look of him so much will obviously dislike him, so... I don't dislike him. I shook my head, searching for the right words to explain what I felt for Dwayne. I mean, I did... I did kind of dislike him when we were growing up. He was never nice to me like Bo was. But he talked to me more than Bo did. A lot more. He seemed to go out of his way to argue with me all the time. And now? Now? I shrugged. Now? I don't know him anymore. Not really. I mean, assuming nothing's changed since I left for college, I know his favorite ice cream flavor is Rocky Road. I know. I could tell she was hiding a grim 
more vehemence this time. No, no, no. Jess, Dwayne still races cars down at the canyon, and he's still undefeated, mostly because he takes crazy chances and fear doesn't seem to register. Over the summer, he killed a rattlesnake at the community center. So? So he walked right over to it, stepped on its head, then reached for it with his bare hands. Then he's stupid. No, Lord knows he's no fool. He knew what he was doing. He just doesn't seem to have a healthy fear of deadly snakes or of getting killed at the drag races either. Bo is the safer choice. I can understand how you might have been drawn to Dwayne all along, but no, no, just no. They're identical. Looking. They're identical looking. They're not identical people. Yeah, but by your own admission, you actually knew Dwayne growing up. You knew about him. You spent time with him. Yet your crush was on Bo? He was the nice one. I grumbled. Claire laughed, rolling her eyes. Maybe. Or maybe he was the safe one. I turned away from her and back to the brothers in question. They were leaning into the hood of a vintage car, their red heads obscured. However, I had an excellent view of their backsides. I huffed with indignation, not liking Claire's rewriting of my history, mostly because it made sense. Listen, Dr. Phil, I don't know why we're even talking about this yet. Neither of us have had enough wine for this conversation. Although I could sit in this car and ogle Dwayne Winston's fine ass all day from afar, I need to figure out why my truck is here and what's to be done about it. I agree. Good. I nodded, reaching for the door handle, finally having enough incentive impetus to eject myself from my seat. I, too, could sit here all day and ogle Dwayne Winston's fine ass from afar. Claire said this just as my feet hit the ground. Before I could administer my reproachful glare, she was out of the car with her door shut, striding purposefully toward the twins. Hey, boys! She called immediately, drawing their attention and giving me no time to prepare my game face. My steps faltered as they looked over their shoulders. Dwayne's glare catching on Claire first, then flickering to me. His expression didn't change. Not precisely. Rather, I had all of his focus. Once his eyes latched on to me, they didn't waver. Apprehension warred with anticipation and both caused a lump to form in my throat. Try as I might, I was unable to hold Dwayne's gaze, and I looked away, preferring instead Bo's lazy, easy smile as he grinned at both Claire and me with straightforward, undemanding affability. Hello, beautiful ladies, Bo drawled, pulling a rag from his pocket and wiping his hands. Hey, Bo, Dwayne. Claire stopped about four feet from where they loitered in front of the car. I saw her dip her head toward Dwayne as I came to stand next to her. Hi, Claire, Dwayne said, and just the sound of his voice made me feel like someone had lit a match in my belly, the warmth spreading to my fingertips in a shock. My eyes flickered to his, then away. He was still looking at me, all intense and focused, but otherwise expressionless. He was unsettling. I was unsettled. Hey, guys. I said lamely, like a lame person, to the patch on Dwayne's coveralls that told me his name was Dwayne. Determined, I pushed past my uneasiness and cleared my throat, opting to speak to Bo instead. The irony was not lost on me. I couldn't help but notice that my truck is parked out front. Bo's eyes were the color of the summer sky as he regarded me, his mouth pulled to the side in a plainly amused smirk. Yep. I couldn't help but return the smile as his were still infectious. Last I knew, the truck was still parked at the community center with catastrophic engine troubles. Not troubles, sweetheart. Bo's tone was gentle and replete with sympathy. You still got catastrophic engine failure. You need a new engine. I stuffed my hands in the back pockets of my khaki shirt and shifted on my feet. I know that, but... I don't have the money right now to get a new engine. We figured as much. Dwayne cut in, stepping forward so he was shoulder to shoulder with his brother and directly in front of me. We'd like to buy the truck from you, if you're willing. 
I waited two seconds before shifting my gaze to Duane's, needing time to gather my faculties. When I met his stare, I was glad I'd taken the time to prepare. If Beau's eyes were the tranquil summer sky, then Duane's were a tempest at sea, a stormy aquamarine. Duane, I said unnecessarily and a little dreamily on an exhaled breath. His attention drifted over my face and his non-expression softened. Hi, Jessica. My heart gave a little leap. Even though his features were completely absent a smile, I felt one, a blasted, shy, wistful one, tug at my lips. Hi, Duane. Then silence. I wasn't aware of it at first because I'd tumbled into an aquamarine tempest. My mind was fully occupied with memories of Halloween night, of his hands on me, his mouth on mine, the hot, velvet touch of his tongue. Preoccupation with my memories became something else. Fixation on a wish, I think, and my chest felt heavy and full. I only became aware of the quiet when it was broken. Claire, can I take a look under your hood? I think uh, one of your engine mounts might be loose. I heard a rattling sound when you pulled up, Bo said, as he took Claire's elbow in hand and walked her toward her truck, not waiting for a response. If she made one, I swear I didn't hear it. The soundtrack in my brain had started again. This time, Roberta Flax, the first time I ever saw your face, was playing. The music swelling, carrying my sense out to sea. Duane and I were now basically alone, giving each other hot looks. Chapter 6 Don't let your luggage define your travels. Each life unravels differently. Shane Coison Duane I was going to kiss her, but first I was going to strangle her. Duane? She said my name again in that breathless way, making my neck itch and my throat tighten. Jessica was looking at me expectantly, her big amber eyes on mine like I was the center of her world. I liked it too much. It was also irritating because I didn't know what it meant, what she was thinking. She hadn't said a damn word to me on our walk back from the lake. She hadn't called me. We hadn't spoken since Friday. Five days. Five days without touching or tasting her. I was going to kiss her while I strangled her. Yeah, I said the edge of my irritation clear. I wasn't trying to hide it. There was no need. One way or the other, we were coming to an agreement that involved something definite, not definitely maybes. Better she knew I wasn't planning on rolling over unless it involved her beneath me. Jessica blinked at me, likely because of my tone, and I watched her shake herself a little like I'd startled her. Um, uh, so, the truck. She cleared her throat. Her eyes sliding to the side and away from me. What about the truck? You towed it. Yeah, I did. I allowed myself a moment to look at her body. She was wearing a thin pink shirt with buttons down the front with a white lacy tank top under. It was tucked into a tan skirt that ended at her knees. She was also wearing brown high-heeled boots, the kind that don't make sense. Boots are for working, for walking through wet mud for keeping feet from getting shredded by broken glass and falling machine parts. Boots with spiked heels were just as practical as sandals with steel toes. Still not looking at me, she asked. So, you want to buy it? Her voice was different, higher pitched. That's what I just said. Again, my irritation was clear. Her eyes cut to mine, throwing me splinters of frustration. Well, there's no need to be rude, Duane. I'm sorry. Was I being rude? I couldn't help myself. I took a full step forward, forcing her to lift her chin to keep eye contact. Should I have called? Yes, she ground out. You can't just tow other people's cars without asking. Excuse me, Princess, but Mike McClure called me and asked if I minded moving the truck here. I figured he was calling on your behalf. No, he wasn't calling on my behalf. If I wanted to call you, I would have just called you. I felt those words in my stomach, just under my ribs, a quick slice. I'm sure I winced because her expression changed, but before she could explain away her meaning, I cut her off. Fine, I get you, loud and clear. 
Dwayne. I lifted my hands to keep her from talking. She was so lovely, even her voice was pretty. But suddenly I couldn't wait for her to leave and put me out of this misery of being with her when she wasn't interested in being mine. We want to buy the truck, and I'm willing to offer you a fair amount. Would you just hold on a sec? Jessica took my hand between hers, her grip surprisingly strong, her skin against mine sending a shock up my arm. I ignored it and ground my teeth. You can use the money for a new car, something smaller that gets better mileage. Paying no heed, Jessica took a half step forward, catching me unawares. One second she was glaring at me. The next she was lifting to her tiptoes and brushing her lips against mine. That was it. I was done for. I was surprised, so it took me a second to respond, but I was also motivated, so it only took me a second to respond. I gripped her arm, staying any possible escape, and moved to deepen the kiss. Surprising me again, she moaned and opened her mouth, her hot little tongue searching for mine. I growled, and I didn't regret it. I'd been thinking about her sweet curves, her silky skin, perfect fucking breast, and round, luscious ass for five days. Five days of an unending, tortured hard-on. I was impressed the only thing I did was growl because what I wanted to do was throw her over my shoulder, take her to the room above the office, handcuff her to a chair, strip her naked, and listen to her moan, cry, and scream my name. It didn't have to be my name. Also acceptable. Oh, God. And yes, please. And don't stop. And harder, faster, more. You get the picture. I doubted her sheriff father or deputy brother would be pleased with that course of action, but I can't say I cared much about their feelings on the subject. Jessica's hands released mine, slipped around my back, kneading and searching, pressing her soft body to mine, pulling against the hold I had on her arm. I relinquished her and grabbed a handful of her ass, snaking my other arm around her waist. I needed leverage. We needed privacy. I needed to put her against something so I could do more of what I wanted to do. To that end, I lifted her slightly off her feet and carried her into the shop, past Cletus's boots, past the Toyota he was working on, the rusty master lock toolbox on wheels, and into the supply room off the garage. For her part, she never stopped kissing me. Tilting her head to one side and pressing herself to my chest, Jessica licked and bit my ear, giving me little sighs and enthusiastic moans. She also wrapped her arm around my neck and further accommodated our relocation by bending her legs, making it easier to traverse the obstacle course of the shop. Once inside the supply room, I slammed the door and immediately turned and pressed her against it. Her hands came to the zipper at the front of my coveralls at my throat and fumbled for the tab. Now, in that moment shut in the little room, surrounded by shelves of greasy cylinders, busted pistons, and an array of crankshafts, I admit I thought about hiking up her skirt, sliding into her sweet body, and taking her hard and fast against the door. I thought about it. I did. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to marry this girl. That was the truth of it. And maybe one day, after we'd been married for a while, I'd pull her in here and bend her over the table at the back, and we'd have a real good time. Maybe we'd do it every Wednesday, when she was my wife. But not now. Not yet. Not when I'm needing to be taken seriously and respected. That's why when I spotted the grease stain on the upper arm of her pretty top, most certainly left by my hand, I felt my engine cool, and a good dose of sobriety chilled my veins. I grabbed her hands before they could work the zipper of my coveralls down to my hips and brought them over her head. It was hard to think with her hands on me. It was also hard to think with her mouth doing its voodoo. So I bent my head to her neck and bit a spot on her shoulder. I took the opportunity to breathe her in and found this was a mistake if I wanted to clear my head. After placing one more kiss against her jaw, I lifted my head for some cooler air while trying to ignore her rapid pants of excitement and the beat of her heart against my ribs. We were pressed together, knees to chest. I still held her wrist, but I lowered them to her sides. My eyes were closed. I needed more than a minute, so I took it and reminded myself that being short-sighted can ruin the long game. Jess was the first to speak. You're really good at that. At what? I lifted my eyelids, careful to keep my stare fixed to the sober and dark stain on her shirt. I frowned when I saw there was more than one stain, 
She had streaks of grease everywhere I touched her. Kissing, touching me, making me hot. My mouth curved slightly at her honesty as I backed up half a step to see how dirty I'd made her. Jess had always been so honest, to a fault, really. She was honest when it would have served her better to be guarded. She was so honest that I worried for her. But for now, I was grateful for this peculiarity in character. Knowing I had myself under control and recognizing I was going to need to replace her entire outfit, I finally met her eyes and released her wrists. Thanks, Jess. But her attention was on my mouth, and her hand slipped back to my torso, gripping my jumpsuit like she didn't want me to go too far. We should do it again. I didn't try to hide my smile. Rather, I leaned one palm on the door behind her and placed the other possessively on her hip. Her skirt was already ruined, and I liked the feel of her body beneath my hand. Sounds good to me. I kissed her nose. The bridge of it had always been covered with brown freckles, but they'd faded since she was a teenager. Standing close like we were, I could see them. When? Her nails dug into my sides through my coveralls, her tone urgent. What are you doing tonight? I smiled at her pushiness. Want to go see a movie? Jessica blinked, her eyebrows pulling together in a small frown. Movie? No, not unless it's an empty movie theater. Jess. I shook my head and searched her face to see if she was joking. She wasn't. My neck itched again and the beginnings of a cold uncertainty trickled down my back. Jess, there are lots of good movies playing now. Let me take you out to dinner. She stared at me. I stared back, waiting. I could see her mind working, but what she was thinking I had no idea. Her fingers relaxed, letting me go, but the rest of her body soon stiffened. Then I saw a flash of pensiveness in her brown eyes. I didn't like how she'd grown distant while I still held her, but I held on anyway. I can't tonight. She swallowed. Her eyes moved between mine, then away. She looked increasingly agitated. Claire and I have plans. We're going to drink wine. My eyes narrowed and my blood pressure steadily increased the longer we stood there. Me touching her, but Jessica was already far away. Jess? Yes? Her voice was weak. I cupped her jaw and cheeks, forcing her to look at me and leaving smudges on her skin. In case you haven't caught on yet, I'd like to take you out. She lifted her hands, covered one of mine, and held on to the wrist of the other. I was happy to see some of the rising panic recede as I continued. I want to go to a place that serves food, where neither of us have to do the cleanup or the dishes, and talk to you. What do you want to talk about? I don't care. I honestly don't. As long as I'm talking to you. This won me a quick smile, and it went a long way toward easing my cold doubt. She bit her lip, chewed on it, her big brown eyes even bigger than normal. Then she nodded, and I finally breathed, releasing her. Good. She nodded again, her eyes lighting up, her pretty mouth slanting with a roundabout smile. Good, she repeated, then pressed her lips to mine for a fast kiss. This is good. I nodded too, her sudden happiness like aloe to a sunburn, and then proclaimed the understatement of the century. I'm glad. Okay, then. It's a date. Dwayne Winston and Jessica James are going on a date. I laughed because she was too adorable, and her words solidified something I'd wanted for years. Finally, the angry hard-on in my boxers didn't feel so pointless. Yes, that's what's happening. I rubbed my nose along hers, gave her another soft kiss. The only question is when and where. Oh... Her gaze turned hazy, unfocused, and drifted over my shoulder. I could pack a picnic for Saturday afternoon. I thought about that, about not seeing her for the rest of this week. I decided it was probably too soon to say I'd miss her if I didn't see her between now and Saturday. Saturday's good. Let's do Saturday, I said. And I'll pack the picnic. I'd been thinking about this for a long time, and I decided years ago that if I ever got the chance... I'd take her out proper, pay for dinner, even if it was a picnic. You don't have to do that. I want to. Fine. Let me bring drinks at least. Her hand sought mine, entwined her fingers, and squeezed. The simple movement and connection was dizzying, and it caught me off guard. 
I opened my mouth to respond, but found I'd forgotten what she'd just said. Her eyes flickered between mine, her small smile still in place. Obviously, she mistook my speechlessness because she soothed. Don't worry, I know you prefer Guinness to Budweiser. Then she dropped her voice to a sweet whisper and leaned a bit closer. Your secret is safe with me. I grinned at Jessica James' backside as she walked away because she had a big old brown grease stain on the left side of her skirt where I'd palmed her ass. Damn, Dwayne, you got big hands. Cletus sauntered up next to me, wiping his own hand on a rag. My grin became a frown and I shot my brother a look. Don't be looking at Jess's ass. I'm not looking at her ass. I remind you, sir, she is my calculus teacher. Cletus lifted his chin towards Jessica's departing form. I'm looking at the palm print on her ass. I returned my eyes to my girl just as she twisted at the waist and sent me a shy grin over her shoulder, setting my heart off on a goose chase. Jessica hadn't cared two nickels when I'd pointed out the hand marks to her just before she'd left. When I suggested I'd give her one of my clean shirts to cover the evidence of our groping, she looked at me like I was crazy. Instead, she surprised me by laughing at the incriminating smudges. She also laughed about the fact that the rest of her clothes were ruined by my dirty paw prints, everything but her impractical boots, and waved away my insistence to replace the outfit. She seemed to be delighted by her rumpled state, and her eyes burned brighter after she saw how disheveled she was. Hold up your hand. In my peripheral vision, I saw Cletus lift his palm toward me, suspending it between us. I kept my eyes on Jessica, the sexy sway of her hips, how her long blonde hair was blown over her shoulder as she walked to Claire's car. She held her head high, and the big smile she gave me from across the parking lot as she opened the passenger door to Claire McClure's Chevy almost knocked me off my feet. This girl was flaunting the fact that we just made out in the supply room. I will not hold up my hand, I said absentmindedly. Come on, I want to see who has the bigger hands. Shut up, Cletus, I'm not going to hold your hand. I thought about calling to her before she shut the door. I also thought about doing a victory lap around the garage. Instead, I settled for watching Jess and Claire pull out of the lot, make a left, and disappear down the road. I don't want to hold your hand. I want to compare our anthropic units. Quit it. Bo stopped in front of us, his expression blank. Cletus, you finished with that Toyota yet? We need to leave soon if we're going to make it to Nashville today. Cletus's attention moved between me and Bo. He let his hand drop. Listen, I think it'd be best if we just cleared the air now before things progress any further with Dwayne and catastrophic engine failure. Who? Miss James. I felt my eyes narrow on my older brother. I hoped he wasn't about to say what I figured he was going to say. I was in no mood, not now, not ever, to discuss Jessica's infatuation with Bo. An infatuation, I noted, that appeared to be over as of last Friday's bonfire. No need. Bo shook his head rather emphatically. No air to clear. Come on now. No use ignoring things. Cletus was using his grandfather voice as he placed his greasy fingers on Bo's shoulder. I think we'd all feel better if everything were out in the open. I know I would. My stare shifted to my twin and I felt a spike of alarm. What's he talking about, Bo? I don't rightly know, Dwayne. Cletus put his other hand on my shoulder and nodded solemnly. The truth is, Dwayne, and I know this might be hard to hear. But the fact of the matter is, and you know I think catastrophic engine failure is a sufficient teacher of calculus, but that doesn't negate the face that... Just spit it out, Cletus. Fine. We all hate Jessica's brother, Jackson James. I blinked at Cletus, then Bo and I blinked at each other. As much as two people could read each other's minds, Bo and I could. He and I shared a brief, silent conversation where the following was shared. Both of us. Of course we hate jackass James. Me. Didn't he give you a speeding ticket over the summer? Bo. Yes. Me. Pig fucker. Bo. By the way, I've always known you had a thing for Jess. 
Since we were kids, I would never do anything to get in the way of you two being together. Or something along these lines. Me. Thanks. I appreciate that. Bo. But you owe me one because she's hot, funny, and sweet. Or something like this. Me. Fine, I owe you one. Bo. Good. Glad we have that settled. Stop it. Cletus snapped his fingers in front of her faces. I hate it when you two mind meld through your eyeballs. Bo sighed. Cletus, I think we're all clear on the fact that no one in our family has any patience for Jackson James. After that shit he pulled with our sister when they were teenagers. And all the times he arrested Jethro for stealing cars. I chimed in. In all fairness, though, Jethro likely did steal those cars. Cletus added offhandedly. Jethro was never convicted, I added unnecessarily, wanting to defend my oldest brother. Exactly. Bo sounded exasperated. Plus, Jackson still brings it up all the time. I saw Jackson at the wooden plank two weeks ago, and he made some dumbass remark about Jennifer Sylvester's new BMW being stolen, and whether Jethro had been investigated as a suspect. And that's just him being a douchebag because Jethro's been straight-laced for over four years and Jackson won't let it go. Plus, Jethro hates bananas, I added unnecessarily. Everyone knew Jennifer Sylvester had a banana cake in her front seat when the car was stolen. I could feel myself getting worked up and knew Bo was feeling similarly irritated. Neither Bo nor I could drive on the parkway without getting pulled over by Jackson James. It didn't matter if we were speeding or not. I always figured this was because Jackson still felt teenage torment about my sister's lack of interest in his dumb ass during high school. But recently, I was beginning to think Jessica's older brother was just a bored little shit of a man, drunk on small town power. Right, well, we all agree. Cletus rested his hands on his hips, nodding thoughtfully. But no amount of wishing is going to change the fact that Jackson James is unsavory, and that catastrophic... I mean, Miss James is his sister. So what's your point? I crossed my arms over my chest and frowned at my brother. He always had a point. Usually it was a good one, but it just took forever for him to get there. My point is that you need to be cautious of Jackson, because once he finds out your intentions towards his sister, things will not be pretty. I have no ill intentions. I know you don't, but... But nothing. The truth is, that girl is it for me. I know, Dwayne. Cletus's expression flattened, like he was losing patience. She's your 1968 Plymouth Barracuda. Everyone knows that. Well, everyone that matters. All I'm saying is, don't expect him to give you his blessing. I don't need his blessing. Cletus is right. Bo's tone turned uncharacteristically serious. His wide eyes drilled into mine. Jackson ain't gonna like this one bit, and he's a right sneaky bastard. Just watch your back. He'll make problems for you if he can, Cletus continued. So just let me know if you need help making problems for him in return. This statement surprised me, and by the looks of it, this statement surprised Bo as well. Bo mimicked my stance, crossing his arms over his chest and leveling Cletus with a narrowed stare. Just what is that supposed to mean? Just what I said. Cletus shrugged, looking and sounding innocent. That's one of the things about Cletus. He's real good at looking innocent. Sometimes I forgot Cletus could spot a sneak so well because he was the king of sneaks. I was just glad he was on my side this time. Now, Bo, enough of this dilly-dallying. Cletus stole Bo's rag from his front pocket and wiped his hands, glancing around the shop as though he was making sure everything was in order. Are we going to Nashville today, or what? Chapter 7 In a day when you don't come across any problems, you can be sure that you are traveling in a wrong path. Swami Vivekananda Duane, I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings because I was distracted by pleasant thoughts. And I suppose that's why I didn't hear the motorcycles park around the back of the shop or know I had company until they were already inside the garage. I heard an obnoxious laugh, loud and long, alerting me to the unexpected arrival. I lifted my eyes just in time to see Repo, one of my deadbeat father's biker brothers, 
pick up Cletus's favorite socket wrench and toss it back to the toolbox with a loud clang. Just behind Repo was Dirty Dave, the owner of the obnoxious laugh, another member of the Iron Wraiths, and a real jackass. He was called Dirty Dave because he was dirty, and he stank. I sighed my aggravation and set down the carburetor I was fixing. As enjoyable as Jessica's visit had been that afternoon, I knew without a doubt these callers were going to inspire my ire. Dirty Dave was just a douchebag lackey. But Repo was a man of importance with the iron rates. I'd known him since I was little. He even had dinner at my mama's table on occasion and gave each of us boys a bowie knife for our tenth birthday. Once upon a time, I looked up to this man. But as an adult, I considered him a con man and pariah. Hello, son, Repo said, lifting his chin in my general direction as his eyes scanned the shop. I reached to the side to switch off the Bluetooth speaker from my iPhone. Repo had a real raspy voice. I could barely make out what he was saying half the time in a quiet room. The shop was suddenly filled with the quiet sounds of a Tennessee night and the unwelcome sounds of motorcycle boots scuffing on cement. Repo, Dirty Dave, what do y'all want? I didn't bother to wipe my hands because I had no plans to shake theirs. Now, is that any way to speak to your Uncle Repo? He smiled, his salt and pepper beard framing bright white teeth. This one reminded me of my daddy, all the charm of a snake in the grass. I glanced at the wall clock behind him. It was almost 11.30 p.m. I'd lost track of time. You are my uncle, old man, I answered flatly. No. This man was most assuredly not any family relation of mine. Though my daddy considered the members of the Iron Wraiths to be his brothers, these men were less than nothing to me, and I wanted them to know it. Ah, you're not, Bo. Dirty Dave chirped from the spot next to Repo. He seemed to be looking at me with new eyes. We were hoping for Bo. He's so much nicer than you. Plus, he knows when to show respect. Be that as it may, I'm trying to finish up here. So if you two will get to the point, I set my hands on my hips, lifting my eyebrows, hoping they'd get my message to hurry it up. Now hold on a minute, Repo rasped, lifting his hands up as though I needed to calm down. We're here with a business proposition, one I'm real sure you're going to want to hear. Not interested. In an effort to show the alluded to respect, I decided not to say, not interested, asshole. Now go fuck yourself. See? Very respectful. Just listen up. No, you can leave the way you came in. I flicked my hand toward the back of the shop, then turned back to the carburetor and the well-lit table where it rested. You can't say no to money, boy. Dirty Dave lifted his voice. I'll say no to anything involving the iron rates. I shrugged, showing the boredom I felt. I knew they were used to seeing fear and inspiring all. The Iron Wraiths weren't a joke. The club president was a criminal mastermind and a crazy fucker to boot. These weren't good guys. But I'd never been able to muster up even the slightest trepidation where dumbasses were concerned. Even dangerous ones. Why's that? This came from Repo. In my peripheral vision, I saw the pair halt their slow progress into the shop, standing close and to my right. Because everything you do is illegal. So? You race cars at the canyon, right? Rumor is you're one crazy motherfucker in the pit and make buckets of cash doing it. That sure as hell ain't legal. Racing for easy money's one thing. Getting involved with your kind is another. I'm not my worthless father, and I'm not interested in making money off other people's misery. How about making money to keep your family safe? A chill spread down my spine, making me stand straighter. I turned to question and glare on Repo first, then Dave. I found Dirty Dave giving me a dirty smile. I faced him. Is that a threat? No, said Repo. Hell yeah, said Dave. Repo cut in before I could order them out again. Now hold on. We're not planning to hurt anybody. But you want to keep your family out of jail? Then you need to hear us out. Keep my family out of jail? What are you talking about? Dirty Dave nodded once as he said, Jethro, 
Jethro, I scowled at this. No, no, I ain't buying it. He washed his hands of y'all years ago. Yeah, but before he did, he stole us a lot of cars. Dirty Dave said this with measured glee. So what? I spat. You're going to turn him in now? If you do that, then you're admitting to your own guilt. Boy, didn't I say listen? Repo's words were clipped in an unusual display of exasperation. I threw my hands up and leaned my hip against the table, figuring that letting the man say his piece was the only way I was going to get them to leave. Sure. Fine. Speak. So your mama, Repo paused. My eyes must have betrayed my spike in anger at the mention of my mother because he held his hands up again like I needed to calm down. I'm not down talking your mama, boy. I'm just saying, your mama died a month ago. Rest her soul. I swallowed a lump of emotion, unable to stop thinking about my mama's last days, how the cancer had taken her from us. I missed her, her kindness, her sweetness. I rallied against a sudden flash of nostalgia. Knowing now, with these morons, was not the time to dwell on these thoughts. This is not news to me, Repo. Yeah, but we've been keeping our distance out of respect, giving you and yours time to grieve. We gave you a month. She was a good woman. I'm not interested in your thoughts on my mama. These words arrived through clenched teeth. He needed to wrap this shit up. Okay now, but here's the thing. Brick and mortar, the two Iron Wraith brothers your sister got arrested after your mama's funeral. I cut him off. They got themselves arrested because they were trying to kidnap Ashley and Billy from the funeral. And brick and mortar were only there trying to help your daddy because your mama tricked him out of his money. Dirty Dave pointed his thick index finger at me. I wanted to snip it off with number 24 gauge wire cutters. That's not how it happened. That money doesn't belong to Daryl Winston. It never did. Daryl is your daddy, boy. He and your mama had seven babies together. Were married for years. That's a long time, a lot of history, and a lot of kids for a man to wait for his fair share. Then your sister's boyfriend, that park ranger. Drew Runos isn't Ashley's boyfriend, and he isn't a park ranger. He's a game warden. Whatever. Drew Runo swoops in and sweet-talks your mama into signing over all her money. Now, how can you blame your daddy for trying to get what's his? I had to grip my teeth to keep from hollering. Dirty Dave's version of events was far from reality. The truth was, my daddy, Daryl Winston, was a no-good, rotten son of a bitch. In addition to riding with the Iron Wraiths, he was a con man and an abuser. He married mama for her money when she was 16 because she came from lots of money. He'd also beaten her and cheated on her habitually. And every time she tried to divorce him, he'd use us kids to keep her from following through. Finally, she outsmarted Daryl by filing for a separation from him, then selling all her belongings, her family's house and all possessions therein, to a family friend named Drew Runyus for $1,000, thereby removing it from my father's reach. She also signed over all her bank accounts and our trust funds. That left Daryl spitting angry, but there was nothing he could do because Mama was already dead by the time he found out. So he showed up at my mother's funeral with two of his Iron Wraith's brothers, Brick and Mortar, and tried to kidnap Ashley and Billy. He'd likely been desperate and couldn't think of another way to get his hands on Mama's money. Luckily, he and his biker friends were stopped but not before Ashley shot one of them in the leg. All three, Daryl, Brick, and Mortar, were presently awaiting trial and would hopefully serve serious prison time. What does Brick and Mortar trying to kidnap my family have to do with anything? Why are you here? Cause, Dwayne, Brick and Mortar were our mechanics. Now they're gone. We got nobody to take over their work. That's where you boys and this shop come in. Dirty Dave gestured to the inside of the garage. So what? You want me to fix your box? No, son. You might not like it, but your daddy is one of us. That means your family, too, and you owe us. Brick and mortar were our mechanics. I blinked at Repo, knowing I was missing the point, 
and waited for him to fill in the blanks. When he saw I didn't understand his meaning, he huffed, then spelled it out. They ran the chop shop. They dismantled the cars. They took our stolen goods and made them transportable. You and your brother Bo, the two of you are going to take over running our chop shop. Dirty Dave connected the dots for me even as the picture repo painted clarified in my head. A sound of repulsion and disbelief escaped my mouth before I could stop it, followed by, Oh, hell no. Hell yes, boy. Hell no. And stop calling me boy. I was three seconds away from punching Dirty Dave in the jaw. Repo must have seen my patience snap because he stepped forward, between Dave and me, again holding his hands up. Now, you need to listen to reason. We got evidence against your brother Jethro that'll put him away for life. Not for years. For life. Bullshit. No, no bullshit. Dirty Dave denied from behind Repo. This shit is real. My attention was split between them. I was looking for any sign of subterfuge. Like I said before, you incriminate him for those stolen cars, then you're incriminating yourself. No, not with this. Repo reached into his leather jacket and pulled out a thumb drive. He offered it to me. I glared at him instead of taking it. What is it? Jethro got out of the wraiths three years ago, and the video on this drive will show you how he bought his freedom. In the scheme of things, it was a small price, but this small price carries a hefty federal sentence. If the police were to find out what he did. I narrowed my eyes, feeling equal parts suspicion and panic. What did he do? Repo pushed the thumb drive against my chest, forcing me to take it. Watch this. Then you'll know. Then when you see things our way, you call us. The flash drive landed in the palm of my hand and I glared at Repo, wanting to crush it under my boot and despising the fact that I couldn't. The older man scratched his goatee as he studied me the solemnity of his expression increasing until, with grave severity, he added in a low voice, Don't be stupid. There's no reason to include your brother Billy in this. He don't need to know. I didn't say so, but I agreed with Repo on this one. Billy's answer would be to go directly to the police, all the while waving his middle finger at the iron rates. Billy loved Jethro, but he hated the rates more. In fact, I was pretty sure Billy hated the rates more than he loved anything, except maybe our mama. But with her death, Billy's regard for mama was a moot point. But, Dirty Dave stepped around his biker brother and waved his fat finger at my chest. You got two weeks, Dwayne. Two weeks to decide, or else we send an anonymous tip to Sheriff James and you can visit Jethro on the weekends at the Federal Correctional Institution in Memphis. I did nothing with the thumb drive at first except hide it. When I got home that night, I researched thumb drives and whether they could be used to install spyware or cause mischief on my personal computer. Everything I read made me nervous. I thought about calling Jethro or Drew, but decided against it. Jethro was now a law-abiding park ranger for the National Forest, and Drew was his boss. They were currently together on a trek in the mountains some 200 miles away and only reachable via satellite phone. I was also feeling paranoid and didn't think it prudent to have a telephone conversation about my brother's previous illegal activities. Discussing matters with Jethro would have to wait until he got back from the mountains. In the end, I decided to talk to Bo, and only Bo, about everything when he and Cletus arrived home on Saturday. There was no reason to include my other brothers in the discussion. Worst case scenario... If it turned out that the only way to keep Jethro out of prison was conscription of the Winston Brothers Auto Shop, then Bo and I would have to do it alone. I didn't want anyone else getting caught up in this tangle. The fewer people who knew about this business with the iron rates, the better. Billy, Cletus, and Roscoe could plead true ignorance if Bo and I were caught. Before I went to sleep, I further decided to drive into Knoxville in search of a pawn shop as soon as dawn broke the next morning. On my way into town, I grabbed a donut and caffeine fix from Daisy's Nuthouse, an early riser cafe for locals of Green Valley. 
The warm, jelly-filled pastry paired with her drip coffee did a bit to settle my uncommon nerves. Though I still felt cautious, so I decided not to search for a pawn shop using my iPhone or computer, deciding it was better to leave no computer trail of my activities. Just in case. Thankfully, I found a shop that looked promising called Discount Larry's Gun and Pawn. Because these places always have surveillance cameras, I parked across the street and pulled on my brother Roscoe's Yankees baseball hat, something I wouldn't be caught dead wearing, and nondescript blue hoodie. I kept my head down as I entered and did a fast sweep of the merchandise, finding what I was searching for almost immediately. I paid in cash and left the shop quickly, having shared no words with the proprietor. I jogged back to my car. I then took the long road back to Green Valley, but stopped by Mr. Tanner's junkyard on my way. It was there, down the tree-lined dirt road to one side of the junkyard, that I opened the old laptop I'd just purchased from the pawn shop and watched the video. What I saw made me want to murder my oldest brother, and when Bo got home on Saturday, he could help me figure out how to hide Jethro's body. Chapter 8. Men read maps better than women because only men can understand the concept of an inch equating a hundred miles. Roseanne Barr. Jessica. Nobody ever expects a Mustang convertible. Especially not Dwayne Winston leaning against a dark blue Mustang convertible with a white top and racing stripe. The convertible had a white top and racing stripe, not Dwayne. He was wearing faded, boot-cut blue jeans that fit nice and snug over his hips in a charcoal-colored thermal. As I approached, after I recovered from my surprise, I noticed the shirt's color made his eyes appear almost gray. He wasn't smiling, but I did have all his focus, and Duane's focus made me self-conscious and unsteady. Therefore, my smile was dreamy and reflexive. "'What are you doing here?' I gestured to the high school parking lot. It was Thursday afternoon, and I'd just received a text message from my brother Jackson. He was on his way to pick me up, so I was coming outside to wait. Instead of answering my question, Duane leaned forward, placed his hand on my hip, and gave me a soft kiss that stole my breath away and made every inch of my skin hot. Then he leaned away, his hand falling back to his side, and answered simply, "'I'm bringing you your car.' My mouth fell open for obvious reasons, and I blinked at him. My... my car? Yes. He gave me just the faintest shadow of a grin. Your car. You can keep it if you want, or you can give it back when you find something better. What are you talking about? My attention moved past him to the gorgeous vintage automobile. He'd backed it into a parking space at the front of the school. I didn't know much about cars, but this car was beautiful. While we negotiate a price for your truck, you need a car for getting around back and forth to work. Take this one for as long as you like. I struggled to form both words and thought. Finally, I managed, Dwayne, first of all, whose car is this? I mean, who does it belong to? Won't they miss it? No, it's one of mine. I hardly use it. He reached for my hand and placed the keys in my palm. One of yours? Yeah. I couldn't stop blinking at him. I can't take your car. He shrugged. Sure you can. It's a classic. I mean, I'm no expert on cars, but this isn't a recent model. This must be over 30 years old. About 50 years, actually. It's a 1966 Mustang 289. Now I was blinking and shaking my head, and my thoughts were a breathy whisper when they slipped out. You're crazy. He finally smiled, though it was swift and gone almost as quickly as it had appeared. I made a mental note that Dwayne Winston liked it when I called him crazy. Take it for a test drive. His hands were on me again, steering me to the driver's side door. He opened it and gently pushed me inside, taking the bag from my shoulder and setting it on the floor behind my seat. Meanwhile, I was greedily devouring the inside of the classic car with my eyes, unthinkingly slipping the keys into the ignition, pressing the clutch and turning it on. It was 
majestic. Something about the car almost felt alive, even sitting idle, humming beneath my fingers, anxious for the road. Dwayne climbed into the passenger seat and I glanced at him, finding his attention affixed to my face and a warmth there that made my heart race. What? I narrowed eyes at him. Are you going to touch it or drive it? Honestly, I haven't made up my mind. I stroked the steering wheel. It was covered in soft white leather. In fact, all the upholstery was white leather. The inside smelled like leather and Duane's cologne. I don't think... I mean, I don't know if I can. Don't you know how to drive a stick? Yes, but that's not what I meant. I let go of the steering wheel and faced him, clasping my hands together on my lap so I wouldn't reach for it again. I mean, I don't understand what's going on. I should get a rental car in Knoxville until I find a replacement for the truck, something newer. No, you shouldn't. He wasn't smiling now. In fact, he looked frustrated. It'd be a waste of money. This Mustang is a classic, yes, and sure, it has over 600,000 miles on it, but I've rebuilt the engine and most of the other parts are new. It has new tires, brakes, suspension. It runs as good as a new car. I wouldn't let you drive anything unsafe. You're not going to have any problems with it, and it handles the mountain roads real well. I shook my head and reached for his hand, seeing he'd mistaken my meaning. That's not what I meant. I trust that this car handles like it looks, beautifully. Then what's the problem? The problem is this car is a classic. It's far too valuable for me to use as a loner. Then it's not a loner. I'm giving it to you. It's yours. My mouth fell open again and a small sound of confused protest escaped. Dwayne. Jess. You can't be serious. I am serious. He looked serious. Why are you doing this? Because you need a car and I have four. He shrugged. You could sell it. I'm sure it's worth a bundle. I can't sell it because I just gave it to you. I gritted my teeth before hollering. You can't give me a car. He lifted his voice to match the volume of mine. I just did. I stared at him, the stubborn set of his square jaw, the way his left eyebrow was slightly raised in challenge. He was so stubborn and irritating and cute and sweet and thoughtful and presumptuous. I'm not taking it, I said, finally shaking my head. It wouldn't be right. Quit being so stubborn. Being rational isn't being stubborn. You can't just go around giving people cars. You're not Oprah. Dwayne's lips flattened in a way that made me think he was trying not to laugh because his eyes were shining. What gave me away? Was it the red hair? Without thinking and in a way reminiscent of our bickering childhood, I responded flatly. No, it was the feel of your circumcised penis last week. Dwayne lost his battle with laughter and threw his head back, eliciting an unbidden smile from me. I exhaled a chuckle and rolled my eyes, feeling remarkably pleased I'd made him laugh. I think I was even blushing, which was strange. Making Dwayne Winston laugh flushed me with pleasure, or maybe it was the intoxicating side of how much he seemed to enjoy it, enjoy being with me. Still grinning widely, which in and of itself looked foreign and therefore dazzling on his face, he said, But before, last week, you still had doubts as to my identity? Well, I've never seen you and Oprah in the same room together. Plus, you both have your favorite things lists. I was making reference to his statement last Friday that arguing with me was one of his favorite things. Do you have a favorite things list? Wouldn't you like to know... My neck was abruptly hot. He lifted an eyebrow. You've been thinking on my trouser department, haven't you? Flustered, I shook my head. Getting back to the topic at hand. Is it? At hand? I wasn't aware. Dwayne Winston! I tried to sound shocked and foreboding, but my involuntary answering smile was ruining the effect. I'm attempting to be serious. Stop trying to muddle me. 
If I were trying to muddle you, then you'd know it. I tisked, then huffed. When did you get so sassy? When did you get so serious? I'm not. I just can't accept this car. Can't or won't? Same thing. Nope, not the same. He plucked my hand from where it rested on my lap and held it in both of his, sending a warm, delightful sensation of loveliness up my arm and around my brain. Jessica James, you're going to have to get used to me wanting to take care of you and fix your troubles. I'm not a damsel. I don't need rescuing. I know. You're capable and stubborn, and I like that about you a whole lot. But maybe you could pretend to be a little less capable from time to time? To what end? So I get to feel good about rescuing you? I smirked at this logic. His request actually reminded me of my mom and dad. Sometimes my mother would pretend she couldn't open a jar in the kitchen or that she needed help lifting something heavy. When I'd called her on it, she'd said, Nothing wrong with making your man feel needed. If your Aunt Louisa had done the same, then she wouldn't be so lonely in that big house of hers. Let me help, he implored. Use this car. I don't want to take advantage. All trace of his earlier smile had vanished, and he appeared to be completely sincere. You won't be. It'll settle my mind, knowing you're driving something I built. I sighed, considering him and his request. So... It would be a loner? Sure. He shrugged noncommittally, if that's what you want to call it. And what do you expect in return? Pardon me? He asked, looking confused, tinged with horrified. I don't want anything. I narrowed my eyes further and teased. Tell me, Oprah, what are you after? Penis strokes? More frigid skinny dipping? What? Catching on, Dwayne's eyes lowered to my mouth. His held just a hint of a smile as he responded. I'll take a rain check on the stroking and skinny dipping, but how about a kiss? I'd already wanted to kiss him, so I did. I grabbed a fistful of his gray thermal and tugged, bringing his lips to mine suddenly, and I kissed him. Bam! Infuriatingly, he didn't seem at all surprised. He quickly took control, one hand fisting in my hair, angling my head as he liked, the other digging into my hip as he pulled me closer. He licked my lips and surged forward, giving the impression of requesting entrance without actually waiting for my consent. It didn't matter. My pleasure moan gave me away, a sound of surrender. His hot mouth moved over mine, the sweep of his tongue sending a thrill straight down my spine, making me feel frenzied and cherished all at once. But then the whoop-whoop of a police car scared the bejesus out of me, and I jumped away. Duane released me as I spun toward the sound, my heart in my throat. What the hell is going on here? I found my brother Jackson barking and glaring at us. He pulled his cruiser parallel to the Mustang and rolled down his window. I sighed, closing my eyes and letting my head fall back on the headrest. I swallowed before I reprimanded my brother. Jackson, you scared me half to death. I repeat, what the hell is going on here? Jackson didn't sound repentant. He sounded irate. I shook my head without opening my eyes. Couldn't help the laugh that bubbled up from my chest. What does it look like? Jessica, he warned, his voice rough. I opened my eyes and grinned at my older brother, pressing the clutch and shifting the beautiful car into first gear. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't thoroughly enjoying his shocked expression. My brother's eyes narrowed in warning. Don't you dare. Have you lost your mind? No, I haven't lost my mind. I've found a car. And look, it has a Duane in it. Now, if you'll excuse me, my Duane and I really must be going. And with that, I pulled out of the space Duane had backed into and turned the car in the opposite direction of home. He was right. The car handled beautifully. This car was powerful and light, 
My beast truck was powerful but heavy. It was actually fun to drive. I'd never driven a car like it before, one with personality and eager responsiveness, like the automobile was a willing and eager participant in its motion. Driving felt like more than just traveling from one place to the next. It felt like an experience. An odd thought entered my head thirty minutes after pressing on the gas pedal. I was falling in love with this car. Duane was quiet while I drove. I didn't know where I was taking us, and his silence felt introspective. Every once in a while I felt his eyes on me, but he kept his hands to himself. I made no attempt at conversation, partially because the windows were down and the rush of wind meant I would have to shout to be heard. The other reason was because the silence felt comfortable. We crossed the mountain, taking the parkway to Cade's Cove, and I pulled into the picnic area, searching for a parking spot farthest from the rest of the cars, trucks, and campers. At the tip of the loop, I spotted an isolated spot where no tourists appeared to be nearby. I pulled in and cut the ignition, but left the keys where they were. Without the hum of the engine and the roar of the wind, the near soundlessness that surrounded us felt deafening and heavy, like the end of a ballad. But soon the whisper of flowing water, rustling of leaves, and song of birds met my ears and alleviated the hefty stillness that had settled between us. I glanced at Duane from the corner of my eye and found him watching me, not staring, just watching, like he was waiting to see what I would do next. His expression was inscrutable and therefore unsettling. I cleared my throat, clasping my hands on my lap, and gave him a small smile. It likely looked guilty, because I felt a little guilty for the way I'd used Duane to irritate my brother. "'Are you still doing that?' he asked, shifting in his seat until his back half rested against the passenger side door, like he needed distance to see me clearly. "'Still doing what?' I tucked my hair, now likely a crazy mess, behind my ears and met his eyes directly." Still trying to upset the men in your family? I huffed a laugh and answered honestly. Yes, I guess I am. It's just too much fun getting Jackson all riled up. I understand the desire to annoy your brother because he is annoying, but your daddy, he's a good man, steady, hard worker. You should cut him a break. I know. I am and I do. Mostly. But in all fairness, if my father had found us kissing in the parking lot, he probably wouldn't have turned on his siren and pitched a fit. He'd have invited you over for dinner. And I would have accepted. Dwayne nodded at his own assertion and added, I want to do this right. Something about the way he said the words filled me with both pleasure and dread. On Wednesday, after leaving the Winston Brothers auto shop with the benefit of wine, Claire's analysis, and hindsight, I started to be of the mind that Dwayne Winston wanted to court me. Courting meant a long-term relationship with marriage and a white picket fence being the end goal. Marriage and white picket fences terrified me because they sounded like the end of freedom, the end of my dreams. Suddenly, the inside of the car felt stifling. I tore my eyes from his, opened my door and exited the car, walking to the hood and pausing, not sure where I was going. I listened as he also exited, his door closing, the sound of his boots crossing to me, crunching over gravel and crispy leaves. Duane fit his hand in mine and I looked up at him. He frowned at me, not an upset frown, just a thoughtful one, and tugged on our connected fingers. Let's go for a walk. I acquiesced and allowed him to lead me over the log barriers and boulders, down the path to a stream. Something about his presence and touch, the way he moved with confidence, the broadness of his shoulders and his inherent strength calmed me. I found myself settling into the moment, deciding not to think too far into the future. Tall trees rose high overhead on either side of the embankment, and crystal-clear water displayed colorful, rounded stones paving the shallow riverbed. I smiled at the sight of several children farther down picking their way across the rocks. 
Their chatter and laughter carried to us, even though they were at least fifty yards away. Dwayne let go of my fingers and crouched down. I watched as he untied the laces of his boots, and I understood his plan at once. I turned, found a boulder, and perched at the edge of it, slipping off my comfortable work shoes and math-themed socks and setting them on the rock. The water would be cold, but that was no matter. I wasn't planning on falling in this time. When we both had our shoes off, we held hands again and waded into the stream. It was only calf deep at the lowest spot, but it was relatively wide. In the spring, it would be deeper. The water would move faster, and I wouldn't be able to wear my sensible black pencil skirt without it getting wet. You okay? Dwayne asked, his thoughtful frown still in place. I nodded and bent down to retrieve a blue rock from beneath the water and straightened. I held the stone up to the sun and studied the veins of white running through it. Then, apropos of nothing, I said, When I was ten, my daddy bought me a three-year subscription to National Geographic magazine for my birthday. I glanced at Duane, found his thoughtful frown had been replaced by a thoughtful, almost smile. Is that so? I nodded, releasing his hand so I could walk a bit farther into the stream. Yes. According to him, I'd wanted the magazine since I was four and a half. I first saw it at the library and asked Santa Claus for it every year. And it wasn't the kid version either. I didn't want the kid version. I wanted the real thing. Why did you want it so much? I loved seeing pictures and reading stories about the world, especially places I didn't know existed. I spent hours getting lost in the pages, imagining myself scuba diving in Fiji, hand harvesting saffron in Greece, or working with Jane Goodall's chimpanzees in Africa. I glanced at him over my shoulder, wanting to see his reaction. Chimpanzees. His smile grew. Yes, in Africa. The brightness in Duane's eyes grew radiant and felt almost overwhelming. He appeared to be pleased, more than pleased. Yet I was surprised he didn't look at all amused, just interested and happy. Had I ever seen that look directed at me before? Do you still have a subscription? I shook my head. No. My mama was cleaning my room about a year later, and she saw the magazine had what she considered dirty pictures, specifically naked photographs of men and women, members of isolated tribes in South America. Oh, no. Now he looked amused in addition to interested and happy. What happened? At first she was livid and made me go talk to Reverend Seymour about what I'd seen. Dwayne grimaced like he was bracing for the worst. I waved his concern away as I turned to face him. It was fine. He'd listened patiently while I'd burned scarlet red, describing all the various body parts I'd been exposed to and my feelings on the subject of modesty. He laughed, really a chuckle, and stuffed his hands in his pockets. I liked the way his laugh sounded against the symphony of whispering water, rustling leaves, and birdsong. I also liked the way he looked, ankle deep in a pure mountain stream, the blue sky and tall trees behind him. Again, I found myself settling into the moment, taking a mental snapshot of his happy and handsome face. An inadvertent sigh escaped my lips because I was happy, too. Dwayne Winston was a good listener. I think I was staring, lost in the vision of him and a daydream, because when he spoke next, the sound startled me a bit. Did Reverend Seymour take the magazines? I shook my head, mostly to clear it, and glanced at my toes. My feet were cold, but the cold felt good. No. Eventually, he handed the magazine back to my mother and told her there wasn't anything wrong with me learning about the world— but there might be if I formed my own conclusions without guidance. He suggested she use the magazines as an opportunity to discuss the world with me, that we should go through the articles together and she should answer any questions I might have. Well, that's good, right? I met his gaze again, gave him a rueful half-smile. When the magazines came after that, my mama kept them locked in her closet until she could find time to go through them with me. 
For the first few months, we'd sit down together after dinner, and she'd explain things from her perspective, even when I didn't ask. I liked the one-on-one time with Mama, but it wasn't the same, you know? The magazines lost their magic. I couldn't become lost in pages and pictures and possible adventures when each article was dissected for faults and ungodliness. Dwayne's thoughtful frown was back. I had all his focus, and holding his weighty gaze was difficult. He was searching mine, and something about his persistent interest made me feel vulnerable. Regardless, I held his stare with a half-smile and eventually shrugged, blowing out a deep breath. I think my mama sensed my growing dissatisfaction, because after a time the magazines just piled up in her closet. They didn't renew the subscription. I'm sorry. He sounded sorry. My half-smile grew, and I shook my head. Don't be. It didn't matter much, because by then I was making monthly trips to the library and reading National Geographic, along with Condé Nast Traveler and Wanderlust magazines. The library was also where I discovered internet travel blogs and first became a fan of Intrepid Inger. I remember seeing you there. Always the first Saturday of the month. That's right. That's when the magazines came in. I studied him for a beat, more than a little surprised by the excellence of his memory. At length, I decided to add, I remember seeing you there, too. One time you switched out my travel magazines with urology journals. Do you remember that? He nodded. One of his eyebrows lifted while he bit his lip as though trying to keep from laughing. I remember. I squinted at him, unable to help my smile. You were always there, helping your mama shelve books. You and Roscoe, sometimes Cletus. His eyes lost some of their focus, like he was recalling the memory. A foggy kind of smile passed behind his features, but it was abruptly replaced with a dark melancholy, like the memory caused him pain. As well, he looked tired, bone-deep tired, almost like he hadn't slept in days. I don't know how I'd missed it before. Impulsively, I crossed back to him and wrapped my arms around his waist, laying my cheek on his shoulder and squeezing. I'm so sorry about your mama, Duane. She was a sweet lady and everyone misses her. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. He returned my embrace without hesitation, bringing me flush against him. I snuggled closer to his warmth, wanting to share some of my own, hoping I was giving him comfort. Thank you, Jessica. He whispered into my hair, squeezing me and repeating, Thank you. We stood like that for a while. I don't precisely know how long, but it was long enough for my mind to wander and for my thoughts to turn forward to the future to how nice it would be to have access to Duane Hugs daily, how dichotomously comfortable and thrilling it was to touch him, be touched by him, and how perfectly we fit together. Chapter 9 All my days I have longed equally to travel the right road and to take my own errant path. Sigrid Unset Kristen Lavenstadter Jessica I guess you're getting ready for your date. I turned and found my brother standing in the doorway to my room. He said the word date, like I might say jury duty. Yes, I kept my response terse, because I was determined to avoid another lecture from Jackson. Lord knows how he found out about my plans with Duane for the night— Regardless, he'd seen fit to throw a fit Thursday evening when I got home. I was still driving the Mustang, so that might have contributed to his temper tantrum. I was not in the mood then, and I certainly wasn't in the mood now. I was on my own merry-go-round of confusion because I missed Dwayne, and I was missing more than his face, eyes, hands, and circumcised penis. In the end, I'd accepted the car as a loner, but did not accept it as a gift, Secretly, I planned on working something out with Bo and Cletus, taking less for the truck as a way to compensate Duane for the use of his car. I'd have to be careful, though. If he found out about my scheming to repay him, then he'd be pissed. 
Yet for some reason the idea of quarreling with Duane made me giddy. I wondered if we would disagree about the color of the sky on our date, fall into our old habit of debating and making mountains out of molehills. The possibility was exciting. I was a little strange. Just a little. Only a little. Since seeing him on Thursday, I thought about calling him approximately one million times just to hear the sound of his voice. Maybe talk him into going for a drive so we could argue minutia and kiss. I'd always been a big fan of kissing when done right. I loved the accompanying hot pooling and heaviness in my belly, the anticipation of more, the whole experience of eyes closed, mouth open, and hot hands. Basically, up until one week ago, my experience with the opposite sex had told me that kissing was as good as it got. All of my previous encounters went sharply downhill after the kissing. As well as kissing, planning elaborate trips I would one day take, and looking for ways to freak out my brother had been my top three pastimes when younger. Since maturing while away from home, planning trips were still at the top of the list, but kissing boys had drifted down to the low 50s. This was because 99% of boys weren't what I would consider good kissers. In high school, everything was new and exciting. But in college, the newness had worn off and kissing had grown tiresome. This was because I was doing the kissing instead of being kissed. And I wondered if that was the fundamental problem with kissing boys instead of men. Boys usually do something not at all enjoyable that makes kissing a chore. They're either just a pair of passive lips, saliva slobberers, or tongue thrusters. Whereas men actually kiss. You gonna wear that? Jackson lifted his chin, indicating my outfit. I glanced down at myself, seeing nothing wrong with my blue jeans, hiking boots, and long-sleeved purple Henley with the top four buttons undone. I returned Jackson's scowl with a frown. And what's wrong with what I'm wearing? Your shirt is half undone, your boobs are busting out, and those jeans are awfully tight. I crossed my arms under my chest and glared at my brother. Are you calling me fat? No, I'm saying that outfit doesn't leave much to the imagination. I don't want that Winston boy getting ideas. Meanwhile, I wanted Dwayne to get lots of ideas. Because I really liked him. And Dwayne Winston kissed like a man. And not just any man. He kissed like he enjoyed kissing me just as much as I enjoyed kissing him. And his skills made me think kissing was just the beginning of far better things to come. It was truly the whole experience of eyes closed, mouth open, and hot hands. Hands I had every confidence in. And just like that, kissing Dwayne Winston jumped to the top of my favorite pastimes, my favorites list. Actually, debating, talking to, holding hands with, and hugging Dwayne Winston were also now on my list. I tossed my long, loose braid over my shoulder. His name, Jackson, is Dwayne. I know his name. Jackson scratched his scruffy beard, sounding ornery. Then use it. I was feeling ornery, too. Ornery and frustrated. I just lived through Thursday night and Friday without any contact between us. Even now, almost time for our date, and especially in retrospect, something about the way Duane had said, I want to do this right, made me think he'd be withholding kisses tonight. Or he was planning on giving me only proper kisses and only at the end of the night, and done with respect and mindful of who my parents were. Lord help me, but if he denied me kisses in some misguided effort to be respectful, I was going to have to tie him to a tree and take them by force. Jackson mimicked my stance, moving his hands to his hips and gave me his brother knows best glare. Now you look here. Those Winston boys are a bunch of criminals and deadbeats, just like their daddy. Dwayne is known around these parts for driving like a bat out of hell and taking dangerous chances on those mountain roads. I'm not happy about you driving his car, and I'm not happy about you spending time in the same zip code as Dwayne Winston, let alone going on a date with the sleazeball.
You made your feelings perfectly clear on Thursday. And like I told you, who I see is none of your ever-loving beeswax. You'll see. Jackson lifted his voice, looking both exasperated and angry. And then, after he impregnates and abandons you, all those silly dreams of traveling the world will be over. Your life will be over. I'm sure I was looking at Jackson like he was made of compost worms and boogers. The boy was crazy. I don't even know where to start with you and your lunacy. I know how birth control works, big brother. And, spoiler alert, putting a wrapper on the banana is 99% effective. There will be no bananas. There will be entire tropical rainforests of bananas and coconuts, I gestured to my breasts, and hopefully bananas rubbing against coconuts. He sucked in a shocked breath. If he had on a string of pearls, I felt certain he would have clutched them. Finally, he managed to choke out. Jessica James, you are being crude and unladylike. My brother's shock and outrage made him ridiculous. I knew he kept company with several girls in town, and I was sure his banana had been wrapped on more than one occasion. Therefore, I growled. What century are you living in? Going to college put wrong ideas in your head, Jess. I live in the real world and see guys like Dwayne take advantage of nice girls like you every day. And you'd think you'll be able to just travel around the world like some homeless nomad. You wouldn't last one week in the real world. I hated it when my family brought up my plans as though it meant I was a flake. I wasn't a flake. Having an intense desire to explore the world and travel doesn't make me a flake, damn it. Oh, please. I started ticking off his ridiculous hypocrisy using my fingers. You still live at home. So do you. I ignored that comment because I'd lived away from home and supported myself for four years in college, as well as it was an inconvenient truth. Mama still does your laundry. I've never seen you even make toast successfully. You're a glorified meter maid. The most excitement you get during any given day is giving people tickets for parking in front of a fire hydrant. Jackson's brown eyes widened again, and I saw his cheeks grow pink above his blonde beard. I was being purposefully bratty, and I didn't feel bad about it. My brother opened his mouth like he was going to launch into another argument, but was mercifully interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Not waiting two seconds for him to regain his ability to speak, I snatched my purse from my bed and pushed past him, making a beeline for the foyer. I ignored Jackson's hollering from behind me as I yanked open the front door and pushed the screen door forward, almost catching Duane in the face with the wooden frame. Thankfully, he deftly stepped to the side, thereby avoiding injury. Oh, goodness, I'm sorry, I said in a rush, reaching for one of his hands as I placed a kiss against his cheek. I was frazzled, but I still took the opportunity to smell him. He smelled good, like shaving soap and a tart hint of automotive grease. Since he had a beard, the shaving soap part didn't make much sense, but he smelled divine, nevertheless. I also enjoyed the way his red beard tickled my chin when I leaned close. Hey, Jess, you look... Let's go. I tried to use my grip on his hand to tug him toward the edge of the porch and away from the house, but he dug his heels in and didn't move more than two steps. Wait a minute. Is your mama here? No, come on. I turned back to Duane, issuing a look that I hoped conveyed urgency, but stopped short when I saw him. I'm afraid my mouth fell open, a sure sign of my surprise as my eyes moved over his form. He was dressed in dark jeans, boots, and a blue button-down shirt the exact same color as his eyes. He'd rolled his shirt sleeves up, which showcased his strong forearms. His beard had been trimmed short, super short, so that the line of his strong jaw was easily discernible. My goodness, but he was delectable. My attention snagged on a frothy cloud of white, and I saw he was holding a bunch of flowers. My eyes moved between him and the flowers, and I'm sure I looked entirely confused. As I was saying, Duane took a step toward me, and I was struck by the sincerity in both his expression and tone, making me sway just a little at his ominous and heartfelt charm. He whispered, You look beautiful, Jessica.
I think I smiled like a smitten simpleton, my eyelashes fluttering of their own accord. So do you, Duane. He smiled. It was small and magnetic. I took a mental snapshot. Spending time with him confirmed my suspicion that Duane's smiles were few and should be treasured. I swayed toward him again. Did you get me flowers? He shook his head, his voice still low. No, these are for your mama. My mom? Don't you leave yet! Jackson's voice thundered just as he appeared in the doorway, breaking our lovely moment. I couldn't help myself. I huffed and rolled my eyes. I loved my big brother, but sometimes I wanted to cover him in honey and send him into a bear cave. Dwayne stiffened a little, but he didn't retreat. He turned from me, his eyes narrowing, and said, Jack? I lifted an eyebrow at this. No one called my brother Jack. Everyone called him Jackson or Officer James. Dwayne? Jackson crossed his arms over his chest. His expression and voice were mean. I don't much like you thinking you could take my sister out. Oh, my God, I said to no one and tugged on Dwayne's hand again. Just ignore him. Let's go. But Dwayne didn't move. Instead, he used our connected fingers to draw me closer while he and Jackson gave each other the evil eye. This might come as a shock to you, Jack, but I'm not losing sleep over your good opinion. Now, are the sheriff and Mrs. James at home? Jackson's eyes narrowed further. Why? Because I'd like to pay my respects to the man and woman of the house before we step out. Jackson flinched, his eyes widening as they moved up and down Duane. I took advantage of Jackson's momentary speechlessness to answer Duane's question. No, Mama is still in Texas taking care of my Aunt Louisa, and Daddy's on duty. Duane glanced at me while I explained, and I thought I saw something like disappointment pass over his handsome features. His disappointment made me feel both guilty as well as warm all over with pleasure. He'd wanted to talk to my parents before we stepped out. Goodness. Oh, well then... He frowned as he studied me, then turned back to my brother and pushed the bouquet of flowers into Jackson's hands. Go put these in water before they die. Wordlessly, Jackson accepted the flowers, though he was still looking at Duane like it was something strange. I didn't have a moment to dwell on any of this because Duane pulled my hand into the crook of his elbow and escorted me down the front porch steps. We reached his car without another word between us and he opened the passenger side door. When he was satisfied I was settled, he shut the door and walked around the hood of his car. My eyes trailed him. I watched him walk. I loved how he walked. My heart didn't know whether to sink or swim. All I could think about was that Claire had been right last Wednesday. Dwayne Winston was looking to court me, good and proper. And now that the evidence was unmistakable... I felt dichotomously dismayed and dazedly giddy by the prospect. Duane fired up the engine, and it was in this dismayed and dazedly giddy haze that I passed the first few moments of our drive. I was quite literally shaken out of my self-reflections when Duane navigated a series of switchbacks with imprudent speed. Even though I was wearing my seatbelt, I slid in my seat to one side, then the other— Sorry, he said, pressing gently on the brake to slow our velocity, then cleared his throat and offered by the way of an explanation. I'm used to taking these roads fast. I didn't mean to toss you around. I braced my arm against the passenger side door. It's fine. I just... I shook my head. I wanted to apologize for Jackson, the way he acted. He was being unfair and unkind, and we had words earlier. I'm sorry about that. Duane shrugged. Well, he wouldn't be much of a brother if he wasn't overprotective. I feel the same way about my sister. I got the impression he hadn't quite ended his sentence and was proven right when he finally finished. They are my brothers. Duane's gaze flickered to mine and he gave me a hint of a smile. I melted a bit at his rare smile and I felt myself relax against the seat. And that's when I realized how comfortable the seat was. 
And that's when I finally took the three seconds required to actually look at this car I was riding in. It was old, a classic of some sort. The upholstery was teal leather, and the seat was a bench style, the kind that allowed a passenger to snuggle up close to the driver. Dwayne Winston, what kind of car is this? He was in profile, but I saw his smile grow. It's a 68 Plymouth Roadrunner. I studied the rest of the car, or what I could see of it. The two-door antique had a back seat, similar bench style to the front, and everything was in pristine condition. Kind of small for the time, isn't it? I mean, weren't most Plymouths built at that time big old land cruisers? Dwayne's hands tightened a bit on the steering wheel, his thumb caressing the inside of the circle. It's a muscle car, so it's built for speed. I tried to remember what the outside of the car looked like and could recall only basic lines and shiny black paint. It doesn't really look like a muscle car, not like the Mustang. It's got a four-barrel carburetor engine pushing out 335 horsepower. But you're right, the Roadrunner doesn't have any of that flashy chrome finish or plush doodads you see with other high-priced GTXs of the same era. It doesn't need to be showy. Its beauty is in its simplicity. Simple, straightforward design with hidden depths. He paired this with an impressive engine growl and accelerated lightning fast along a straight stretch of road. The car certainly was responsive. I smiled at that, glancing around the interior once more and noting the lack of fussy trimmings. He was right. It was a stunning car. Its minimalism only contributed to its effortless beauty. But I could feel the untapped potential, its restless, restrained power. It was sexy as hell. You're right. It's gorgeous. Because I was obviously a horn dog, talking about the hidden depths and restrained power of his muscle car was getting me hot and bothered. I decided to redirect the conversation toward hopefully benign territory. Did you restore it yourself? Yep. Even the upholstery? Yes, I restored her myself, even the upholstery. Her? I passed my hand over the bench, touching the leather with newfound respect and reverence, now that I knew Duane was responsible for the flawless restoration. Based on this information, I presumed he'd also restored the Mustang I was borrowing. I was happy to see a smile return as he halted and idled at a stop sign. Duane slid his pretty eyes to mine. I saw echoes of his hot look from the community center, though it appeared to be mostly restrained. Yes, her. All cars are girls. My smile was huge as I was feeling delightfully unsteady under his perusal. And why is that? Because they're so pretty, useful, and hard-working? Duane's eyes drifted down my body in an unhurried examination. The spark of heat and appreciation in his gaze made me suspicious of his true thoughts, which were only punctuated by his next words. Because when a guy sees a car he likes, all he can think about is getting under the hood or taking her for a ride. This time I threw my head back and laughed with gusto and shocked delight. This was the second time he'd done this, surprised me with his audacity. On Thursday, when he'd shown up at my work with the Mustang, I figured he was just trying to get a rise out of me. But now I saw this new banter for what it was. Dwayne Winston was funny. And a flirt. In all the years I'd known him, and all the arguments and shouting matches we'd had, I never would have guessed that Dwayne was this funny. Or a flirt. Sly? Yes. Smart? Certainly. Serious and stern? Undoubtedly. Funny and flirty? No. He was full of surprises. As my laughter lessened and morphed into a large grin, I turned in my seat and studied him openly. I had to shake myself a little. Before last Friday, never in my wildest or strangest dreams could I have imagined that Dwayne Winston would ever be interested in me. Not because there was something wrong with me, but because he always left me with the impression that I irritated the bejeebus out of him. Just like I'd never thought in a million years I'd be so completely drawn to him. 
But here I was. What? What's wrong? He frowned at my examination, sparing me a quick glance as he turned right onto the parkway. Oh, nothing. I kept staring at him, but not him. I was looking for the Duane I remembered, the one who barely tolerated me, picked verbal sparring matches, and put lizards down my Sunday school dress. I guess. It's weird, right? I mean, you and I grew up together. We used to run around these forests with the other Green Valley kids like a pack of wild animals. His subtle smile was back, but this time it looked nostalgic. So? So, here we are. We're adults. And we're out together. We went for a drive on Thursday and you didn't seem phased by it? Yeah, but this is a date. See, I know you... I could tell anyone who asks that you're a terrible swimmer, or how you drive too fast, or how you got that scar on your right arm, or that you're better at baseball than any of your brothers, but I don't know you. It's like being on a date with two different people. The boy I knew and the... the... I stuttered, then paused, stopping myself just in time. A slight rush of embarrassment made my tongue lame because I was about to say and the sweet, gorgeous man you've become. But that would have been a bizarre thing to say at the beginning of a first date. Honest, but bizarre. And the what? He prompted, sliding his eyes to mine as he came to another straight stretch on the mountain road. I cleared my throat, my chest a sudden and odd combination of achy and fluttery. The kid I knew, and the man you've become. I don't know this new you very well. It's a bit disconcerting to feel confident that I know all about you, but have no idea who you really are. I glanced down and frowned at my purple nail polish, certain I was making a mess of my thoughts. I'm not explaining this very well. Dwayne reached over and grabbed one of my hands, sending a warm jolt up my arm and to my ribs. You're explaining things just fine. He squeezed my fingers and gave me a quick, reassuring smile. When we were at the lake last week and I told you we're different now, both of us have changed. That's what I meant. But you don't think it'll be weird? So what? So it's weird. Weird can be good. We grew up together. I mean, when we were kids, I saw you naked, like I counted in my head, three times, maybe more. Is this your way of telling me you don't want to see me naked for a fourth time? I answered emphatically and without thinking. Oh, hell no, you should be naked all the time. Dwayne's grin was immediate, but his laughter was stifled, like he was trying to contain it. I rolled my eyes at myself once I realized what I'd just said and let myself feel appropriately embarrassed. My head fell back on the seat and I closed my eyes. See, now here's the problem. I would never say anything like that on a first date, or even a tenth date. I still don't see a problem. I'm too comfortable speaking my mind around you. Speaking my mind to Dwayne Winston is not just my default. It's a moral imperative. I announced this to the windshield as I opened my eyes and stared at the fall foliage lining the narrow road. Brilliant streaks of red, dark purple, orange, and yellow— a beauty I'd taken for granted as a kid, blurred together as we sped by. That's just because you're used to arguing with me. Yes, exactly. First dates are like a job interview. It's about putting your best foot forward, not arguing and speaking your mind. Well, I've never interviewed for a job, but I can't think of anything better than Jessica James speaking her mind. I shook my head at him, narrowing my eyes suspiciously. That's not fair. What's not fair? You're saying all the right things, whereas I'm being completely honest. He challenged lightly. What makes you think these right things I'm saying isn't me being completely honest? I blinked, then stared at him, at his profile. My heart sped at his last words, and my breath caught. Pinpricks of awareness covered my skin, accompanied by a nervous uncertainty. I averted my eyes back to the windshield and stared unseeingly forward. Did I want to kiss the hell out of him? Yes, I did. Did I want to wrap his banana and let him have his way with my coconuts? Yes, 
I wanted that to happen. Did I want him to say all the right things with sincerity, revealing his hidden depths as well as a few of mine? I honestly had no idea. On one hand, yes. 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 This Duane was sweet and sincere, generous and wonderful, funny and sexy. I'd known him forever. We had history. I thought the history would hinder a relationship between us, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Our history had only added to this growing connection, provided gravity of feeling and understanding. What more could I want? What more could I ask for? On the other hand, no, no, no. Duane had roots, subterranean cavernous roots. He was a local business owner. He had a big family. I couldn't imagine him ever leaving Tennessee. This was his home, and home was a physical place for him. But Green Valley wasn't where I belonged. I'd known I would never stay my whole life. Regardless, I was moving deeper without meaning to, wading out of my shallow pool. And this was only our first date, a date that hadn't even technically started yet. At some point, I was going to have to tell him I had plans, and those plans meant I would be leaving. Eventually. Definitely. I needed to be honest. But not yet. Cooper Road Trail was definitely an off-the-beaten-path kind of park. Duane's was the only car in the lot when we pulled in. I knew of this locale mostly because my mama loved to hike the trail in June, when the orange and yellow daylilies bloomed along the path. The summer air smelled sweet and warm and was alive with buzzing bees and rushing water from nearby waterfalls. It was a first-come, first-serve kind of place, no camping reservations accepted. It was also exceedingly difficult to find if you weren't a longtime citizen of the valley. The campsite was small, verging on cramped, and had roughly ten or so spots. Five of those spots were on a shallow and relatively wide clear water stream, typical for the area. When we arrived and Duane pulled a mountaineering backpack from his trunk, along with a big basket hamper, I abruptly remembered I'd left the beer in the refrigerator at home. Oh, shoot! I grimaced, rubbing my forehead. Was wrong. I was in such a rush to escape my brother, I forgot the drinks at the house. Duane shrugged. No problem, I have water in the bag. I stepped forward and moved to take the basket from his hands. Do you have anything other than water? No, just water. Oh, okay. My heart sank a little. It was the one thing I was supposed to bring and I'd forgotten. Even though he appeared to shrug it off, I felt like I'd let him down. As we walked together past the campsites into the hiking trail, making small talk about the park, I tried to similarly shrug off my forgetfulness. I didn't like taking advantage, and I didn't like letting him down. And though it was irrational, I hated looking like a flake. I didn't mind if people thought I was silly slash weirdo cross-dressing sexy Gandalf, but I couldn't abide anyone thinking I was unreliable. Because I wasn't. I was trustworthy and took my responsibilities very seriously. While I was still chastising myself, Duane led me off the path when we were about a quarter mile down the trail. I was thankful I'd worn my hiking boots because we had to splash through some wet areas and slippery rocks. Duane was careful to take my hand and plot out the driest course each time. His chivalry, care, and attention contributed to my mounting appreciation and left me feeling tongue-tied and flushed. I finally let go of kicking myself for being forgetful when I noticed Duane's chivalry was increasingly tempered with reluctant and distracted moments of ogling. Three times I caught him checking out my ass. Afterward, he'd clench his jaw and frown severely at the ground, or the sky, or the trees lining the path. I found these little cracks in his control delightful. We're almost there. He glanced down at me, having just helped me hop over a few wet stones and not releasing my hand, even after clearing the rough patch. Is the basket too heavy? I don't mind carrying it. No, it's fine. You've got the backpack. His eyes took a detour to the unbuttoned V of my top, and the cleavage I'd purposefully and artfully highlighted with a push-up bra. 
Are you cold? I shook my head, hiding my pleased smile. No, I'm great. He frowned at the exposed swell of my breasts, seemed to redirect his eyes away with effort. He pulled his attention back to the narrow path. I indulged my urge to smirk. Tight jeans, strategically unbuttoned top, push-up bra. This was fun. I'd be lying if I said his intense interest in my body wasn't a huge turn-on for both my brain and my other brain. It was. I liked that he looked at me and had difficulty hiding his appreciation and desire. If anything, I felt less flustered each time I spied him clenching his jaw or bawling his hands into fists. I liked him so much. It was nice to see tangible evidence that he meant it when he said kissing me was something he'd wanted for a long time. Still feeling cheered, I was surprised when we reached our destination so quickly. He hadn't been fibbing. No more than ten feet later, I was faced with a picturesque clearing at the edge of a wide, still stream, and I sucked in a small breath. I didn't know this place existed. If I'd known this place existed, then I would have become one of those nature people who forage the woods for sustenance and bathe in moonlit pools. The trees overhead and their autumn brilliance reflected in the water, vivid strokes of color. We were surrounded on all sides by nature's majesty, its swan song celebration before winter. The setting was almost painfully romantic. Will this do? His voice was low, just a rumble, but it held equal parts sweetness and amusement. I moved my wide eyes to his and nodded once. His mouth tugged to the side, like he was pleased by my inability to speak but didn't want to commit to a smile. Duane took the basket from my grip and placed it on the ground, dropping his big backpack next to it. There's a felled tree just there. He pointed to the embankment. I spotted a large old eastern hemlock log, about as high as my knee, half on land, half in the water. It's a good place to sit while I get all this ready. You don't need any help? No, you go sit, relax. He appeared to be determined and was already digging into the pack, revealing a large quilted tarp and spreading it on the ground. I studied him as he moved, pulling items out of his bag of tricks. Since I felt useless just standing there as he worked, I decided to take his suggestion. Sort of. Instead of sitting on the log... I climbed it. Then I used it as a balance beam and walked the length of the old tree where it jutted out into the stream. The early November air was crisp, just chilly enough to bite. Soon all the leaves would fall, leaving this spot bare and brown. I felt like I was looking at the pinnacle of a particularly dazzling firework as it filled the night sky, just before it lost shape and faded into darkness. It was a fleeting moment, and I stood in the center of it. I hope you're not expecting me to rescue you. I glanced over my shoulder, found Duane at the edge of the stream, his hands on his hips, his square jaw angled in a stubborn tilt. Rescue me? From a log? No, from the water, should you fall in. I grinned. More likely I'd rescue you. Are you afraid I'll steal your pants? I nearly lost my balance when he answered my grin with one of his own, but he quickly hit it by redirecting his attention to the ground at his feet. When he lifted his face again, a residual smile remained, but he mostly looked serious and focused on me. He cleared his throat and his voice sounded different, deep and commanding maybe a little impatient, as he said, Come back here. I turned carefully and picked my way back, scanning the spread he'd placed on an old large picnicking quilt. I figured the tarp was hidden underneath, meant to protect our backsides from the damp earth. I'd also spotted a few cushy pillows, a throw blanket, presumably just in case we got cold, and an array of covered dishes to one side. Dwayne Winston had come prepared. He intercepted me where the felled tree met the land and placed his big hands on my waist. 
With one smooth movement, he lifted me from the log and set me on the ground. He hesitated. We stood still for a moment, him staring down, me staring up, our bodies separated by less than a foot. With each passing second, my heart thumped more meaningfully against my ribs. The cool November air suddenly felt warm, thick. I tilted my chin, parted my lips to say something, but words caught in my throat. Meanwhile, he stood as though frozen, his expression almost grim, but his eyes were hot. Dwayne Winston was giving me a hot look. Dwayne, I whispered, surprised when his name sounded like a plea. He gritted his teeth, his eyelids lowering to half-mast. We should eat. Even as he said the words, his gaze dipped to the undone buttons of my shirt, then to my mouth, and his fingers tightened on my torso. In that moment, he reminded me of his roadrunner all hidden depths and barely restrained power. Oh, yes, I liked his responsiveness. I liked it very, very much. Or? I slid my hands up his arms and around his neck, annihilating the distance separating us with just half a step, and pressed my body to his. He didn't shrink back. Rather, he surged forward, his strong arms winding around my waist, holding me to him. My legs hit the log behind me, and I felt the heat of his hard chest and stomach beneath the starched button-down of his shirt and the snugly cotton of mine. Still holding his eyes, which had grown to firestorm levels of conflicted, I lifted to my tiptoes and licked his lips. It was just a soft, subtle taste, using only the tip of my tongue. But it seemed to shatter some wall he'd built, because Duane immediately covered my mouth, a tortured-sounding groan rumbling in the back of his throat as his lips moved against mine. My belly twisted, feeling delightfully heavy. A shock of desire radiated from my chest to my fingertips— I'd like to say all my focus was on the slick, massaging sweep of his tongue as it expertly invaded my mouth, making me feel needy and light-headed, but it wasn't. My mind was scattered in a hundred different directions, all of them propelled by a sudden urgency. I needed to get his shirt off because I'd die if I didn't feel the smooth, taut skin of his shoulders, chest, and stomach. I needed to remove my boots so I could free myself of these accursed pants. I needed his hands on my nipples, or his mouth, or both. Yes, definitely both. Without my brain explicitly telling my fingers to do so, I'd untucked his shirt, managed to unlock the first few buttons, and was working on his belt buckle. I had the leather strap free in a surprisingly short period of time, with minimal fumbling, then reached for my jeans, only to find Dwayne's hand already there. Therefore, I leaned away for a fraction of a second and whipped off my shirt, tossing it somewhere, anywhere, didn't care where. Our mouths met and made it again as I clawed at the remaining buttons of his shirt while he unzipped my pants. The sounds of our rough movements, heavy breathing, and frantic kisses filled my ears. It was a symphony of euphoric anticipation. We were moving. He was moving us. At some point, we turned, and he was steering me backward toward the blanket. Dwayne's large hands in my pants, beneath my underwear, cupping and massaging and squeezing. I tripped a little, and then I was being half-pushed, half-guided into a horizontal position on the soft, quilted blanket. Dwayne covered me, nothing clumsy about his lissom movements, his shirt now open, revealing a blasted white undershirt. I growled my displeasure and tugged at the cotton, hiking it upward at his side so I could touch his skin as he settled his muscular thigh against my center. Take these off, I demanded, gripping and pulling both shirts with frustrated movements. Dwayne sat up on his knees and tore off his button down, roughly pulled off his undershirt, his gaze moving over my body. But then, horror of horrors, he stalled his forward progress and blinked, a spark of sobriety igniting behind his eyes as he caught sight of my black, lacy bra, must hair, and unzipped jeans. He frowned like he was confused, shook his head, and said on an unsteady exhale, Shit. 
I lifted my hands to reach for him, and he shook his head again, his face twisted with what looked like frustration and anguish. He stood suddenly and walked away, leaving me on the blanket, staring after him as he paced to the felled log, followed it to the stream, then stopped. I inclined my torso and rested my weight on my elbows, washing his back, my chest rising and falling as I tried to catch my breath. My body was still ready. Actually, ripe was a better word for it. And he looked quite ripe as well. But despite the ripeness of my coconuts and his banana, he'd put an abrupt halt to satiating our hunger. As I stared at his back, a song floated through my consciousness. Can't get no satisfaction by the rolling stones. Why was it difficult for him to take what he so obviously wanted? What we both wanted? When I realized staring at Duane's muscled back and fine ass wasn't helping matters, I stood, zipped my jeans, heaved a confused sigh, and crossed to where I suspected my shirt lay discarded. He wanted me just as much as I wanted him. That much was clear. It was also clear we'd entered into a pattern of behavior. His withdrawal here and in the supply closet of the garage and at the edge of the lake and backstage at the community center all pointed to the fact that Dwayne Winston wanted me, badly, but was trying to be noble or something akin to nobility. You're a siren who doesn't need to sing. I turned my head at the sound of his words, cutting through the soundtrack in my head. Dwayne was facing me now, his muscled arms crossed over his delicious bare chest. His expression told me he was exasperated. With himself, me, or the situation in general, I had no idea where his ire was directed. I gave him a smile I hoped communicated my regret for being pushy, but also communicated my hope that the date wasn't over yet. Is this your way of telling me I'm too sexy for this picnic? Some of his exasperation melted away, and he huffed a short laugh, but then he sobered almost immediately. His focused gaze grew earnest. Jess, doing this right is important to me. I nodded once, faced him, and mimicked his stance. I surmised as much when you brought flowers from my mama. I saw his chest rise and fall before he continued, taking a few cautious steps toward me. I think we're suited. So you said. Something like panic tugged at my heart, and I was afraid of where this conversation was heading. But like you said in the car... We don't know each other anymore. Not really. I get it, I said on a rush, because I did get it. I did. And yet... But then he admitted quietly, I want to know you. I want to know you. I blinked at him, stared dumbly, really. Those words penetrated some wall around my head and heart I didn't know existed. He came to a stop directly in front of me. His arms still crossed over his chest as his eyes roamed over my face and they held reverence, hope. His expression and tone were distracted when he added, And I want to be known. That's what did it. His quiet admission. I realized I was being self-centered. And more than that, I felt torn. Now he was forcing the issue, crossing self-preservation boundaries I'd drawn without meaning to. I was going to have to be completely honest as well. And damn it all, I didn't want to. I didn't want our time together to end before it even started. I had a plan. Save money, gain teaching experience, leave Green Valley. Duane's clear-as-day intentions and my unpredictable, growing feelings were not part of the plan. His desire to court me was not part of that plan. Marriage and picket fences were not part of that plan. I think I must have flinched or winced because Duane straightened, and even though he didn't move, I felt him draw away. I knew at once he was misinterpreting my reaction, so I unthinkingly reached for his arm and stepped into his personal space, beseeching him with my gaze. 
I'm sorry, I said, shaking my head at my blind selfishness, realizing I should have been up front on Wednesday when he'd asked me out originally. I'm sorry. You're right. You're so right. And I'm... I don't know how to say this without being completely honest, so here goes. I moved home with a plan. I'm back with my parents and teaching at the school, but that's all temporary. I'm here in Green Valley for less than two years, tops, just long enough to pay off my loans and save enough money to move on. I'm not ready to settle down. I don't think I ever will be. I want to see and experience things. I have wanderlust and it consumes me. If I had the money, I'd leave tomorrow. I thought, I guess I didn't really think. I just like you so much, and I... I couldn't finish my thought because my voice caught. As I spoke, Duane's eyes widened, then narrowed. Their usual internal brilliance seemed to dim, fade, as it was replaced with a severe disappointment that completely pierced my heart. Then his expression hardened into understanding and finally bitter, guarded withdrawal. For the first time ever, I wished I wasn't this girl. I wished I wanted to live in Green Valley and be content as a small-town teacher, a wife, a mother, a member of the community. But that wasn't what I wanted. That wasn't who I was. I had no illusions my dreams were bigger. My dreams weren't bigger. They were just different. I'd chosen my profession because it meant I could move anywhere, no matter the city, science and math teachers were needed. And I wanted freedom from possessions, owning them and being owned by them. I wanted to experience the world, not just one tiny corner of it. Duane nodded, slowly at first. His eyes fell away before he turned and sauntered back to the blanket to retrieve his shirts. He pulled on the white undershirt but didn't bother with the button down. Instead, he stuffed it into the backpack. I didn't know what to do. Couldn't read what he was thinking, so I stood by the log and waited for some sign. Some selfish part of me wished I hadn't told him the truth. After all, I had two or three years left in the valley. No one understood my desire to travel the world, so why would I expect him to be any different? I'd always been the odd one in my family, feeling like I didn't quite belong. I'd learned to hide this side of myself and almost all of my other crazy instincts from my parents years ago. Duane and I could have dated, had fun together, me knowing it was temporary, him thinking it was leading to something permanent. I could have kept my dreams to myself, planned my trips in secret. Then, when the money was saved and the time came, I could have just broken things off. Hell, we might not even have lasted that long. Maybe we weren't suited. Maybe it would have only been a few weeks or months. No. I heard the word in my head as though it had been spoken out loud. I knew with a rare certainty that Duane was right. We were suited. Withholding the truth of my dreams would be withholding myself, and that was exceedingly unfair to him. It was one thing to pretend with my folks, because they could handle me being zany from time to time and assume my wanderlust was a phase. It was quite another matter to keep my true self from Duane. He didn't deserve that. At length, he lifted his gaze to mine, and I was saddened, but not surprised, to see it was completely shuddered. Are you hungry? His tone was flat as he indicated to the cups and covered bowls with the tilt of his chin. Because I'm hungry. I tried to apologize with just my eyes, and my chin wobbled. I managed to answer. Yeah, I'm hungry. He nodded again, then turned, dropped to his knees and gestured me over with a wave of his hand. Then let's eat. Chapter 10. One's destination is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. Henry Miller. Duane. So, how was your date with catastrophic engine failure? I wasn't expecting the question because I wasn't expecting my brother's return until later in the afternoon, so I couldn't hide my automatic grimace. I lifted just my eyes from the woodpile, found my brother's near in the chopping block and watching me expectantly. Then, to my chagrin, 
Bo and Cletus shared a concerned glance when I remained silent. That bad, huh? Bo scratched his beard. I don't want to talk about it. I picked up a new log, set it in place, and brought the axe down, splitting it with one stroke. Okay, Bo nodded, letting the matter drop. What happened? Cletus asked, stepping forward and not letting the matter drop. What happened? That was the question I didn't much want to think about. That question drove me out here to the woodshed, splitting logs we didn't need, biding my time until I could race at the canyon this evening and burn off my aggression. Last night after Jessica's clarification of the situation, what it was she wanted, we'd eaten in silence, walked back to the car in silence, driven home in silence, and I dropped her off. And that was that. Things were over before they'd begun, because I wasn't going to fuck around with Jessica James. There are just some girls you can't fuck around with, because doing so would be handing over your man card. She would own my pride first, then my heart, then my spirit. Then she'd leave, taking all three with her. On my drive home, I'd briefly considered calling Tina. I could fuck around with her, no problem. But I didn't. Nothing had changed, not really. I was tired of fucking around. And the thought of touching Tina when I craved Jess? No, there was no adequate substitution. I frowned at my older brother. Nothing. Nothing happened. Cletus returned my frown and paused as though mulling over the issue before he asked. Will there be a second date? Cletus. Dwayne. I don't want to talk about it. Can I ask her out? I reckon something in my glare must have communicated the intensity of my sudden, irrational, and visceral response to his question, because Cletus lifted his hands between us as though he surrendered and took a step back. Hold your claws, Wolverine. I'm not going to ask Miss James to step out. I was merely gathering data. I see your feelings for her haven't changed. No, they haven't. Then I guess I just don't understand why things aren't progressing in a satisfactory manner. Did Jackson James do something to interfere? Nothing of note. Did her parents object? No, I said through gritted teeth. Cletus pressed his lips together his eyes narrowing on me like I was under suspicion of criminal consortant. Did you do something untoward? No. Damn it, Cletus, can't you just let this go? No, sir, I cannot. I like things to be fixed, situated, orderly, where they belong. You and Miss James aren't situated where you belong. As such, I feel compelled to fix the situation. I threw the axe down so the blade cut through the earth. Fine. You want to know what happened? She told me she's only interested in a temporary thing. She's not planning on staying in Green Valley. She wants to leave as soon as possible and isn't looking for permanent. She's got... I paused, glaring unseeingly around the yard as I searched for the word she used. Finding it, I threw my hands in the air and kicked the pile of split wood as I finished. She's got fucking wonderlust bullshit issues. Bo's eyebrows arched high on his forehead. Fucking wonderlust bullshit issues. You mean she likes to go hiking? No, Cletus answered for me, his expression grave and thoughtful. I believe our dear brother Dwayne means she's wanting to travel the world and doesn't want any strings holding her to one place. Yeah, that. What he said. I lifted my chin and scanned the contents of the shed behind them for no reason. The sooner this conversation ended, the better. Bo glanced between Cletus and me. He appeared to be confused and confirmed my suspicion when he said, So? So, I shrugged. So, there's not going to be a second date. Again, Bo glanced between Cletus and me like he was missing something. Why not? This time, Cletus and I shared a look of commiseration. Cletus huffed his impatience, then turned to bowl like he was going to set matters straight on my behalf. Because, Cletus started, but then stopped. He blinked at Bo, then his eyes narrowed like he was thinking the matter over and reconsidering his earlier assumptions. I frowned at them both. Now, wait a minute. Cletus held his index finger up and pointed at Bo, then he pointed at me. No, wait just a minute. Bo has a point. I groaned, seething, and glanced at the darkening sky over their heads. 
Why were we still talking about this? Medlin, brothers. Goddamn chickens. The lot of them. She wants a temporary interlude. So what? I gritted my teeth, crossed my arms, and decided to wait for Cletus to talk himself tired. But then, surprisingly, his next statement caught my attention. Everything is temporary, Dwayne. This, he gestured to our surroundings. This is temporary. Even mountains fall. Nothing lasts forever. You got a chance at happiness even for a week, a month, a year. You grab it and you hold on to it for as long as it lasts. Exactly. Bo nodded vehemently. Now he was frowning, looking as serious as I'd ever seen him. You have a chance to be with her even for a short time. You take it. Because when she leaves, you still have that. I shook my head, not liking the cast of their words. You want me to settle? That's fucking pathetic. No, I want you to seize. Cletus dropped his hand on my shoulder and gave me a little shake. You seize that woman. You make her yours. I examined Cletus as he spoke. I liked the word seize and make. Those were action words I could appreciate, words that make me rethink my earlier conclusions. I glanced between my brothers and actually allowed myself to consider the possibility of taking what I could get from Jess for as long as I could get it. She didn't want to stay in Green Valley. Nothing could keep her here. Fine, I could accept that. It was her life. But I wasn't going to beg. No fucking way. I wasn't even willing to ask nicely at this point. I didn't rate on her list of priorities, and why should I? If she wanted no strings with me, and it was clear she was beyond interested in an arrangement that included the physical, what was keeping me from setting my own terms and pushing her outside of her comfort zone? Defining the timetable? Taking a bit of her pride and heart and spirit before she left? Some unrealistic and idealistic dream from my adolescence? She was here. I was here. We were adults. Mutual won't. Hot and desperate existed between us. Why was I denying myself taking what I could? Fuck that shit. Cletus gave my shoulder another shake, pulling me from my internal pep talk. His next sentiment echoed my thoughts, solidified them. You take happiness, Dwayne. You conquer it. That's right. Conquer it. Bo pointed at me and swiped his hand through the air with violent emphasis. And when or if the time comes for her to leave, Cletus shrugged. You be the one to walk away first, with no regrets, because you captured that flag. You seized the day. Half of my bad mood and unnecessary wood chopping was because of Jessica. Actually, more like 75%. The rest was because of Dirty Dave and Repo's visit, and what I'd found on the thumb drive they'd given me. But I had to wait for Cletus to wander off before I could spill the story to Bo. Bo and Cletus helped me place the newly chopped wood into the shed. We decided to grab dinner at Jeannie's Bar. Cletus liked her chicken wings, and they filled me in on their trip to Nashville. And Cletus rambled for an hour about how he'd helped the district law enforcement office unjam their mail sorter. And then he paid a call to all the local police stations to assist with mail sorter maintenance. He was very proud of his work with mail sorters. He'd been doing it for years, pro bono, and had a strange affection for the machines. They're like the pre-internet internet, connecting the world and directing traffic. He was a nut. It took both Bo and I several attempts to steer the conversation back on track. Turns out the car they'd set out to claim, a 1963 Mustang, was in better shape than we thought. As well, the junkyard owner had another Mustang about the same age and much worse shape that we could strip for parts. They were able to rent a vehicle carrier and load it up with a few other prospects as well. All in all, it was a productive trip. On the drive back from dinner, Bo pointed out that one of us was going to have to negotiate a price with Jessica for her Ford F-350. We were bringing in enough vintage body work that it also made sense to buy a large carrier as well. Should we talk to Drew first, do you think? I glanced over my shoulder at Bo, who was riding in the back of Cletus's piece-of-shit Geo Prism. I don't think we can wait that long. Bo shook his head. 
It's the middle of November now. He's not getting back from the trek in the Appalachians until right before Christmas. When does Jethro get back again? I asked. After Thanksgiving, I thought, answered Bo. Drew won't care about the purchases. We have the capital, and he's been in favor of all our investments so far, Cletus chimed in. The man is a Ph.D. biologist and a federal game warden. I'm sure Drew has things on his mind other than our purchase of a vehicle carrier. Besides, he likes being a fully silent partner and trust me to make important decisions. Bo and I shared a look. You mean he trusts all of us to make important decisions? Bo sought to clarify. Cletus laughed. Actually, he guffawed as we pulled into our driveway. I wasn't really offended as I watched Cletus wipe tears from his eyes. That's funny, Bo. Real funny. Cletus parked, still shaking his head as he exited the small car, puffs of laughter following him as he walked to our porch. Bo unfolded from Cletus's clown car and made to follow him into the house, likely wanting to argue the point. I stopped him with a hand on his upper arm and a staying look. Bo gave me a questioning frown and I shook my head, indicating he should be quiet. We waited, listening to Cletus as he mumbled to himself until the sounds of his trailing hilarity were cut off by the front door closing. I counted to three, then I turned back to Bo. I need to talk to you. What's up? Not here. Let's go to the hangar, I whispered, and lifted my chin to the Quonset hut some paces from the house. I led the way, not waiting to see if he'd follow. I knew he'd follow. We could discern even the subtlest changes in each other's expression so I had no doubt he recognized the urgency in my voice. A little-known fact about the Winstons, we can see at night. My mama told us we were part Uchi Indian on our daddy's side, and local legend said the tribe could see clear as day even during the blackest of nights. I had no idea if this was truth or fiction, made up to feed little boys' imaginations. Regardless, we could all see just fine in the dark. Thus, neither of us had a problem finding the path to the hangar and navigating the obstacles along the way. Once inside the hut, which we called the hangar because it resembled a small airplane hangar, I flipped on the overhead lights and navigated around the arbitrarily strewn tools and oil containers. At some point, we were going to have to clean this place up. An orange 1965 Dodge Charger 273 sat ignored in the middle of our mess. It was the car we'd been working on in August when we found out Mama was sick. We'd planned to give it to her for Christmas after it was all fixed up and painted sky blue. Even Billy was helping with the engine work. But she died the first week of October. No one had touched it since. I moved to a cluster of chairs at the back of the space and reached inside the small refrigerator to one side. Thankfully, it was stocked with beer. I popped the top off a bottle and handed it to Bo, reserving the can of Guinness for me. Drink in hand, I took a deep breath and tried to organize my thoughts. So what's going on? Why are we hiding out here? Bo asked. I had visitors on Wednesday. Repo and Dirty Dave. Bo lifted a single eyebrow, his lips curving into a sneer. Those two morons? What did they want? I gathered a deep breath, not liking that I had no choice but to involve Bo in this. You better sit down. He sat down. I didn't. I paced while I drank my beer and related the story of their visit, their demands, as well as my trip into Knoxville for the disposable laptop. Damn, he said on an exhale, shaking his head as he absorbed the facts. His expression mirrored my own anxiety. What was on the thumb drive? Or do I not want to know? Bo looked like he was imagining the worst. You need to know. Besides, it's nothing violent or disturbing. It's traps. Traps? Bo's forehead wrinkled with confusion. I stopped pacing most of my restless energy spent and faced my twin. Yeah, traps. The thumb drive has a video of Jethro. A camera's following him around a garage I don't recognize, as he shows some unknown person the location of secret compartments he installed in several cars, how to access them, how to keep them concealed. Oh, you mean like those vanity compartments, like on that old MTV show, Pimp My Ride? When have you ever watched MTV? 
When you were off running around the woods and playing baseball with the Valley Kids, I was over at Hank Weller's house watching MTV and playing Grand Theft Auto on his PlayStation. Oh, so the traps. Yeah, so they're secret and hard to access. It's actually kind of genius. In order to open the compartment, you have to have the car off, in neutral, with the windows down, the driver's seat all the way to the front, and know where the release button is located. Then, and only then, will the trap open. Otherwise, it just looks like regular carpet. Bo shrugged. So what's the big deal? So Jethro installed secret vanity compartments. How is this supposed to compel us to become the Iron Wraith's chop shop? I grabbed a nearby chair and turned it around. I straddled it, facing my brother. That's not the issue. Well, it's part of the issue. The real problem is that on the video, someone tells Jethro that the traps will be used to transport drugs. Bo frowned. His gaze became unfocused as his thoughts turned inward, and I could see he understood the implications. I continued delivering the bad news. Jethro cusses a few times, yells at the guy who's off camera, tells him he didn't sign up to install the traps for drug transportation. They argue a bit. Basically, though, the voice reminds him that the only way Jethro can extract himself from future involvement with the wraiths is to install the traps, which he did, and keep his mouth shut about how they're being used. The date of the video is about three years ago. They timestamped it. Bo closed his eyes and leaned back in his chair as he reiterated the facts. So they have a video of Jethro finding out the traps are being used to transport drugs, which basically makes him complicit or an accomplice to their drug running. Yeah, he installed the traps, then he taught them how they're used, how to hide stuff. Then they point-blank told Jethro that the compartments were going to be used to transport drugs and hide those drugs from the police. Bo opened one eye, peeked at me. And no one else is in the video, just Jethro. If you don't count the voice off camera, it's just Jethro. And the cars. Fuck. I nodded, sighing at the frustrating futility of our situation. Did you call Jethro, ask him about the video? No, I didn't think calling him on Drew's government satellite phone while they're off in the middle of the Appalachian Trail backwoods wilderness was a smart idea. Have you told anyone else? I shook my head. No, I don't want anyone else to know, just in case we have to go through with this. I agree. No need to tell Billy in particular. He's perpetually pissed off anyway. With Roscoe finishing his last year of college, he's got enough on his plate. And I don't like the idea of messing with his life for no reason. And I wasn't planning on telling Cletus either. I watched Bo carefully for his reaction. If any of us were capable of seeing a way out of this mess, it was Cletus. He was too clever for his own good. Still, I didn't like dragging him into something just to have him shoulder the blame when or if we were busted. Bo, I think, was having similar thoughts. He appeared to be considering our options. Eventually, though, he came to my same conclusion. No, best if it's just you, me, and when he gets back, Jethro, who know about this disaster. But I'm not ready to hand over the shop, not yet. There's got to be something we can do. Even if we can put them off long enough until Jethro gets back in two weeks. I nodded. I've been thinking about that. The way I see it, it's the video that's the problem. If we could get our hands on all the copies, then the problem goes away. Bo cast me a sidelong glance. So, we what? Go to the Dragon Biker Bar and try to hack into their system? They've got to have backups on the cloud or the mist or whatever it's called. I don't think they're that advanced. I honestly don't. I bet they got a PC someplace with the original video. Plus, if we go after their files, get a copy of everything, then destroy the machine, we might find something to use in retaliation. Maybe another video we can blackmail them with. Get them to back off. How are we supposed to access this PC? I've been thinking about that, too. My mouth turned sour because I didn't like our best option. Bo studied me for a long moment, and unsurprisingly, he plucked my plan out of my brain. Tina. I closed my eyes briefly and sighed. Yes, Tina. Bo continued like I hadn't said anything. Tina can get us in there, or she can get in there on her own, no problem. 
She's been seeing one of the younger guys, right? No, she's not an old lady. Since we broke up for good, she's now one of their girls. One of the... I tried to think what the biker gang called women they indiscriminately used for sex. Sweet butts, Bo supplied, giving me a scowl that demonstrated his dislike of the word and the concept. The wraiths weren't exactly known for being gentle with their women. Maybe it was because our mama regularly sported black eyes and bruised ribs at the hands of our father. But none of us Winston boys found anything remotely alluring about the biker lifestyle. The idea of fucking and then beating random women didn't strike me as badass. It struck me as dumbass and evil, like our father. Anyway, the point is, I think I can talk Tina into helping us. Bo studied me before asking. Aren't you worried about what they do to her? If they find out? Yeah, I answered honestly. But it would be her choice. I thought we could pay her. She's always short on cash and she's shrewd, crafty. She'd be careful. I know she could do it and not get caught. What if she uses this as a way to get back at you? You're right, she is shrewd. What if she takes the files for herself and then we got two people blackmailing us? I gathered a deep breath and let my gaze wander as I thought about this possibility, because it was a possibility. I don't know, Bo. I guess you're right. She might double-cross us. But can you think of any other options? I settled my eyes on my brother, waited, hoped he'd have an alternate solution. He looked resigned as he asked, How much time do we have? Dirty Dave said we have two weeks, and that was on Wednesday. Shit. But I think we can stall for a bit. I got the sense that they'd like to do this real friendly. They'd like us to be willing. In fact, they offered to give us a cut. Well, we can work with that. Maybe put them off for a week or two. Tell them we need to think it over. Not say yes, but not say no. Yeah, then delay another few weeks. Tell them we need to get the body shop ready. Or even say we'll do it off-site. Maybe buy us enough time to get the files. Or at least until Jethro gets back and we can beat the shit out of him. Bo smirked at this, but it lacked any real humor. You want to hold him down? Or should I? I returned his humorless smile with one of my own. Let's take turns. No reason to be greedy. Chapter 11 We all know that light travels faster than sound. That's why certain people appear bright until you hear them speak. Albert Einstein Jessica I was in a funk. It wasn't a fun, funky-town funk. It was a full-on pseudo-depression funk. Not even researching Aztec temples and reading travel blogs about New Zealand's geothermic sites did anything for my funk. And it was all my fault. Before Halloween, the majority of my fantasies centered on world heritage sites. Now I caught myself daydreaming with alarming frequency about the time we'd shared. Also, the reluctant curve of his smile, the shape of his torso, the cadence of his voice, the texture of his beard, and the radiance and intensity of his sapphire eyes. Not to mention that incorrigible, circumcised penis. A cursed penis. Making matters worse, I was second-guessing myself. Yes, I still had the insatiable wanderlust, still desperately needed to see and know the world, but maybe there was more than one way to kill a rooster. Maybe I could save my money and go on really long vacations. Teachers typically had the option of taking summers off. I could live the year in Green Valley and use the summer to backpack around the world. But this idea felt like settling, like giving up, and it gave me heartburn. My point, I argued with myself, is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. If you really like Dwayne, and you do, don't try to deny it, then you should find a way to make something between the two of you work. But with these thoughts also came fear. Fear that I would be tied down, unable to travel, unable to leave. Fear that if my intense like for him eventually turned to love, I would lose my freedom. It would be akin to having those National Geographic magazines read to me instead of losing myself in their pages. 
My dreams would be diluted and I would be stuck. It was the fear that held me hostage, trapped in indecision purgatory. I didn't call him after our disastrous date, and it had been a disaster. We'd consumed our food in silence. It had stuck in my throat, settled like a lump in my stomach. Duane had packed up, and this time he'd accepted my help. Our walk back had also been silent. Though he was just as solicitous and polite as he had been on the trek out, he hadn't looked at me. When we arrived to the car, he'd opened my door. Then he'd taken me home and again opened my door when we'd arrived. He walked me to the steps of my parents' home, not touching me, and that's where I was left. He gave me a short, impersonal nod, stuffed his hands in his pockets, and said politely, I'll see you around, Jess. Between the hot ache in my chest, the ballooning lump in my throat, and the stinging tears in my eyes, I didn't respond. I couldn't. I just stood there and watched him leave, drive away, feeling sick and sad and stupid. And now, as I pulled my bike into the parking lot of Daisy's Nut House to meet my cousin Tina for dinner, I was still deep in my funk. Tina had called me the Monday after my disastrous Friday picnic with Duane. In fact, she'd called just as Claire and I were dropping off Duane's Mustang to the Winston house. We did it right after work, when I was fairly sure he'd still be at the auto shop, locking the car and slipping the keys into the mail slot of the house. He hadn't asked me to return it, and I knew he never would, but there was no way I could keep the car. First of all, every time I looked at the thing, I felt like crying. Secondly, like Duane, it wasn't mine to keep. It never had been. As we pulled away from the house, Tina called my cell and said she wanted to get together. I was surprised. I'd chalked up her overtures the week before to odd politeness, but now she was calling me, inviting me out. At first, she suggested beer and pool at the Dragon Biker Bar. I told her she was crazy. In fact, I'd said, you're crazy. She laughed. What? Hadn't you ever been curious about going, meeting some of the guys? They're hot, and they'd show us a real good time. I'd shaken my head, which she couldn't see, and had repeated, You're crazy. I was curious about the Dragon Biker Bar and the Iron Wraith Skies, like I was curious about going to jail for life. So, not. As the sheriff's daughter, I'd heard all sorts of cautionary tales about the local biker club, And granted, if these cautionary tales hadn't included allegations of drug trafficking, prostitution, arson, and bouts of random violence, then I might have been a tad bit more curious. Regardless, knowing what I did, the Iron Wraith spikers didn't do a thing for me, except make me want to lock my doors, use the buddy system, take self-defense classes, and buy a German Shepherd. When I wouldn't budge and refused to indulge her initial idea, she relented and agreed to my alternate suggestion of dinner at Daisy's Nut House. This suited me since I didn't have a car, and the diner was within walking distance of my parents' house. Instead of walking, I opted to pedal my mom's old Swinger Stingray bicycle and arrived a full ten minutes earlier than the agreed-upon 6.30 p.m., I locked my bike up outside and meandered into the diner, happy and surprised to see Daisy behind the counter. She waved me over as I entered, and her dark brown eyes darted between me and the sugar containers she was filling. Hey, I'm not used to seeing you on school nights. How's your mama's sister? I hadn't heard anything all week. She wasn't in the nut house uniform, but rather looked like she'd just left a business meeting. Her brown skin was tinted with pink blush, and her lips were bright red. As well, she'd restyled her hair since I'd last seen her. It resembled Michelle Obama's trendy straight bob. These days, Daisy ran the business side of things, rather than the diner itself. Daisy's donuts had expanded over the last few years and were now carried by most grocery stores in the southeast. I claimed a stool at the counter and helped her fill the glass containers. This was an odd habit from when I'd worked at the nut house, and Daisy used to be my boss. I loved Daisy. First of all, she was my mama's best friend. 
She, her husband Trevor, and their three kids felt more like family than some of my blood relations. Also, she was smart and funny and sassy, had been a great boss, had taught me everything I knew about fashion, and lastly, she'd taught me her secret recipe for making her homemade donuts. Lest I heard Aunt Louisa needs dialysis. The chemo is working, but it's messing with her kidneys. Daisy made a face. That doesn't sound good. You spent the summers with your aunt during college, right? Yes, I was her personal assistant during the school year as well, but I worked remotely during the fall and spring and lived at her house during the summers. Her personal assistant? I didn't know that. Yeah, she's a big socialite in Houston. Now she's retired. What did she do before she retired? She was a petroleum engineer, invented something important that lowers the environmental impact of drilling. I never knew the details, but she never married and has no kids, so she takes on a lot of charity work and special projects. Plus, her house requires a lot of maintenance. It's a huge, sprawling mansion with stables and horses. Yes, your mama said something about her sister having more money than the sea has shells. Have you thought about going out there? I've thought about taking a visit, but honestly, I don't think my aunt likes me much. Daisy tisked, shook her head. That can't be true. When I worked for her, when I stayed with her during the summers, she had me in the employee wing, and she never ate meals with me. She didn't talk to me unless it was work-related, and when she introduced me to people, and only when she had to, I was her personal assistant, Miss James. She didn't want her friends to know we were related. I'm not sore about it, but I think I must have embarrassed her. I can't see how that's possible. You should go visit. If not for your aunt, then for your mama. I hate to think of her lonely over Thanksgiving. Why doesn't Louisa hire a nurse? She has. She has two full-time nurses and a physician. She hired herself a full-time physician? Yes. Mama's really just out there for moral support, but I'm sure she'd appreciate a call if you get a chance. I'll call tonight. Daisy nodded and moved to fill another container. Is Daniela coming home for Thanksgiving? I asked about Daisy's oldest daughter, now a banker or something like that in New York City. Daisy gave me a wide smile. She is. Simone will be home, too, but Daniela will be home for both Thanksgiving and Christmas this year. I think she's bringing a boy home with her, too. I grinned, wagged my eyebrows. Really? A boy? Yes. He works at her investment firm, and by the way she tells it, they were flirting over hedge funds and gold futures for six months before he worked up the courage to ask her out. This made me chuckle, because I could understand his hesitation. Daniela was ten or so years older than me and always struck me as fiercely focused. She was valedictorian of her graduating class and received a full academic scholarship to Princeton. Plus, she was crazy beautiful. I'd always admired her long black dreadlocks, warm, tawny skin, and Nefertiti-like bone structure. The sound of a rumbling motorcycle pulled my attention to the front window, and I watched as Tina dismounted from behind a biker and handed him her helmet. "'Are you meeting Tina here?' Daisy asked, a hint of concern in her voice. "'Yes,' I nodded and hopped down from my stool. She called me earlier this week and wanted to get together. Daisy seemed to hesitate for a moment, her eyes moving between the scene playing outside the window and me." Tina and the biker were kissing, and if they hadn't been in a parking lot, it looked like the kind of kissing that led to horizontal fun times. Don't get hooked into your cousin's drama, Daisy said at last, leveling me with a penetrating stare. She's trouble, and she's a user. If your mama were here, she'd tell you the same thing. I grinned at Daisy and shook my head. Her advice was good, but she wasn't telling me anything I didn't already know. Okay, I won't get hooked into her drama. Good. She nodded once, wiping her hands on a towel and splitting her attention between me and Tina as the latter waved goodbye to her ride. I'll send Beverly out to take your orders. Thanks, Daisy. Mm Mm-hmm, she said noncommittally, like she didn't want to be rude but refused to sanction my dinner with Tina. 
I walked to the door just as Tina entered. As I waved and was about to suggest we grab a booth, she surprised me by yanking me forward and into a big hug. I was usually two inches taller than my cousin, but not tonight. I noticed she was wearing a pair of shiny red spiked platform shoes. If I wore those shoes, I'd fall on my ass before I could take a step, but she walked in them as though they were slippers. As we hugged, she squealed like she was super happy to see me, and this made me smile. We'd been good friends growing up, at least I thought so at the time. I wondered if, over time, our high school years would prove to be merely a friendship sabbatical. She leaned away and gave me a giant grin. Oh my goodness, girl, you look so great! Tina squeezed my hand one more time before releasing me. We both slid into the nearest booth, smiling at each other. You do too. You're looking great. She did look great. She looked hot. Like, super hot. Hot in a way I wouldn't even know how to go about achieving. Tina wore false eyelashes and an impressive amount of artfully applied eye makeup. She and I looked nothing alike. Growing up, no one ever guessed we were related. She looked more like my daddy's side of the family, and I favored my mother's side but we both had brown eyes, though not at all the same color. I thought of my irises as plain brown, whereas her eyes, with all the careful framing and highlighting, appeared to be the color of whiskey. The effect was dramatic, beautiful. I wanted her to teach me how to do it. The rest of her makeup was impeccable. She dyed her naturally light brown hair black, wore it loose in long, shiny waves around her shoulders, which was basically a miracle since she'd just been on a motorcycle. Her hair paired with her sun-bronzed skin, another miracle since the sun had been hiding for two weeks, gave her a rather exotic look. Of course, her clothes took everything to a completely new level of conspicuous hotness. She was in black leather pants, really sexy leather pants, and a white, low-cut v-neck angora sweater. Both fit her like a second skin, which was fantastic for her, since she was clearly in excellent shape. Beverly, our server, came by almost immediately with two glasses of sweet tea and water, assuming correctly what we wanted to drink, and we both already knew what we were going to order. Tina waited until Beverly was out of earshot before leaning forward and saying in a low, conspiratorial voice, I was a little surprised you wanted to meet here. What? Why? She blinked at me as though the answer were obvious. When I continued to stare at her with obliviousness, she laughed lightly and shook her head. You know what I do for a living, right? I nodded and sipped my sweet tea. Yes, I know. I guess I'm just surprised you didn't mind being seen with me so publicly. I gave her a sideways glance. Wait, I think I know what you do. You're still dancing at the Pink Pony, right? She nodded. Yeah. You haven't joined Isis or anything, right? What's Isis? I mean, you're not actively plotting to overthrow the government. She giggled and tossed her hair over her shoulder. I'm not even sure what that means. Then Tina's expression turned abruptly sober, and she leaned forward, her eyes boring into mine. But listen, I have to talk to you about something important. It's kind of why I wanted to get together. Oh, okay. What's up? Her gaze turned speculative as it released mine and moved over my black, fitted, cotton, long-sleeved shirt, then darted to my hair. I always envied your blonde hair. It's so pretty, just like your mama's. You want to talk about my hair? No, silly. She shook her head, rolling her eyes. So, you and Dwayne Winston, what's going on there? I felt my lips part and my eyebrows lift in surprise. An involuntary ache squeezed my chest, making it hard to breathe for a moment. She stared at me while I struggled to find words. Finally, I managed to say, Nothing. I mean, we went on one date, but nothing now. Her eyes narrowed. You went on a date? Yes. When? Recently? Uh, last Saturday? So, a week ago. 
Almost, yes. But no second date. No, no second date. She nodded slowly, still glaring at me through narrowed eyes. Why no second date? I glanced at the vinyl of the booth behind her, trying to figure out how to best explain the situation and be sensitive to the fact that we were talking about her ex-boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend for which she might still have feelings. We decided that our priorities weren't compatible. She huffed, and it sounded impatient. In English, please, this ain't a parent-teacher conference. Um... I guess he wanted one thing out of a relationship, and I wanted something else. Tina pursed her lips, her eyes losing focus as she considered my words. While I waited for her to finish thinking her thoughts, I sipped my tea and glanced at the specials board. Daisy's pie of the day was apple. I'm not jealous. I shifted my attention from the list of pies to Tina. Excuse me? I'm not jealous of you and Dwayne. I don't care who he sees. You're welcome to him if I'm the reason you decided to call things off. I lifted my chin in acknowledgement, but said nothing, because I wasn't sure what to say. Tina hadn't been a consideration in my decision to date or not date Dwayne. I wondered if that made me unfeeling. But then I reminded myself that Tina and I hadn't really spoken in over eight years, the first four of which she'd snubbed me for more popular kids at our school. Yeah, I wasn't going to factor Tina into my dating decisions. That would be silliness. I just wanted to let you know that, she said, as though she were being generous. Dwayne and I were together for a long time, and what we felt for each other, well, I just think first love is really special. It always means something to me. But it's over now, and I moved on. I hate to think of him pining for me. Again, I lifted my chin in acknowledgement, higher this time, and found myself without words. Thankfully, Beverly interrupted by bringing our salads. I changed the topic to one I hoped would be much more benign and asked her what she'd been up to recently. This turned to her giving me the oral history of Green Valley gossip for the last four years. Who was sleeping with whom? Who had divorced? Had illegitimate babies? Had a drug problem? Was in debt? She made Green Valley sound like a sordid train wreck. Strangely, while she spoke, I found myself distracted by how incredibly hot she was. I mean, she was sex personified. Her movements were sensual, including how she chewed her food. Her smile was coy, alluring, captivating. She'd say something like, That little fucker got what he deserved. And I hardly heard the venom in her voice, because she somehow made it sound erotic. I was thankful when dinner was over and her biker fellow arrived to fetch her, because I was exhausted. Maybe it was a byproduct of my long work week paired with the Duane funk, or maybe it was just the tidal wave of sexual energy that was my cousin Tina. Either way, as I pedaled home, I felt bereft and depressed, and wished I'd thought to grab a slice of Daisy's pecan pie before leaving. What's wrong, baby sister? I sighed, hugged the pillow I was holding a bit closer. I hadn't been able to go to sleep. The depression followed me home, and though I was tired and tried lying in bed in the dark with my eyes shut for over an hour, sleep would not come. So I took a shower, hoping it would help me relax, and it worked. I felt a bit better when I shut off the water. But then Sir Edmund Hillary, my psychotic cat, tried to murder me with his litter box. He would pushed it directly in front of the shower door, and I'd stepped on it, stumbled, and fallen to the floor with a squawk and a thud. It occurred to me that, had I been living alone and Sir Hillary knew how to wield a knife, I'd be dead and no one would find me for days, maybe months. This thought reignited my depression, so I cleaned up, dried off, and went into the kitchen. I made hot cocoa with a liberal amount of Baileys and channel surfed in the family room, hoping I'd pass out eventually on the couch, absent thoughts of my inevitable and lonely death by psycho cat. 
Instead, I was up at 2.21 a.m., which signified the end of Jackson's shift. I was never up this late, so I guessed it made sense he'd assume something was amiss. Sir Edmund tried to murder me. I said, Again? I nodded. His attempts grow bolder. I think it might be time to confront him, or at the very least move his litter box to the basement. Jess, the cat tries to take your life at least once a week. It's not the cat. Tell me what's wrong. I sighed again, not sure I wanted to discuss my depression with Jackson. I had dinner with Tina tonight. Our cousin Tina? Yeah. Jackson crossed the room and sat next to me on the couch. He was still in his uniform, though his belt was gone. She's still dancing the pink pony, he said. Yes, I know. And I think she's mixed up with the wraiths. Jackson paired these words with a sad-sounding sigh. Yes, I know that, too. Is that what's got you down? Are you worried about her? I considered the question. I was a bit worried about her involvement with the bikers, but not really. She didn't strike me as the kind of person anyone could take advantage of. Rather, if anyone was going to do the taking advantage, it would be Tina. Kind of. I mean, I'm a little worried for her. Based on what you and Daddy had told me about the Iron Wraiths, they're certainly not trustworthy. They're dangerous, and she's going to get herself hurt if she keeps it up. But I guess I'm also thinking, I huffed. I didn't know what I was thinking or why I was feeling so dissonant. Therefore, I didn't know how to have this conversation with Jackson. He was my brother, and therefore any discussion of Duane and Tina would be weird. Because at some point over the last five hours, I'd realized my depression was related to my Duane funk. Tired of my hesitation, he pushed. What are you thinking? I needed to talk to Claire at work in the morning, or call one of my old college roommates. Jess? He prodded again poking me in the shoulder. You don't want to have this conversation. Try me. I glanced at my big brother, found him watching me with determination, like he was determined to be helpful, and I felt myself waver. He was a guy, after all. Maybe he could give me some perspective. Finally, I relented. I tucked one of my legs under me as I faced him. So... First, you have to forget I'm your sister, that Tina is your cousin, and that you hate Dwayne Winston. Jackson lifted a single eyebrow and his mouth flattened. That's unlikely. Okay, never mind then. I moved to stand up, but Jackson caught my arm and kept me from leaving. Now, wait a minute. I said it was unlikely, not impossible. Fine, fine, I'll do my best. You're not my sister, Tina's not my cousin, and Dwayne Winston isn't a horse's ass. I scowled at my brother. He smiled. I suppose it was the best I could hope for. Fine. So, here's my question. I gathered a large breath and held it in my lungs as I tried to figure out what question I wanted to ask. When I could hold my breath no longer, my half-formed thoughts emerged. So, here's the thing. Tina is sexy, like really sexy. She's got a perfect body and she's insanely beautiful. Add to that she's a stripper and erotic without trying to be and I don't know, I guess. I don't understand why Dwayne would break up with her when she is basically every man's fantasy. Why would he break up with her? Jackson studied me for a long moment, then surprised me by countering with, Why would he break up with her? Or are you really asking me, why would Dwayne Winston choose you over making Tina Patterson his girl? I straightened, started to deny what he was implying, but then stopped myself. He was right. That was the real question, even though I hadn't consciously thought it. It was a question stuck in my subconscious like a popcorn kernel buried between teeth. I sighed. Please don't try to reassure me that I'm pretty. I'm. It's not really a question of prettiness, is it? But you're right. I don't understand why Dwayne would break up with Tina and then go out with someone like me. Jackson examined me for several long seconds. 
His eyes narrowed, his mouth twisted to one side. At length, he exhaled and shook his head. So, I might be biased, because you're my sister and I think you're equal parts annoying and awesome. But it actually makes a lot of sense to me. I scrunched my face and braced for a deluge of reassurance about my gifts or talents. Instead, my brother surprised me a second time. Let me put it this way. Have you ever seen someone and thought to yourself, Whoa, he's hot. I'd like to screw his brains out. And then you talk to the guy and realize someone already has. I barked an astonished laugh, covered my gaping mouth with my hand, and shook my head at my brother. I can't believe you said that. Just last week you told me I was being unladylike. He laughed lightly at my reaction. I'm sorry, I'm tired, so I guess my gentleman filters off. But you have, right? A guy who's super good-looking, but with not much going on upstairs. Now, Tina is... Tina had never... What I mean is, Tina isn't interested in learning anything. She's interested in looking good, being the center of attention, making dramas, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying I don't love her. I do. She's family, after all. But she's always been... Well, she's always been shallow. Jackson paused, allowing me a moment to let his perspective sink in before he continued. Not all the girls at the Pink Pony are that way. Hannah Townsend dances up there, has for the last year. Hannah? Really? This was surprising news. Hannah was two years behind me in school, and I remembered her as being extremely shy. Yeah, dancing makes good money. She uses the money to help her mama keep the homestead, and the pony isn't like the G-spot. You know that strip club down near the Dragon Biker Bar, where all the girls are strung out? The Pink Pony isn't like that. Hank, you know Hank Willer? He owns the Pink Pony. Well, anyway, Hank does a good job of keeping things clean and tidy at his place. He treats his girls well and hires good guys, bouncers to keep out the bad element. But Tina's always stirring shit up. One of these days, I'm pretty sure he'll get tired of her dramas. I assumed Jackson knew all of this startling information because of his job. Notwithstanding the local strip club politics, I tried to wrap my mind around his words regarding my cousin and Duane. But Jackson pulled me out of my thoughts before I was able to gather them. Now, I know you don't want me to tell you that you're pretty, but you are. Jackson, I rolled my eyes. I assumed, similar to most people, I studied myself in the mirror and saw imperfections, little things I wished I could change or wanted to target for change. But at the risk of coming across as a complete nut, I totally thought I was pretty. I thought I had a pretty face. I thought I had a decent body. I woke up early four days a week so I could go swimming at the YMCA because I loved swimming and I liked feeling strong. I ate fairly well not counting my obsession with pie, I took reasonably good care of myself. Relatively clean living paired with biological gifts meant I was on the right side of pleased with my reflection. Therefore, I didn't need to hear my older brother tell me I was pretty. But I was no personification of every man's sex fantasy. Jackson cut me off and insisted, You hush up and hear me out for a minute. You are a pretty girl and pretty girls who don't know how pretty they are sometimes feel overwhelmed by attention from the opposite sex. I rolled my eyes again, smirked at my brother's impression of me, but didn't interrupt. I was perversely curious to see where this was going. Jackson's voice deepened and adopted a lecturing tone. Dwayne Winston is... Well, he's a horse's ass. I don't like him. He drives too fast and doesn't respect authority. But he's not stupid. None of those Winston boys are. And after a few years of Tina, he's got to be tired of conversations involving nothing but nail polish and gossip. It wouldn't matter if Tina looked like Angelina Jolie and, pardon my candor and potential lack of sensitivity, loved giving blowjobs every ten minutes. No man with brains would be able to put up with her brand of boring and crazy indefinitely. Not even Dwayne Winston. Chapter 12. No matter how far you travel, you can never get away from yourself. Haruki Murakami, After the Quake. Jessica. 
Claire and I didn't discuss my dinner with Tina the next morning at work, mostly because I was dead tired. Plus, she'd been a witness to my Dwayne funk all week after we dropped off his Mustang. Thankfully, she hadn't commented on it, so I hadn't either. I didn't want her to think I was both whiny and funky. However, I could tell she was having a hard time holding her tongue on my lingering, laconic attitude. When we pulled into the Green Valley Community Center for jam night, she was driving. Claire turned to me after cutting her ignition and said, "'You're in a funk. You have been all week, and I'm pretty sure it's why you gave Dwayne Winston back his pretty car.' I sighed pathetically and glanced out my window at the gathering crowd. I know. I could feel her eyeballs on me. You know, he might be in there, in the community center. Yes, I know. My heart did a little stretch, then constriction thing in my chest. What'll you do? I guess I'll say hi, be polite, showcase my excellent manners. Why don't you drag him off someplace private and dark instead and bend him to your will? I huffed a humorless laugh, turned to my friend and answered honestly, because he wants more than I can give him. I said the words without much conviction, because I was still wondering if I could have my pie and not get fat, i.e. figure out how to have a real relationship with Duane, not give up on my dreams, and not break anyone's heart. Claire set her jaw, her eyes narrowing on me. You know, I've been really quiet so far about you and your situation with Duane. I understand you have dreams of seeing the world, and dreams are important. But you know what I don't understand? How is it that your dreams don't leave room for companionship, for love? Claire, no, hear me out. I think about my time with Ben, as short as it was. And all I gave up to marry him, be with him, and you know what? I wouldn't trade a lifetime of things or experiences or accolades for a second of what we had when he was alive, when we were together. Honey, and you won't even consider the possibility that your dreams might be made better, that life and the living of it can be enriched if you have someone to share it with. Why is that? I... I'm not saying Dwayne Winston is your Ben. I'm not saying that. But watching you shut down and withhold yourself from the possibility of love and being loved, that makes me sad. That makes me sad for you. I know you want adventure. I know you want to see the world. But love is the greatest adventure, where you risk the most for the greatest reward. What good will all this exceptional living do if you're only doing it for yourself? I don't know, okay? I bellowed, chaotically throwing my hands around. You're right. I don't know what I'm missing. I don't know what might have been between us if I'd gotten out of my own way and just let things be. But I do know that I will suffocate here. I know I cannot stay. And I know that being dishonest with Duane or being dishonest with anyone, even if it's a lie of omission, isn't right. It isn't fair, not to him. He wanted to court me. He brought my mother flowers. His sights were set on the long term, and I... I sighed pitifully and shook my head, glancing at my fingers. And you what? Is a problem that you can't see yourself with Dwayne Winston in the long term? No. The problem is that I can see myself with Dwayne Winston in the long term. I see a house with a garage where he fixes up old cars. I can see a home office where I grade papers and tutor kids. I see a kitchen where I bake Sunday meatloaf or roast chicken and a deck where he grills ribs and steaks. I can see a garden in the backyard and white picket fences. And that terrifies you. And that terrifies me. Because as pretty as the picture is, I would hate it. I would hate owning stuff that owns me. I would hate knowing the whole world was out there and I'd locked myself in a cage, even if the cage was gold and pretty with an herb garden and a flower bed. She didn't respond, not for a long time. We both stared out the windshield in strained silence and watched as groups of locals passed by the front of her car on their way to jam night. 
Judging by the amount of people, the place is going to be packed. This was a good and a bad thing. Likely by the time I made it to the food line, all the coleslaw would be gone. The coleslaw was one of my favorite salads. However, on the plus side, if the place was packed and Dwayne was in attendance, it would make avoiding him a lot easier. Eventually, she broke our stalemate. What if the house had a hot tub? I slid my eyes to the side, saw her giving me a conciliatory smile, one of surrender and apology. I returned her smile and hoped mine also conveyed similar sentiments of reconciliation. Well, now that changes everything. I'd give up the world for a hot tub, but only if it was also a time machine. She laughed, shook her head at me as she unbuckled her seatbelt. Why is that movie so funny? It's so stupid, and yet it makes me laugh every time I watch it. I don't understand myself sometimes. Beats me, I shrugged, opening my door and straightening out of the car, preparing my resolve to face whatever labyrinth of funky feelings lie ahead. I'd braced myself for seeing Duane. I'd expected to see him around every corner or the sound of his conversation to greet me through every door. But he didn't. He wasn't there. At least I didn't see him. My heart seized a bit when I spotted Cletus strumming his banjo in one of the rooms, providing accompaniment for his brother Billy on vocals. I decided to torture myself by staying in the room and listening to Billy Winston sing. The man could sing. Yet this was an exercise in torture because there was something about the way he moved that reminded me of Duane. Nevertheless, no music played that only I could hear when Billy walked by my chair during a break, stopped, and gave me a faint smile of acknowledgement. I felt nothing beyond a friendly curiosity when he crossed to me, his hands in his pockets, and leveled me with his startling stare. As I stood, I decided if Bo's eyes were the summer sky, and Duane's volleyed between glittering sapphires and a swirling tempest, Billy Winston's eyes were the color of glaciers. Even his warm smile couldn't quite warm his gaze. How are you this evening, Jessica? It had been a while since I'd spoken to Billy, so I'd forgotten he'd lost quite a bit of his eastern Tennessee drawl. He almost sounded like a generic person from the United States, what most people would consider lacking in discernible accent. Well generic except his voice held a soothing melodic quality when he spoke just fine and how are you billy i'm well his gaze drifted to the empty seat next to mine is claire here with you tonight yes we came together but i think she's up front with her father-in-law helping with the donations he nodded his gaze growing sharper in a way i couldn't help but notice i thought it was remarkably odd almost like he was frustrated. But then, whatever it was, promptly vanished and was replaced with an unaffected air of controlled politeness. How are things at the high school? Fine. Real good, actually. We now have a system worked out for all the kids bust in for calculus. All thanks to this little lady. I turned my head just as Kip Sylvester, the principal of the high school and therefore my boss, shouldered his way through the shuffling crowd. Next to him was his daughter Jennifer, who I would forever think of as Queen of the Banana Cakes. This was not an uncharitable thought on my part. She'd literally won Best Banana Cake at the county fair for the last six years and worked for her mama's bakery making the renowned cakes. Add to this her pale complexion, pale yellow hair, and bright yellow dress with brown polka dots. She might as well have been a banana herself. Thanks to Miss James, we're seeing lots of progress in our STEM numbers already. Kip Sylvester gave me an approving nudge. It was somewhat strange thinking of Kip Sylvester as my boss. I'd known him since I was two. He'd been the principal when I was in high school, too. I gave Jennifer a small smile of greeting, which she returned with sunny brilliance. But then I watched as she turned her gaze to Billy. It grew noticeably bemused and dreamy. That's good news, Billy offered benignly, pairing his statement with a head nod in my direction. Are you singing tonight, Mr. Winston? 
Jennifer asked prettily, in a soft, sweet voice, sweet as banana cake. I am, or I guess I was. Billy turned and glanced over his shoulder. It depends on whether Cletus is staying for the next set. We drove together. Oh, I hope we're not too late to hear you sing. I think I'd die if I missed it. Billy's expression grew a bit perplexed, maybe even a little rigid. My boss tried to cover his grimace with an indulgent smile, which only served to highlight his grimace. What a silly thing to say, Jennifer, he admonished his daughter, chuckling lightly and looking at Billy as though to apologize. I felt a pang of empathy as Jennifer's face fell and her cheeks tinged pink. I'm sorry I'm always saying silly things, I guess. I must have overdone it today in the bakery. See, now that's a great excuse. I usually blame all the silly things I say on syphilis. I started to laugh at my own joke before even finishing it. However, after seven seconds of dismayed stares and silence, I realized that maybe STD humor was lost on this crowd. I reminded myself what I thought was hilarious, like my ironic sexy Gandalf costume, was often the cause of censure and elicited abject horror from others. I was always going to be a circle peg in a world of squares. But then I heard someone laugh, or more precisely, try not to laugh. I twisted at the waist and nearly lost my breath because directly behind me was Dwayne Winston. He was most definitely trying his best to contain errant laughter. His sapphire eyes were glittering down at me. And then I really did lose my breath because, if I wasn't mistaken, Duane was giving me a hot look. His gaze moved from mine to his brother's, then to Jennifer and Principal Sylvester's as he handed out customary greetings to the small circle. I hadn't at all recovered by the time his attention swung back to me. Just good, do you have a spare moment? He asked in a low voice. I nodded. Please excuse us, he muttered. Without sparing a goodbye glance for our companions, Duane wrapped his long fingers around my upper arm and tugged me toward the open door. We were surrounded on all sides by crowds of people, music floating down the painted cinder block and linoleum-paved hallway. It was loud, but I was only aware of Duane. Halfway to the donations table, he slipped his hand into mine. We held hands for the remainder of our short walk to the cafeteria, causing my heart to take up residence in my throat. I was half expecting and hoping he'd drag me backstage again, but he didn't. He steered us to one of the long lunchroom tables in the corner of the cafeteria, where no one else was sitting. We were still in a room full of people, but the conversations elsewhere meant whatever words we exchanged would be indecipherable from the surrounding chatter. Dwayne pulled a chair out for me and claimed the seat adjacent as I sat. Or, I tried to sit. I didn't quite know how to sit. Sitting suddenly felt weird. I was super conscious of my limbs. Thankfully, Dwayne spoke before I could become too obsessed with the mechanics of sitting. I've been thinking. He leaned his forearm along the table to his left, my right, and trapped me with his focused gaze. What have you been thinking? I missed the feel of his hand and wondered if it would be weird for me to reach out and take hold of his fingers. You're leaving just as soon as you can, and you estimate that at being, what, two years? I felt a bit dismayed by his subject choice. I was hoping he'd want to talk about Saturday, give me an opening to apologize and explain in greater detail. I tried to figure out how to steer the conversation in that direction. I tried and failed. Instead, I answered the question he'd asked with honesty. More like either one and a half or two and a half at this point, depending on how much money I can save. His eyes narrowed and he nodded, his hand coming to his chin as he stroked his beard thoughtfully. We sat that way, him studying me while stroking his beard, me watching him study me while he stroked his beard for several seconds. Abruptly, he asked, What would you say if I suggested we date for the next 12 months, but only for 12 months? Who? What? Date? 
It took me a bit to work through his words. I liked the date part, but the only 12 months part sounded fishy. I, um, why 12 months? My question seemed to relax him, and his eyes appeared to lighten a bit. Because that way we'll be split up well before the time you need to go. It's a good stretch of time, long enough to have a bit of fun, get to know each other, but not so long that you'd have to be concerned about a lasting attachment. My heart was doing strange things in my chest, but not anything I might have predicted. It sank like a stone. If I caught his meaning, and I was fairly certain I did, he wanted me to be his fuck buddy for the next year. I'd gone from the girl he wanted to court to the girl he wanted to see on the side, one he likely no longer respected. I shifted in my seat, not because my body was uncomfortable, but because my brain was uncomfortable. And my discomfort didn't make sense because this is what I'd wanted, right? No, this isn't what you'd wanted, a voice answered in my head, clear as a bell, something I truly didn't understand myself. So, we'd... I licked my lips to stall answering. When I found my voice, it was croaky, and I felt the beginning of frustrated tears sting my eyes. We'd... what? Hook up a few times a month? He shook his head, leaned a bit closer, and I was struck by how severe his expression seemed, almost like he was angry, but not quite. No, that's not what I want. You would have to go all in. We would go out to dinner, see movies, call each other, text. I'd work on your car, you know, the Mustang you left at my house earlier this week, install gadgets you don't need because you're my girl. You might come to the Winston place and hang out with us boys. This would be both of us. All in for all 12 months. Or less if we find we don't suit. My heart reversed positions halfway through his clarification of my misassumption and hurtled itself skyward. In fact, my entire body felt lighter, almost like I was floating. So you still want to court me? Yes, he nodded. For 12 months? Yep. I didn't try to hide my smile, and we'd be a couple, a real couple. A touch of softness entered his expression, and his eyes drifted over my face, as though cataloging it. Yeah, with presents on birthdays and celebrating Valentine's Day and watching chick flicks and all that other crap. I gathered a deep breath, my lungs filling with both air and excitement. But then a thought occurred to me. Wait, what if, after the twelve months, one or both of us wanted to continue? Does this thing, this agreement, have an option for an extension? At once the softness vanished, and again the lines of his face turned severe. He leaned away, just a few inches, but the distance felt much greater. I perceived a cold kind of resolve behind his eyes. No, absolutely not. The term is for a year. After that year is up, and as long as you're in Green Valley, our relationship would be over. But what if I'm in town for two and a half years? What if... No, twelve months. That's it. Take it or leave it. His tone was unyielding. As though to drive home the fact that he wasn't willing to bend on this point, he set his jaw and glowered at me. His glower reminded me of the Dwayne Winston I used to know the kid who used to pick apart my arguments and challenge me to think about perspectives other than my own. That Duane had been irritating. That Duane had also been right nine times out of ten. I felt a spasm of some sort in my chest, like a spike or surge of panic, making breathing a bit more difficult. Absent-mindedly, I pressed a palm to the center of my ribcage as I studied him and his stony features. I opened my mouth, determined to try one more time, because his granite resolve on the issue didn't make much sense, but he cut me off before I could speak. Anne, if we do this, you're not to bring up the possibility of an extension again. You don't even ask about it. It's just understood. One year from today, we'd be over and done, and that's it. I studied him for a long stretch, saw he was completely serious. 
and seeing this made me feel out of sorts. Therefore, I asked the first question my panicked heart wanted to know. Would I still see you? He shrugged. You'd send me around, I guess. This isn't a big town. Would we still be friends? I don't know. Would you talk to me if you saw me after, or would you ignore me? I'd be polite, but not more than polite. I don't rightly know, Jess, he whispered, and his whisper sounded a bit sad. Meanwhile, my voice lifted as I challenged. Well, you need to know, Duane, because I don't think I could just date you for a year and then turn my feelings off. But you could leave me for Timbuktu and that would be no problem. I huffed, my defensive hackles rising. I don't like being made to feel guilty for having dreams and goals. I already get enough sass about this from my family. I saw his chest rise and fall with an impressively large and silent breath. His eyes moved between mine for a few seconds before he glanced to his right, shaking his head. This, right here, this is the reason for the twelve-month limit. When he brought his gaze back to mine, it was clear and sober, determined. If we limit things to the twelve months, then we both know what's up. We avoid having this conversation ever again, because you leaving won't make any difference. We'll already be done. You can go and not feel like you've left anything behind. I considered him, his words for nearly a full minute, seeing the sincerity painted all over his features. You've given this some thought. This came out sounding like an accusation, and I didn't know why. Yeah, I have. I felt irritable. But then I realized his proposed plan meant he'd been thinking about me over the last week. He'd been thinking about us and what to do, and that realization made me feel gooey and sentimental. Therefore, inspired and touched by his consideration of the matter, I blurted before thinking about what I was going to say. What if we... Then stopped when I realized I was about to say, what if we just do this for real? No time commitments, and I put my travel plans on hold indefinitely. And that was the moment I realized how much I liked, really liked, Dwayne Winston. I mean, I knew I liked him before, but my reflexive panic at the thought of a time limit with him, one set in stone, made me feel trapped by my dreams of world travel. Oh, my dear friend, irony, how I have not missed you. I licked my lips, then chewed on the bottom one, again as a way to stall speaking my thoughts. My daddy liked to say, you can't have fried pie and not get fat. It was a distorted and much cruder version of the popular, you can't have your cake and eat it too, but the sentiment was the same. What if we... He prompted when I took a bit too long to continue. Looking at him... Knowing he was serious about this time limit business, I decided to take a different approach. Negotiation. What if we did a trial period first, before the 12 months started? His eyes narrowed with suspicion. Why would we do that? I had no choice but to wing it, make stuff up. Because, because it would be weird and depressing to pick a year from today. November 14th, as the day things end? Right before Thanksgiving and Christmas? No, we should do a six-week trial period and start the 12-month countdown on January 1st. His eyes narrowed more, but his mouth twisted to the side like he was fighting a smile. You're just trying to get 13 and a half months instead of 12. I shrugged. You caught me. So what if I am? What's six more weeks in the scheme of things? The humor waned from his expression and was replaced with a contemplative frown. He was considering it, I could tell. He just needed a little push. I scooched my chair closer so my legs were between his, placed my hands on his knees and leaned forward. Two Thanksgivings, two Christmases, two New Year's Eves. Think of it. This year I won't even know what to get you for Christmas, but next year... I hoped I was giving him a winning grin. He sighed, 
His almost smile returned, and I nearly jumped out of my seat to do the moonwalk when he conceded. Fine, a year from January 1st. I didn't do the moonwalk. Instead, I squealed, jumped into his lap, threw my arms around his neck, and kissed him. I made it fast, just a couple quick presses of my lips to his, then leaned away so I could see his eyes. He was smiling at me now. Full-on, white teeth, happy face smile. And his arms had come around my waist, his hands on my hips. My stomach and heart were trying to outflutter each other as I grinned down at him. This was good. This was a good compromise. Sure, I might have been in denial. Sure, I might have been setting myself up for heartache in the long term. But whatever. I could deal with all that later. Much later. Like over a year from now, later. Right now, I was sitting on Dwayne's lap and had just been given a free pass to kiss him as much as I liked for the next thirteen and a half months. Chapter 13 The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Marcel Proust Jessica Yesterday, we'd sealed our deal with a kiss at the community center, and this morning, he'd texted me. Dwayne, I'm taking you out tonight. Me. Where? Dwayne. Someplace where we can go fast. Me. What time? Dwayne. Five. Me. Sounds good. Smiley face. I was ready to go at 4.30 p.m., even though I changed outfits ten times. I might have been a tad excited. Just a tad. I decided on a white sweater dress with a built-in slip, long sleeves, and a short flared skirt. Because of how fitted the slip was over my ribs and chest, the dress was a pain to put on or take off. Not helping matters were about 30 little buttons running down the back, but I loved how it looked on me. I paired it with my tan boots and wore my hair down and wavy. Dwayne was 10 minutes early, and this time my daddy was home. Thankfully, Jackson was not. Daddy invited Dwayne in, offered him a beer, which Dwayne refused in favor of sweet tea because he saw the offer for the trap it was, and they discussed sports, local politics, and cars for about 20 minutes. Then Daddy waved us off, giving me a small smile and Dwayne a firm handshake and squinty eyes. Once again, Dwayne was driving his roadrunner. This time I was able to ogle the car as we approached. Appreciate its simple, elegant lines before he opened the passenger door for me. Even though this was our second date, everything felt different. Better. The weight of my dishonesty had been lifted. I was all in. Everything was out in the open and we had a deal. Therefore, it felt more like a true date. Like I could relax and just enjoy his company. Because I knew we had thirteen and a half months together. Once we were settled inside, we grinned at each other. Feeling downright giddy, I asked, Where are we going? You'll see, he answered mysteriously, his eyes sliding over my body with blatant appreciation. That got me warm. Yes, it did. I really, really liked how Dwayne Winston looked at me. He employed every ounce of his attention and focus, like he was making plans. Then his gaze snagged on my bare knee. Are you going to be warm enough in that dress? I shrugged. I hope so. But since you won't tell me where we're going, I guess we'll see. Dwayne gave me another once over as he brought the engine to life and we were off. At first, for the first two minutes or so, neither of us said a word. I'd wondered about this, worried that our agreement might make things strained. Not willing to sit in silence any longer, I resolved to speak. So, I said, so, he said at the same time. We both laughed, and I offered, you go first. Dwayne cleared his throat, his expression suddenly somber, and began again. So, about that syphilis diagnosis. I threw my head back and laughed, was pleased when I heard his answering rumbly laughter join mine and felt him place his hand on my knee and squeeze. I was happy when he left it there. When I was finished with my giggles, I hit him on the shoulder and tisked. I can't believe no one thought that joke was funny last night. That joke was way funnier than they gave it credit for. STD humor is just lost on some people. 
it was funny, but I think maybe given the fact that Kip Sylvester is your boss and his daughter was present, it wasn't surprising he didn't laugh. And don't mind Billy, he can't laugh at anything in public. I bet he was dying laughing on the inside. I turned my attention back to Dwayne. What? Why? Why can't Billy laugh at anything in public? Cause everyone knows him, who he is. Heck, half the guys in the jam session work for him, and I think he's considering a run for county commissioner in two years. Oh, goodness, that sounds awful. I can't imagine being a public servant, all those people and their opinions. I know, right? People are the worst. His comment made me laugh again, and I studied him for a beat, wondering what other hidden layers he might reveal. To this end, I said, So, Dwayne Winston, tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Tell me, tell me something I don't know. What's your favorite movie? Anything with a good car chase. I smiled at the predictability of his response, but it didn't feel quite right. Why do I doubt your answer? Dwayne's gaze slid to mine and he gave me a half smile. You don't like a good car chase? I didn't say that. I just meant why do I feel like there's more to you than your stereotypical guy answer? His hand gripped, then relaxed on the steering wheel. There's a reason we eat popcorn during a movie. If I want to zone out, brainless, and entertain, then I watch TV. Go to a movie. If I want a good story, then I read a book. Aha! Uh -huh. I poked his shoulder gently. There it is. You're a book person. That's probably because your mother was a librarian. Yeah, she likely had an influence. Dwayne squirmed a little in his seat, his eyebrows tugging low over his eyes like he was deep in thought. I reckon most people look at us Winston boys and see a bunch of hillbillies, sons of Daryl Winston, con man and criminal. In some ways, I guess we are. We like our cars, barbecue, and banjo music. But our mama wanted more for us. She demanded it. Mama basically put each of us through a kind of finishing school. How'd she manage that? Books. Lots of books. At least one a week to expand our vocabulary and our minds. The classics were required reading, plus table manners. All manners were taken very seriously. Words like ain't, which isn't a word, weren't allowed in the house. Though we've all grown lazy with proper grammars, we've grown older. She also taught us how to dance. Dance? She taught you to dance? Yep. Like what? Like the waltz? He nodded faintly, clearly lost in a memory of his mother. I didn't interrupt. Instead, I admired his profile feeling the depths to which I'd missed him. I'd missed him so much. For the first time in a week, I felt like I could draw a complete breath. I knew I was falling hard and fast, but I didn't care. We had just over a year, and I planned to abandon myself to it, to him. I was completely and totally all in. At length, Dwayne shook his head like he was coming out of a trance and added, But really, I think I'd prefer to be out there myself. Living, doing, seeing for myself. I was nodding before he'd finished his thought. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how I feel. I actually get frustrated sometimes when I read travel blogs or magazines. It's like I want to be the one out there doing it, not reading about someone else's experience. Dwayne nodded at my words like he truly understood my perspective, but then he surprised me by asking, So then, what have you done? What do you mean? I mean, how have you lived? What have you done? And that crazy stuff you did when we were kids doesn't count. Now I squirmed in my seat. Dwayne shifted like he was about to remove his hand, so I covered it with mine and pressed it to my knee. Eventually, I admitted the sad truth. I've done a lot of planning, getting ready. But honestly, nothing exciting so far, I added with a sad sigh. No big trips or adventures. His eyes were on the road, but how he'd slightly inclined his head toward me and stroked his thumb over my kneecap told me he was thinking about my response. 
His thoughtful expression transitioned into a frown. You don't need to have a big trip to have an adventure. There's plenty of adventures to be had here. I tisked. You know what I mean. I guess I do. And I guess I don't. I'm just saying, if you can't have an adventure where you are, what makes you think you'll have an adventure anywhere else? I felt the answer was obvious. Nevertheless, I said, because it'll be someplace new. I've already done and seen everything there is to do and see here. Well, enlighten me then. What adventures are there to be had in Green Valley, Tennessee? I assumed his question was meant to be ironic, so I laughed and responded, None. Wrong. I scoffed. No, not wrong. We have three restaurants, three bars, Cooper's Field, and the jam session on Friday nights. Therein lies the sum total of what Green Valley has to offer. Wrong. He repeated, but this time the corner of his mouth tugged upward like it was biting a smile. Oh, really? What am I missing, then? Hiking, fishing, canoeing, camping. Come on, Duane. We hiked and explored all through these mountains when we were kids. You said kid stuff doesn't count. He hesitated for a minute, then said, Bungee jumping. I nearly choked. Bungee jumping? You been bungee jumping? Yes, and skydiving. Holy crap! When? Where? I'll take you. My chest constricted with a healthy dose of fear, and my immediate response was to shake my head. No, no thank you. I think I'll pass. You said you wanted adventure. Adventure isn't the same as trying to kill yourself. Now he laughed. It's not that dangerous, says the daredevil Dwayne Winston. So you're telling me that when you leave and go on your wanderless walkabouts, you're planning on having only nice, quiet, safe adventures? He made a face like he was disappointed in me. That's not living. That's just more time spent planning. Again, I squirmed in my seat and grumbled. No. Yes, he countered. Mild irritation made my chest and cheeks hot, and I glared at him. Just because I don't wish to throw myself out of a plane and plummet to the earth doesn't mean my adventures will be boring. You don't have to throw yourself out of a plane, because I'll be there to push you. With this, he glanced at me, grinning like a devil, and winked. My mouth fell open, and a small, strangled sound of disbelief emerged from my throat. But then I laughed through my outrage, because his expression was both adorably and thrillingly mischievous. Soon he was laughing, too, likely at my stunned and annoyed expression— while laughing, I reached over and squeezed his leg. Well, I wouldn't want to be a burden. He caught my hand. It would be no burden at all. I'm happy to offer my services any time you need to be tossed out of a plane. Or off a bridge? Or a dock? Or a boat? Yes, even a boat. I'll be happy to push you any time pushing is required. As he said these words, we came to a stoplight, and he turned just his head, giving me a happy smile and squeezing my hand. His smile was dazzling, and I felt my own lips curve into a wide grin. Goodness, I loved it when he smiled, like he was doing now. I felt like finally, finally I was seeing the real Dwayne Winston, the one he only shared with the rare and worthy few, and I fell a bit more. I enjoyed this feeling of falling, the thrill and certainty of it, of his worthiness. I feel I must reciprocate, I said quietly, losing myself in his closeness, the genuine warmth and affection clear in his handsome face. Please let me know if I can ever be of service, pushing you in a similar fashion. I watched him take a deep breath, his gaze moving over my features, still warm with affection, and he said in a near whisper, My mama once told me, you don't need to be pushed in order to fall. I don't think you'll need to do much pushing, Jessica. It took us about another hour to reach our destination, during which we fell into easy conversation. 
He told me tales about crazy customers, and I had to guess whether they were true or false. The most outrageous stories turned out to be true, thereby shaking my faith in humanity and reminding me that 50% of the population fell beneath 100 on the IQ curve. Before I knew it, time was up and we'd arrived. I squinted out the windshield and realized where we were. The canyon? You brought me to watch the dirt races? I was not complaining, not at all. I was merely surprised and maybe a little nervous. Dwayne nodded as he pulled into his space toward the front. It was conspicuously empty, like it was his spot, though I couldn't see a marker that marked it as such. He popped his door open as he cut the engine. Yes, we can watch the races, but there's good food, too, and we can talk in between. Just stay close. Things can get crazy. He came out of the car and reached for my door just as I opened it, offering his hand. I took his, and he kept mine. Our fingers remained entwined as we walked toward the closest of three bonfires. I wasn't usually much of a hand holder, but I liked his hands, the large roughness of them, and I liked how the contact kept us close. Are you hungry? There's some tailgaters up ahead. They have ribs cooking, chili, cornbread, and coleslaw, though the coleslaw isn't as good as the stuff served at the community center on Fridays. I made a note of how wistful he sounded about the community center coleslaw. I knew Juliana McIntyre made it every week and decided to interrogate the recipe out of her at some point. Chili and cornbread sound good, I responded while rubbernecking without shame, endeavoring to scope out our surroundings. Dwayne was right. It wasn't even 7.30 p.m., and already things looked a little crazy. I'd never been to the canyon before, never seen one of the dirt races, never had an occasion to do so. This wasn't some country fair, wholesome dirt racing. This place felt dangerous, risky. The air smelled like various types of smoke, wood fire, charcoal, and engine oil, and would have been overwhelming in the hot, stagnant summer but born on the cool wind of late fall, it was heady, but not overpowering. I noticed a group of skinheads and their girls making out next to one of the bonfires. Like, for real making out. Black-labeled bottles of bourbon lining their basket. Two of the guys were arguing over one of the girls, and tempers appeared close to snapping. As well, I felt a little overdressed. And by overdressed, I should say overclothed. The night was mild, but it was still cold, yet every woman we passed was wearing either a miniskirt or leather pants, sometimes a leather miniskirt, and their tops showed more skin than my bathing suit. Not everyone is friendly, Duane said, obviously noticing my gaping. Skinheads aren't usually known for being friendly. I pressed myself closer to Duane. He took the hint and wrapped his arm around my shoulders. The groups segregate themselves, don't mix much, except on the track. Which group is yours? I glanced up at him, watched as his eyes narrowed, and he twisted his mouth to the side. I don't really have a group. Really? Yeah. I mean, I know just about all the racers, the ones who take it seriously. We have a mutual respect thing going on, but I don't usually associate with any one group. A lone wolf. He smirked, his gaze sliding to mine. Something like that. We passed several clusters of people, either gathered around one of the bonfires or lingering within the circle created by their cars. Several were calm, sedate, like they were tailgating at a football game. Others were rowdy, like the skinheads, fighting, drinking, and screwing for everyone to see. I supposed everyone had a different idea of what constituted a good time. As well, every age was represented in seemingly several socioeconomic strata. I saw Corvettes next to souped-up Honda Civics, a rusted-out Nissan truck parked beside a brand-new Acura. Some of the groups looked like they were my age or younger, college and high school kids, and several seemed to be at least 20 or 30 years my senior. And some groups were mixed. After assessing the crowd, the first thing I noticed was that the canyon wasn't really a canyon— the canyon was an abandoned mine. Street racing was obviously illegal, as it was almost everywhere. Racing at the canyon, though not technically sanctioned by local law enforcement, wasn't an arrestable offense. Betting on the races, however, was illegal. 
but I'd heard rumors that betting was rampant and thousands of dollars exchanged hands every weekend. The race winners supposedly went home with a big cut. We eventually approached two giant Dodge trucks with grills and tables set up just in front of the truck beds. We stood in a line of about 20 or 30 people, all waiting to grab food. The man in front of us glanced over his shoulder. His eyes moved down, then up my body. I scowled at his blatant leering. Keep your eyes to yourself, Devin, Dwayne growled, his arm turning me so I was pressed against his side. The man's attention shifted to Dwayne. Then his eyes grew large and he turned completely around, a big smile on his face. I haven't seen you in weeks. He reached for and grabbed Dwayne's hand, shaking it with enthusiasm. Wait till I tell the boys you're here. I studied this Devin person as he smiled at Dwayne with something like worship. He was about my age, maybe a bit older, and wore a black leather jacket, blue jeans, and boots. He was obviously part of some biker club, but I didn't recognize the emblem on his chest. Let me buy you and your lady dinner. No, thanks, I got it. Devin's dark brown eyes glanced at me, then back to Dwayne, and he lifted his dark eyebrows. I heard Dwayne sigh. Jess, this is Devin St. Cloud, or just Saint, if you prefer to use his club name. Devin, this is Jess. Dwayne made the introductions reluctantly, like his good manners required it. Devin's big brown hand enveloped mine as he gushed. Your old man is the best, the best. Ain't nobody raced like Red. We used to race Humvees around dirt tracks in Afghanistan when I was stationed there, and I thought those guys were crazy, but nobody compares to Red. I couldn't help my smile, liking Devin a bit more now that he was praising my old man. Plus, I liked that his biker name was Saint. What? Red is here? This comment came from someone else farther up in the line, and I craned my neck to the side to see who. Turns out this was unnecessary because we were soon surrounded by several people, male and female, all anxious to see Duane, shake his hand, and meet me as well. It became a bit overwhelming, to be honest, and everyone wanted to know the same thing. Was Duane racing? And if so, which races? And how was he feeling? In the end, we weren't allowed to buy our dinner because a skinhead named Sheldon brought us a tray of food without asking permission. This caused a bit of an upset as Devin and his biker brethren had offered first. Dwayne used this distraction as an opportunity to move us away from the food line. As he pulled me away, I said, Lone wolf, huh? He bent and whispered in my ear, They only like me so much because I make them money and they enjoy watching me race. I shook my head. Do you know everyone? More or less, he shrugged, or they know me. We were stopped a few more times on our way to wherever Duane had in mind. And between greeting people and introductions, Duane explained the locale was likely named the canyon because of the red clay and dirt making up the racetrack and the exposed rock faces on three sides of the track. As well, the property was private, owned by some conglomerate who left it abandoned years ago and clearly hadn't protested its use as a regional racing ring. The oval track covered two acres, but setup was required for each weekend night. Big industrial lights had been set into the exposed rock face earlier in the day, illuminating the track. The three large bonfires were off to one side, the side not enclosed by rock, and this was where all the cars lined up and parked. I estimated at least 200 people were gathered around the bonfires, drinking, socializing, and trash-talking while sizing up the competition. He was right. Everyone seemed to know or know of Duane, though we didn't loiter to talk for very long. Everyone we encountered appeared greatly surprised to see someone with him. I got the sense that he typically came alone and said very little. We took our chili, cornbread, and sweet tea to a big boulder close enough to the track to see everything, but not so close we'd get covered in dirt. A race was about to start. You look tense, Duane remarked between spoonfuls of chili. I realized I'd been frowning at the line of cars revving their engines. I glanced at Duane and lifted my chin toward the starting lineup. I've heard stories about cars smashing into the rock walls and head-on collisions causing broken bones and leaving people unconscious. Those rumors are true. 
I felt my frown deepen. Why would anyone do it then, if it's so dangerous? He shrugged. Because it isn't easy. It takes patience and skill. Because it's dangerous and it's fun to be a little scared sometimes. A little scared? He gave me a crooked grin, his eyes on my mouth. That's right. Just a little. I snorted my disbelief. If dirt racing made Dwayne a little scared and skydiving wasn't all that dangerous, I wondered what could possibly frighten Dwayne. At the same moment, a shot went off. The cars lurched forward and sped out of the starting line like demons from hell, the engines drowning all other sound. My eyes were glued to the action in front of me, how the cars, some old, some new, all souped up, slipped and skidded all over the dirt track. Two of the seven spun out at the first turn, one of them bouncing off the rock wall. I sucked in a startled breath and felt Dwayne's hand close over mine. He'll be fine. He wasn't going that fast. I leaned against his solid frame and watched the remainder of the race with rapt attention. Only three of the cars made it to the finish line, and it was sickeningly close. The whole affair was irresponsible and dangerous, and I thought I'd disdain it. I was wrong. I loved it. My heart was beating fast, and yet I was sitting still. I loved the sound of revving engines, the smell of engine oil mixed with smoke and earth. I loved the general air of excitement, camaraderie, adventure. I loved how these people loved their cars and raced them hard, used them, risked them. When the cars sped by, I felt the rush of wind, the vibration in my chest. Of course, it helped seeing the people who crashed walk away from their cars with no assistance, looking more upset about losing the race and what had befallen their automobiles than about their cuts and bruises. It was thrilling, and everything seemed larger, brighter, clearer, likely a byproduct of the adrenaline pumping through my veins. I deduced the turns were by far the most dangerous part of the race. Maintaining control of over a thousand pounds of steel around a sharp corner while traveling in excess of 90 miles per hour on a dirt track basically sounded impossible to me. But some of the cars managed it beautifully, artfully. By the end of the fourth race, I'd basically crawled into Duane's lap, and I squealed unthinkingly each time the cars rounded a curve. My squeals made Duane laugh, and he held me tighter. As soon as the five this time remaining competitors crossed the finish line, Duane peeled my fingers from where I'd dug them into his legs. Having a good time? He nuzzled my neck, kissing it, then set me away and stood. I turned to him, and I'm sure my eyes were huge, as was my smile. Yes, I'm having the best time. I never thought I'd enjoy all this craziness, but it's amazing, and I'm so glad you brought me. He gave me and my run-on sentence a distracted half-smile as he pulled out a pair of leather gloves from his jacket. Good. That's good. Where are you? My mouth couldn't quite form the question because I already knew the answer. Abruptly, my heart thudded in my chest quite painfully, jumping around like it was trying to break free. Oh, my God, Dwayne, don't you dare! At just that moment, movement caught my attention beyond Dwayne. Devin, the biker from earlier, and a woman I didn't recognize were walking toward us. I'll be right back. Dwayne brought my attention back to him, nudging my legs apart with his knee and stepped between them. He wrapped a gloved hand around the back of my head and bent to give my open mouth a kiss, and it was a great kiss. It made me feel like I was being tasted, savored, remembered. Or maybe he was trying to impart the memory to me. Either way, I wasn't going to forget it. Too soon he straightened, holding my somewhat dazed but also panicked gaze for just a short moment, again with plans in his eyes, then turned. Duane strolled away before I could think to protest again. As I watched him go, I stood, then sat, then stood again. I didn't know what to do. As Duane passed Devin, he shook the biker's hand, nodded toward me, patted him on the shoulder, and then continued on his way. I watched the exchange with incredulity, studied Duane's long strides before he was completely swallowed by the crowd. Hey, Jess, this is Keisha. You mind if we keep you company? 
My eyes moved to Devon, then to his pretty lady friend, then back to Devon. My voice cracked as I asked, He's going to race, isn't he? The biker flashed me a big smile, like he thought my nerves were funny. Yep. And I got two hundred dollars saying he comes in ten seconds ahead of the next fastest car. Don't worry, baby. Keisha squeezed my arm and gave me a sweet smile. Red ain't ever lost. I sat back down on the boulder and placed Dwayne's jacket over my legs. It was still warm from his body. He was going to race. And he'd sent a biker named Saint to watch over me. A chill passed through me despite the added layer of his jacket. The food I'd eaten settled in my stomach like a cold lump. I was no longer having a good time. I hardly noticed as the pair sat next to me, but I was irritated to hear how excited they were to watch my old man's race. It was one thing to watch people I didn't know, didn't intimately care about, risk their necks— it was quite another to sit on the sidelines and not lose my mind as Dwayne revved the engine of his roadrunner at the starting position. I thought about running forward and throwing myself in front of his car. I thought about it, but I didn't. Instead, I prayed and clasped my hands together. They were shaking. I was not okay with this turn of events. If he hurt himself, I swore to God I was going to kill him. And if he didn't hurt himself, I was going to demand he take me home at once. With each passing second, my anxiety increased, as did my feelings of helplessness. I didn't want to watch him race. I was not amused. By the time the starting shot echoed through the air, I'd worked myself up into a real tizzy, a temper tantrum befitting my bratty past. I wanted to close my eyes, bury my face in my hands, and wait till it was over but I couldn't. Dwayne immediately pulled ahead and my stomach dropped. Devin and Keisha whooped excitedly, both standing. He was the first to reach the turn and every muscle in my body tensed, my nails digging into the flesh of my palms, and I braced myself for the worst. But the worst didn't come. In fact, he didn't take the turn. He attacked it. He was by far the fastest I'd seen around the corner and slingshotted around to the other side completely unscathed. His engine revved, sending thrills and worry to each of my nerve endings. But after two more turns, I realized Dwayne really knew what the hell he was doing. He was amazing. Now my eyes were glued to Dwayne's roadrunner. Devin and Keisha's excited shouts faded as it slid around the last return cone— he was in the lead by several car lengths. Rationally, I knew it was just an old car, but something about the way he drove it turned all that metal into a sexy machine. He drove with swagger, panache, control. How he could be so unbridled on the racetrack and yet dominate with precision at the same time rang my bell, like blaring five-alarm fire bell ringing. But I was still mad at him. In fact, I was furious. Or at least I thought I was. I felt the roar of his engine as he charged through the finish line, chased by a cloud of dust. The crowd cheered and I was up on my feet moving toward his car. I was still wound up in a tight knot of worry and tension. It was cold outside, yet I was hot all over. My jaw clenched and worked and I rehearsed the words I wanted to say. How dare you make me watch you almost kill yourself? You gave me no warning. You just left me, and I'm so angry that I want to, want to. I couldn't finish the thought because what I really wanted to do was rip his clothes off, which made no sense. It seemed my main problem centered on the fact that I didn't know if I was pissed off, turned on, or both. Peripherally, I heard Devin call my name. I ignored him. Then I heard snippets of conversations from the horde as my furious walk turned into an urgent jog. These conversations ranged from smart-ass remarks about how he never lost to frustrated comments regarding how he shouldn't be allowed to race anymore because he always won to serious discussions asking why he wasn't racing professionally. By the time I reached him, he was out of the car and surrounded by a crowd. I didn't hesitate to push my way to the front, but once I arrived and he was there in front of me, Safe and sound, I stopped short. Some emotion clogged my throat. 
one I couldn't identify. As soon as he saw me, his face split into a giant grin and his eyes, burning brighter than I'd ever seen them, devoured mine. Dwayne grabbed my hand and pulled me forward, wrapped his arm around my waist and pressed my body to his. Then he kissed me. Hard. Caught by surprise, I braced my hands on his chest to steady myself, and I felt his heart thundering against my palm. And I had only a single thought. I needed him. Right now, I needed to know he was okay, in one piece. My need felt positively feral. I needed to feel the strength and vitality of his body beneath my hands, and I needed his hands on me. Our kiss elicited several more smart-ass comments paired with whistles, but I didn't care. I didn't know these people, and even if I did, it wouldn't have made much of a difference. Dwayne leaned backward and away, though his arm still held me. Undeterred, I kissed his neck, reached under the hem of his navy blue shirt to touch him. He grabbed my hands, and he was breathing hard. Just wait a minute. Nope. I whispered the single word in his ear right before I used my tongue to suck it into my mouth. He stiffened, and I heard him release a quiet groan. Red, looks like you got to go, son. We can send you your cash later. This sentiment came from someplace over my shoulder. The man who'd said it was laughing. His raspy voice only served to punctuate the meaning of his words. Dwayne turned us around, used his strength and size to leverage me onto the bench sheet, no longer protesting my liberal pawing. We were horizontal, and he returned my fevered kisses, taking control of my hungry explorations and harnessing them, giving the hot slide of our mouths finesse and purpose. Although peripherally I realized he'd shut the driver's side door, cocooning us inside his sexy machine, I also heard increased, louder comments, whistling and now banging on the roof of the car. Kneeling over me, he dipped his head to one side, his beard rough against my cheek and jaw and growled in my ear. Jessica, do you think you can give me five minutes so I can drive us out of this crowd, find a private spot? I don't know if I can wait that long. I answered honestly my breathing ragged with excitement, even though the progress of my reaching hand had been frustrated by his belt. Duane made a short noise of disbelief that soon turned into loud, rumbly laughter. The sound succeeded in tugging me somewhat out of my feral cloud. I saw he was smiling at me, his face just inches from mine. I reluctantly returned his smile. I'm actually kind of serious. I think if you breathed on me, I'd orgasm. My confession made his eyes widen as he laughed again, then squinted at me. I'm kind of breathing on you right now. No, you mistake my meaning. If you were to breathe on me down there. I glanced down at myself meaningfully, then back to him. I would totally come apart. He sat up, his smile now a smirk. That sounds like a dare. No, it's not a dare. It's the truth. I whispered, lost in his eyes. I realized one of his hands was up my skirt, digging into my bare thigh. He searched my face in the dark car, as though hoping to read the veracity of my statement. The crowd surrounding us grew a bit more obnoxious and were now peeping through the windows. Duane shook himself. He withdrew his hands and set me away at the same time, lifting me to a more vertical position. He engaged with the ignition, revving it as he glanced in his rearview mirror. Put on your seatbelt, we need to move. I used the center seatbelt, then snuggled close to him, waving my fingers into the hair at the back of his neck and using my other hand to stroke his inner thigh. He was tense. His muscles felt tight. Dwayne, I whispered in his ear, more breath than sound. I'm not letting you leave this car until we make it to second base. At least. He rolled the roadrunner forward slightly, nudging the crowd out of the way, giving me his profile. Just you know how good I am at baseball, right? I got the feeling he was waiting for me to answer. Yes, Dwayne. I know you're good at baseball.
His eyes slid to the side, collided with mine. Again I saw intense focus, like he had plans, and they all involved me. Do you think I'd settle for second base if I was sure I could steal home? Chapter 14 As you walk and eat and travel, be where you are. Otherwise, you will miss most of your life. Go to my Buddha. Dwayne. Jessica James, tongue in my ear, stroking my thigh, her knuckles brushing against my hard on, all while I navigated back mountain roads. It was a gauntlet. While I drove, in between kisses, she'd managed to pull off my shirt, unbuckle my belt, undo the button, and the zipper of my jeans. She was single-mindedly focused on removing my clothes, but had yet to remove a single article of her own, an oversight requiring immediate rectification. The only sound in the car was her breathing, the roar of the engine, and her soft moans of please and hurry. But despite my earlier allusions to rounding the bases and her sexy little sounds and touches, the drive gave me the time I needed to gain perspective. I'd made up my mind a long time ago. Our first time wasn't going to be in a car. I'd always figured, in the unlikely event Jessica agreed to my courtship, we would wait. I'd decided, likely after we'd confessed our undying love and devotion to each other and we were engaged, we'd go on vacation together for an anniversary. It would be someplace I could romance her. Or maybe we would wait until we were married. That had always been my assumption. My expectations hadn't factored in her life goals and ambitions. We weren't going to have any anniversaries, romantic vacations, or a wedding night. We only had now. Regardless, despite her eagerness to consummate our bridged relationship, I couldn't completely shake off my years of frustrated hopes. It wouldn't be what I'd wanted, but I was damn determined to make it meaningful and memorable, even if she didn't care about the where and how. I did. No, nothing would be rushed or hurried. I would take my time. Several times. We would have all night. Not a quickie in my road runner. Now, if she would just stop dipping her fingers into my boxers, I'd be able to form a coherent thought. I pulled into Hawk's Field. It was closer to the canyon than it was to Green Valley. I didn't have the luxury of a 45-minute drive back into town. And I wasn't surprised to see we weren't the only car on the lot. But the field was massive, with several offshoots and dirt roads, plenty of space and cover for privacy. As soon as I had the car in park and the lights off, I grabbed her hands and pulled them away from my body. I needed to think, and feeling her stiff nipples through her soft dress wasn't helping my state of mind. What? What are you doing? She asked, sounding breathless. I didn't answer. I made the mistake of releasing one of her hands so I could slide mine under her dress, and she brought it down to my growing, stroking me through my boxers. Take off your pants, she ordered, her nails clawing at my jeans and redirecting the blood flow from my brain. Again, I had to grab her wrist. Jess, I want you, she pleaded, biting my neck. Take off your dress. I'll take off my underwear. I thought I could just hike up my dress and climb on your lap, she said in a panting whisper. The image her words conjured elicited an involuntary groan from the back of my throat, but I managed to say, No fucking way. And we're not debating this. Take off your dress. I fingered one of the buttons at her back. She freed one of her hands again and seemed to be trying to touch every inch of my bare skin on her way south. Her dress was already hiked up to her upper thighs because she was climbing onto my lap, rubbing herself on my leg. Basically, I was losing my mind. Dwayne, please, I need you. Please, just let me. I need your skin. I released her wrist and slid my hands from her knees to her hips, hiking the material up higher, revealing a scrap of white lace. But I didn't stop. I kept pushing the dress up, needing the weight of her bare breast in my hands. Not exactly sure what we were doing, where this was leading, and hoping I had enough sense once she was naked to rein myself in. Wait, Dwayne, wait. 
The dress bunched up and became bulky. For the first time since we'd entered the car, her hands moved away from my body voluntarily as she tried to withdraw them from her sleeves. I attempted to take advantage of the moment by unclasping her bra, but underneath the sweater material of her dress was a slip of some sort, and it was tied around her ribs and chest, restricting both our movements. Not helping matters, she'd tried taking an arm out of her sleeve, and her elbow was now caught between her body and the dress, immobilizing the hand. Her other arm was up at an awkward angle, hitting the roof of the car. I tried pushing the dress higher, but that just complicated matters, bunching it beneath her ribs. I looked at her, and her face was red. I could tell by the set of her jaw she was frustrated. Jess was basically trapped in the material, straddling my hips and flailing her torso from side to side as she tried to get free. Then she started to cuss. She looked like an enraged kitten. I couldn't help it. I laughed. I gripped her hips, brought my forehead to her stomach just under the bunched fabric, and laughed against her bare skin. Dwayne Winston, are you laughing at me? She growled, huffing a bit as she struggled with the dress. Yes, I am laughing at you. I couldn't stop laughing. I felt tears gather in my eyes. She looked so ridiculous and adorable trapped in her dress, and I was relieved because the moment of brevity had a sobering effect. I heard her laugh a bit, too, but it sounded irritated. Well, if you could trouble yourself to stop laughing long enough, maybe you could help me out of this straitjacket. I'd really appreciate it. I leaned back against the bench and studied her. What can I do? First of all, wipe that grin off your face. I tried. I did. But instead, I laughed again. Oh, good Lord! She paired her exclamation with an eye roll. Fine! I held my hands up, showing my surrender. Fine! There are buttons? Yes, but I don't think we'll be able to unfasten them with me in this position. Can you pull the dress back down? I nodded, concentrating on helping her untangle herself even as I mourned the loss of her skin. I pulled her slip down first, then the bulkier sweater fabric next. Her elbow was still caught, so I reached around her and tried to unbutton a few inches at the center of her back. She held my shoulder for balance with her free hand as I worked. Pretty soon I realized I was going to need to see the buttons. They were round and small and slippery, and I couldn't get a good grip. Jess, you're going to need to get off my lap and turn around. I can't work these through the loops like this. She huffed, released a long, frustrated growl, and shouted, This is unbelievable! I pressed my lips together. I wasn't going to laugh again, though I sorely wanted to. She was so angry, and the cramped space of the car meant every time she twisted, the elbow caught inside her dress nearly knocked me in the nose, forehead, or chin. I had to help her off my lap and felt her eyes on me as I set her bottom on the seat to my side. I can't believe you're laughing. You're still laughing? I'm not. I lied. You are? It's just... I turned her around so I could see the row of buttons running down her back. I swear, there were a hundred of them. Why would you wear this? Who helped you button up? No one. I used a mirror. You must be crazy flexible. I am. I stopped laughing. Hush, let me concentrate. I reached for the buttons again, but now she was laughing. And when she laughed, she shook. But her laugh was also pure magic. I let my forehead fall to her shoulder, my hands dropping to her waist, and just listened to the sound while I breathed her in. My earlier conviction surfaced again. Our first time wasn't going to be in a car. No. I wanted to be with her, make her laugh, make her crazy, take my time, take her time. Even if she didn't care about the where and how, I did. As her laughter receded, I withdrew and gathered a fortifying breath, zipping my zipper and searching for my shirt. She glanced over her shoulder and I noticed she'd freed her elbow from where it had been trapped in her dress, pushing it back through the sleeve. A smile lingered on her lips, but her eyebrows drew together with a question. What are you doing? Take off your boots. 
I ordered gruffly, recovering my shirt and pulling it over my head. She only hesitated for a second before I heard the zipper of her boots released and I glanced at her legs. Beneath the boots, she'd been wearing long pink and black striped socks that reached almost to her knees. I dug my fingers into my thighs to keep from touching her legs, or rolling the socks down her sculpted calves. Dwayne, I lifted my eyes to hers. She was waiting for me to give direction. Take your panties off, Jessica. She hesitated, then asked, What about the dress? I shook my head. Just the panties. Her wide brown eyes studied my face for a beat, and then she was lifting up her hips. I closed my eyes so I didn't have to see her shimmy out of her underwear, but I imagined her sweet center exposed, and I nearly reached for her. When she finished, I felt her hesitate next to me. I opened my eyes, found her staring at me. Her cheeks were flushed. As I suspected, she was again waiting for me to give direction. The fact she was so willing and trusting strengthened my resolve. Climb on my lap. My voice was softer this time. She immediately did so and reached for my fly at the same time. I steeled her hands. No, leave it be. But, shh. I slipped my fingers beneath her skirt, savoring the skin of her legs. Her hands came to my shoulders for balance, and her eyes grew hazy as I brushed the back of my knuckles up her inner thighs. Dwayne? She pleaded, both choking on and swallowing my name. Lights from a passing car in the distance dimly illuminated the interior, and I saw the roadrunner's windows were completely fogged. I stroked her with the tip of my middle finger, and her thighs clenched. Her eyes closed, and she stuttered side, moving one hand around her ass, because she had an amazing ass. I held her in place and touched her again, parting her, entering her once, then teasing her with control and precision. Watching Jessica was a revelation. 